that all members are present. The mission of the Kansas State Board of Education is to prepare Kansas students for lifelong success through rigorous quality academic instruction, career training, and character development according to each student's gifts and talents. Our vision is for Kansas to lead the world in the success of each student. At this time, we will pause for a moment of silence. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. As we approve the agenda, the following items will be pulled uh, and voted on separately. Uh, consent agenda 16 C, D, H, and J. Are there any other additions or corrections to the agenda? If not, a motion would be in order to approve the agenda. Dina makes that motion and Gene seconds the motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Any additions or corrections to the September 13th and 14th minutes? Seeing none, motion will be in order to approve. Ben and Jean. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. I now declare the Citizens Open Forum of the Kansas State Board of Education open at 10.02. The State Board provides this opportunity for citizens to share their views about topics of interest or issues currently being considered by the State Board of Education. The State Board asks speakers to identify themselves by name and the name of the group they represent, if applicable. The State Board also asks that each speaker focus their remarks on issues or topics. Personal attacks will not be tolerated. Each speaker shall be limited to three minutes. Any board questions will be for clarification. Our first speaker is Michelle Olson, followed by Steve Roberts. Michelle Olson, you have the floor. And Mr. Ferguson will be the timekeeper and will give you indications. And Is that microphone on? Is it, it should have a blue light. Is it on now? It's, yes. There's a, okay. We teach that a complete sentence must include a subject and predicate. If it doesn't have those two components, it's a fragment. We teach that an integer is a whole number, and if there are any numerals to the right of the decimal point, it's a rational number. We teach that a water molecule consists of three atoms, two oxi one oxygen and two hydrogen. If one is missing, it's a completely different molecule. However, when it comes to sexual activity, we don't teach what consent is. Students must learn the definition of consent, because without consent, sexual activity becomes something else altogether. Because consent is mandatory for all sexual activity between people, comprehensive sexual education must include consent education. Our students deserve to know that consent is a freely given, revocable agreement informed on truths made by someone who is able to reason. The Kansas State Standards list consent as a skill that can be taught, and if it's taught, it's taught in regards to the law. But consent is not defined in Kansas Penal Code, which only adds to teachers' confusion. Easier to just skip that topic altogether, which is, as a former public school teacher, completely understandable. According to my school district's curriculum and instruction, the word consent is not mentioned in any theme, topic, standard, or skill in their entire K-12 education. Oftentimes, consent is boiled down to a minimum age requirement by law, and the phrase no means no, and maybe yes means yes. 
Both are problematic and can make someone believe or assume they have consent when they do not. No means no is problematic because a person can assume they have consent if they do not hear a no. Yes means yes also has its faults. According to this rule, a person knows they only need to hear a yes, no matter how they get it, to obtain consent. Pressure, fear, or threats are okay because yes means yes. Problematic social norms, such as rape jokes, sexism, victim blaming, objectification, and hypermasculinity, trivialize sexual assault. To teens, these are normal and harmless ways to fit in, but they are not harmless. And sexist attitudes towards women in our bodies are easily found in song lyrics, video games, podcasts, movies, advertisements, social media, and maybe the most extreme example, explicit online videos that are easily accessible for naturally curious children to view. Given the time, attention, and care our health classes dedicate to birth control and STIs, which it should, for how much time and attention it is given to consent in classrooms, gives our students an implicit yet clear message unto itself. It's not as important. According to recent data, the people most at risk of being the victim of sexual violence with, within the next eight years are sitting in your classrooms right now. <laughs> you have the power and privilege to be proactive in presenting their assaults. One in four undergraduate female students and one in five transgender, queer, or non-conforming students will experience sexual assault or rape through inability to give consent or physical force since enrollment. Women who are 18 to 24 years old and not enrolled in college are four times more likely to be the victim of sexual violence compared to all women 25 years and older. Consent education aligns with the Kansas State Board of Education's mission as it strives for the success of all students through character development. I hope that the information provided to you today ultimately ends in a unanimous decision by the board that it is at best irresponsible not to include consent in our state standards. Thank you. Thank you. Will you, uh, can, can you uh, send a copy of your statement to our secretary? Uh, it'll, sure. It'll be uh, uh, on the website if, or she can give you her email address. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Roberts. Well, welcome back, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the, the comments that preceded me uh, help underscore the need to have a distinction between primary and secondary school. And I hope in years to come I can help with that. Um, there is an election four weeks from today. This is not a political stop. If it were a, a campaign stop, I'd be asking for money, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I am on the ballot statewide. Um, I, I came here to uh, suggest that there's a, a better way to pay primary teachers. Um, and I, I'd like to uh, start a discussion for that. And it may have been discussed. Uh, it may not be the most original idea. But I think there's a better way to pay K through three teachers. I think that's the focus. That's where the focus should be. With, with smaller classes, much smaller, uh, the average K through three class ought to be seven or eight students. And we can do that. We have the money right now to do that. We have the money right now to have smaller classes and pay teachers more. It involves change, admittedly. It involves a fair amount of change, I would say. But it's doable. And uh, I, I, I could easily fill the three minutes, but I have too much to say to, to even you know, try. So uh, let me just finish with this. It involves change. And change is hard. And you know that as well as anybody in this state. Change is hard. But the money is there to actually change the way we pay primary teachers. And if that was our focus, not trying to fix the whole thing at once, but stick with K through three, pay teachers basically based on how many students they have. And that's gonna rile a lot of feathers. But I'd like to be on a future agenda to discuss how this might happen. I'll stand for questions. Other than that, I'll just wish you luck with all the things you have to deal with. Thank you very much. And my uh, hand raving thing uh, went off. So if anybody has any comments, so we'll, we'll have to be old school. Now this is completely off the subject. Oh, I hope so. Uh, and, I, and, and don't expand, just answer the question. <laughs> no. What are you running for? Oh, I'm on the ballot statewide for Kansas State Treasurer. Okay. I, I was just curious. Thank just, you very that, much. That's a fact, factual statement. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Anything else? If not, 
I would like to thank our speakers. I will close the open forum at 1010. I'd like to thank them for their views. The state board will determine if any issues should be addressed as future agenda items. Again, we thank our presenters. At this time, we will discuss, uh, make the, we, the next item is the ESSER. Two and three change requests. Uh, yeah, there, there's Doug. have a PowerPoint. Thank you, Chairman Porter, members of the board. So good morning, everyone. Uh, back with our ESSER 2 and 3. Start with ESSER 2 as we have been. We've got three districts that submitted change requests for ESSER 3. Uh, the three districts have 1.3 million um, available to them. The changes that they have submitted actually represent no net chain in, in the amount of money that we're talking about. So it's just moving some money around for different purposes. Things came in under budget, over budget, um, et cetera. Uh, the only one I wanted to call out was Central Heights actually didn't spend quite as much money on premium pay as they had originally intended, and so they used that extra money for uh, SEL curriculum. If we look at our cumulative totals, uh, you'll see that we still have about $4 million over there on the right that is not spoken for. Uh, we don't have it in, included in any of the plans that have been submitted. If we look at that $4 million over there, um, about $3 million of the Three million of that amount um, is five districts. So the other one million is split between 39 other districts. So we're doing a pretty good job. I uh, just wanted to call out that ESSER 1, the CARES Act, the original ESSER money ended uh, September 30th of this year. So all of that money is already out the door, has been encumbered. It'll be liquidated by December. Uh, our team made a, a an effort to contact all the districts that still had some money left to make sure that they got it encumbered and we did not have to send anything back to the feds. ESSER 2 will face the same thing uh, next September 30th of 23. Um, so we're just kind of why I presented those, those figures to you today was to let you know that we're on top of that. We know how much money's left. We know what districts that's in and, and we will continue to work with them to make sure that happens. And then, of course, ESSER 3, um, 2024, September 30th. Any questions about ESSER 2? Ben. Visit amongst yourselves until Ben gets back to his place. <laughs> Any other questions, ESSER 2? Oh. That's what I'm kind of talking about. Oh, sorry. Sorry, where I was looking through my email and I couldn't find the, the link to it. So I don't know if, did anybody else get theirs? Go back to the to the list of. Thank you. Sorry. Go back to the back there. So those those are the only ones, right? Yeah. And it's basically no change, right? Uh, other than up and down. Yeah, you know, I see them because I get them for the the ESSER group, so I just made that assumption. Uh, this these are always discussed at the ESSER task force. I'm. You know, I'm there, so I'm, and Janet's there. I'm very comfortable that they are, they meet the standards. As a matter of fact, uh, 
we're getting, I think school districts are getting better at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at doing the, we haven't had an ineligible one for a while because I think school districts are, are actually doing a much better job. Uh, and, and basically these changes are for information purposes for you all. Um, the task force gave us the go ahead that we could go ahead and release funds and approve things if, if it was just a matter of moving funds around. The only thing that really needs approval from the task force and the board are any changes. So if you're comfortable, uh, schools need this money. Uh, so otherwise we can we have two options. If you're not comfortable doing it, we can make sure that we get these things overnight and approve them tomorrow. Uh, let's do that. Are you guys available tomorrow? Yep. So if we can, if we can make sure that you get those overnight to look at them, then we will do this as an agenda item tomorrow. We'll do actually the voting tomorrow. Okay. Let's go ahead and. All we'll do tomorrow is vote. Okay. Go so ahead and you do want the presentation me to go ahead now. Today. Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Um, so for ESSER 3, uh, we have those that were conditionally approved back in February and March. We're going to knock two more of those off of that list, so that leaves us two to go. Uh, we are working very closely with those last two, and we hope that we plan on those being on next month's board agenda. Uh, we've got nine districts that submitted new ESSER 3 plans this month, uh, 601 line items in those nine, 466 of those lines go to Wichita. So we have Wichita's plan in this month, and that really skews all of our data because $170 million really um, throws things off a little bit. So, and then we have seven districts that have submitted some ESSER 3 changes. Uh, 9.7 million total for their plans, but that's a change of $3 million in the changes that they have submitted. Um, as we look at where we're at, this, the task force and you all have approved 149 plans, um, two conditionally approved. Those are included in the 149, but those are the two that are left. Nine plans today worth 180 million, 99 that have not been submitted, uh, 29 that are under review in one form or another by the team. Um, just as we look at the demographics, the only thing I really wanted to say on this one is you look at the district sizes. Uh, we've got six of the bigger districts taken care of down at the bottom. That includes Shawnee Mission, Topeka, KCK, Blue Valley, Olathe, and then Wichita today. So the ones with big allocations we're getting through. So the 99 that are left or we're getting down to the smaller medium to smaller districts the batch today um, 180 and a half million dollars at their disposal the plans represent 180 million so that's 99 percent of the allocation is going to be taken care of today the ranges um, 35,000 at the bottom end is Greeley and then we talked about Wichita already the top end 169 million Per pupil spending, 148, that's also Greeley, up to 3,758, which is also Wichita. As we look at the teaching and learning piece, uh, the batch this month represents 71% for those types of activities. If we look at cumulative, uh, we're setting at about 80% of total funds going towards teaching and learning objectives. Uh, you all have approved 357 million, 180 million today. That leaves us 231 million still not spoken for in ESSER 3, as far as the plans that have been submitted. Questions? And we'll have time for questions tomorrow, too. Ann? I was reading an article about a new study that said instead of the 130 billion the Fed sent to help with learning recovery, we really need 700 billion. So if they ever send the rest of it, you guys are going to need to rest up. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Doug and Tate may run if that, if that happens, actually. Yeah, don't hold your breath. Anything else? Okay, go and ahead. And then the uh, ESSER 3 changes, 
Um, Shyland, Bonner Springs, and DeSoto, a lot of that's going for premium pay, and I think you'll notice that uh, in, in these seven different uh, change requests, a lot of this money is going towards premium pay. Uh, Golden Plains, they have an HVAC project that uh, all of their paperwork has been submitted and cleared, and so they're ready to go, so that's the big change for them. That uses up the rest of their allocation. Uh, Holcomb has premium pay, Osborne County premium pay, and then Chapman, uh, this also uses up the rest of their allocation, and it's going for premium pay and curriculum. And then, like I said, that uh, first bar for premium pay, the $185 million there, that represents a, a majority of the changes that are occurring this month. And so that would bump us up to about 81% approximately when we include that $3 million. Questions? If not, go ahead, Ann. Um, just one more thing. Now, if I recall, we don't send the money until they've actually incurred the expenditure? Correct. Okay, we, we so if they that. plan to spend $5 million on premium pay and they only spent four, they still only get four and they have to make right. another plan? Okay, thank you. They draw their money down after they've actually spent the... Okay. Go ahead. What about the... Uh, Deadline. Okay, I was looking for that slide. So we did make a recommendation last Friday to the task force that we would um, set a soft deadline for December 16th for all of our ESSER three plans to be submitted. There's 99 plans still out, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, also mentioned that we're on less than two years now to spend that money. Uh, if districts have a big project that they're thinking about, they really need to get those plans uh, submitted and approved so that they can move forward with that. We feel like that if we have all or most of the plans in by the middle of de December, we can get them reviewed and to you all by the middle of March and have all of those other three plans approved at that time. And then it's just the districts actually executing the plans. So we would propose that you all support us in getting districts to get their plans submitted by the middle of December. And the rationale is that there is there is no indication that the deadline for expenditures is going to be expended. And there there are a lot of things that have to happen between approval and completing of the project. And we want to make sure that uh, school districts have the opportunity. And if you wait to the last minute, you're probably going to lose money. So tomorrow there will be three votes. We will vote on ESSER 2. We will vote on ESSER 3, which is the uh, changes and the new things, and then we will vote on supporting the, uh, the December 16th deadline. Uh, and uh, by the way, uh, if you read all of the information about Wichita, if you start, if we can have that by the end of the day, today, it'll take you all night. <laughs> <laughs> it took me about a half a day to read those things. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry you have to come back tomorrow. I know that's a fate worse than death. But No, that's all right. <laughs>
is to provide training and information for those schools that are trying to support their students as they move uh, in a little bit of a consistent uh, fashion. It is loosely organized as a national program. Each state gets to develop their own program, but they all have some, some uh, commonalities uh, as far as having an, uh, an identified contact person, uh, providing training for teachers and staff, hosting military events to recognize those students, and those types of things. So far, 33 states uh, have implemented or in the process of implementing uh, Purple Star Schools recognition. So uh, I would stand for questions. Ben. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've, I'm excited about this. As you know, I've had several people from Geary County contact sure. me about it, so um, I, I'm really excited to to have this, and it's something that we already do, yes. uh, so it's not a huge hurdle to, no. to go through at all, but to have that recognition from the DOD would be huge um, for, for our district. So with that, I move that the Kansas State Board of Education act on request to approve the Kansas Purple Star School designation recognizing military-friendly schools that meet specific criteria and demonstrate a major commitment to serving students and families connected to our nation's armed forces. Is there a second to that motion? Uh, Gene seconds that motion. Discussion? Michelle? Thank you, Chairman Porter. I just had a couple questions. Um, we, were, we were already doing it, correct, in our state. We had some districts that were already we do have one state officially, or I'm sorry, one district officially doing it, uh, and others who are uh, certainly implementing pieces of the program without making it official. So, um, as far as the um, as far as the commitment to the, to the certain students um, in those schools for the purple, uh, how do, how does this impact um, the education of the other students? Does it impact, or do we even know? Uh, directly, or officially no, but indirectly, if you're making improvements and, and becoming aware of things you need to do to help one group of students, that's going to carry over to everybody else, typically. Just, I'm just going uh, with friends that I have that have been in the military. They, they're, oh. most, they're some of the most resilient. They're, 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 yes. They go, I mean, they have edu their education is, you know, Texas to Kansas to, and they're moved around a lot, but they're some of the most resilient because they do, they do move around a lot and they get to see a lot of it's a way of life. For exactly. Them. Yes. Exactly. So I guess my question: we don't have the, we don't really know, or we haven't seen. It's very, very broad here as far as the specific criteria that's coming from the state to demonstrate a major commitment to serving the students and families. Do we know what that specific criteria is that they have that they have to meet those schools, the demands on those schools? There are um, a list of activities, for examples, that you can use. Uh, in terms of how you support the students and being aware of what may be different in your system than the system they're coming from and how you can help them uh, make that transition. And then there are optional activities. Again, there's a list of examples, but it's not limited to those of ways that you can honor the military and uh, their service and, and presence in your community. So it doesn't, have to, it doesn't have anything to do with like our, I mean, they wouldn't lose funding or if they're not doing it complying with the state or anything like that. No. I mean, do they, they don't have to, because they, they were already doing it, and certain schools were already doing it. So they, do they need the blessing from the state Department of Education, or do they, from us, or do they, can they just, can they just do it? Uh, and do they, it in their own unique way? Yeah, they can choose to do it their own unique way if they want to be recognized as a Purple Star School so that that is noted on their websites and carries that meaning to parents as they're transitioning in and out then they do need to follow these criteria, but there's a lot of leeway within the criteria. There's intended to be a lot of flexibility. flexibility. Yes, okay. very much. Okay. All right. Thank you. For, thank you for answering those. Appreciate it. Certainly. Nobody has to do this. Correct. Uh, and it's actually, we this came to us at the request of those school districts that have large military uh, uh, enrollment. I would assume if I were... Now, I've never been in the military, but I assume that if I was and I was moving to Kansas, that uh, I might, and you have a choice of several schools, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that might be a reason that I would choose a school. That is what we have been told, and I think evidence bears that out. Okay. Par parents are well informed and they know what they're looking for. Okay. 
And even though students are resilient, those families are resilient, and I've known many of them, uh, it still doesn't hurt to help them. That's right. <laughs> Anything else? Not, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. All opposed, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. And now we're going to talk about board policy. Gene. We went over the uh, changes to policy and the guidelines at the last meeting and um, I would uh, propose that we go ahead and approve those changes and, and uh, the updates that we recommended. Does okay. anyone have any questions? Or? Is that a motion? Yes. I, I can go ahead and um, read the recommended motion. It's moved that the Kansas State Board of Education approves the recommended amendments to the Kansas State Board of Education guidelines and policies. Is there a second to that motion? Dina seconds that motion. And now it's time for discussion. Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. I, I'm, I'm trying to find my notes here. And the, is the mission and vision in there, or is that in another one? Our mission and vision statement in the policy. So I just have I just have a suggestion on the on the mission and vision statement since we're, since it's voted on as a whole whole thing rather than I, I would I would like to discuss more about our mission and vision statement. I have more time on that. Now or at some time uh, in the future? Whenever, yeah, whenever we, before I vote on it, I guess. I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah. Um. Mr. Chairman, um, I don't, it's, it's certainly uh, permissible to discuss the mission and vision now since you're talking about that, but I don't, we didn't make any changes to that in the policy. So really you're making, the motion is to accept the recommended changes. Um, from the policy committee. Okay. So that's all that would be approved to be uh, any edits that have been described and, and discussed by the policy committee. So the change in a state of vision would be appropriate as a future agenda item, but since it doesn't necessarily affect what we're recommending, it doesn't have anything to do with what the recommendations are today. Yeah, I'm, I, I, that's I, correct, but I, it wouldn't be, a, I don't think it'd be out of order if you wanted to to discuss it or hear a board members uh, view on that as it relates to policies but not but it's not a change that you're approving today okay so th then I still don't know how to go um, I just I like every I think that they did a great job as far as they put a lot of work and effort into it I just have a I just have a Strong, strong concerns about maybe we need to revisit our uh, mission statement, mission, mission and vision statement from the State Board of Education. Okay. Is that it? Is it? Yeah. Okay. In that case, Betty, is there is your hand up or, or are you scratching your chin? I, I don't, mine doesn't work, so I have to, can't I can't see. see. Okay. Go ahead, Betty. I can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And I do not have my my hand my thing is not up, so I can't I can't it, see. It, it was my understanding that um, vision, the vision and mission statement when we did a a board retreat, that was my understanding when you had mentioned revisiting that item. And if that's uh, if that's still on the the agenda then i think we should just uh, leave that as you suggested because there were members that came on that have ideas on vision and the mission and that we would have a board retreat where we would have an opportunity to look at that so that's really why we didn't touch any of that okay thank you uh, are you next janet well michelle's next <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I I really don't have any questions about the uh, policy manual. I simply would like to offer my uh, congratulations 
to the three members who served on this committee and my great thank you because I know what a challenge this is and I know how, I hate to say this, but thankless <laughs> this job is and I just hope that each of the other board members who have not served on this committee will recognize how, how, what an amazing job they did and how they went through it so thoroughly. So thank you. Did I see your hand, Jean? Okay. Dina. I don't think this thing is working. All right. I was just going to respond to what um, what Michelle was suggesting and to say that when we determine a change as a board to a mission statement and or the uh, vision statement, I would believe and that I can be corrected, obviously, but it would seem that that would automatically be changed. It's not something we would have to bring back to the board to vote on. It's just something that happens to be in the document because we've already made that decision. So am I correct with in that assumption? Maybe the attorney can help me. I think that when you vote as a board to, to make a change to that, it would it would uh, it would change if you approve that at the board level. Who's next, Jean? <laughs> Sorry, I don't can't tell you guys. I, I just wanted to say that in our policies, we review the policies and guidelines every two years. So this has been a, the end of a, a two-year process of review. That will start over again um, after in the new year. Um, and so that might be a better time to kind of go back and, and look at those things and determine if there, there are any other changes that need to be made in the future. But what we're voting on today are simply the ones that we discussed at the last meeting. Okay. And so we're going to go ahead and vote now. Uh, and I think that. It, it, it is important that we regularly review uh, this. This vision and mission statement was uh, was adopted shortly after I got on the board, which means that most of the members have not been a part of that discussion. So we will, at some point in the relatively near future, uh, have that discussion in in, in workshop form. But this motion is to the, is the recommended changes made by the committee that were that recommended last time. And I see nothing else. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. And now, Jay. Thank you, Chair Porter. Good morning to the board. So I'm pleased to be with you this morning. I'm pleased to share the ARC's most recent recommendations for accreditation, for systems accreditation. Um, this is a review of the current accreditation process. It is a five-year process to improve the state board outcomes through a continuous improvement process that's developed at that system level. For years one through four, there are yearly visits by the outside visitation team and that's a chair and at least two additional members. And then it also includes yearly system reports and OVT chair reports every each one of those four years. Uh, in year five, which these systems just completed year five that I'm bringing to you today, year five, the accreditation year, the ARC reviews all their documentation, including the system report, the OVT report, and their accountability report, and then makes that recommendation uh, there's a subgroup that makes the recommendation to the full ARC, 
and the full ARC votes just as you do to make that recommendation to the state board. And the ARC will write an executive summary and, and all of those, the three that I'm bringing to you today have executive summaries included in your, in your materials. So these are our definitions of accreditation. For accredited, it means there's sufficient evidence of both process and growth in student performance and must be in compliance and good standing with the board. Conditionally accredited, there is insufficient evidence of either the process or the growth uh, in student performance. It also means you must be in compliance in good standing. And then not accredited is insufficient evidence of both process and growth or, and by itself, not in compliance, not in good standing justifies a not accredited designation. So these are just some resources that the ARC uses as we move through their, their review process. And here are the three systems. They all entered KEYS in year one or PAWS their year five in 2021. Um, and these are the three systems that are being received today. So we have USD 468 Healy with an accreditation recommendation of conditionally accredited. Lawrence Gardner High School, conditionally accredited, and Lake Mary Center in Paola, conditionally accredited. So those are the three systems I bring as receive items to the board today. In our packet, we also have uh, Edges and Community Schools 377. That should go next month, so that's, that's a little early, so we'll have to make sure we clear that up. Okay. Is they that, should be slated for next month. So that, so we will not receive that today. Right. That's correct. My question has already been answered because uh, in Healy, uh, on the information that I got, it listed that they appeal, but it didn't say what the appeal was, but you just answered that question. So. Mm -hmm. Ann. Thank you. I'm... Glad to see these were conditionally accredited, but um, was there any discussion on any of them? I'm like just not accrediting them. No, there wasn't. There wasn't a discussion around not accredited. It all started, if you look at these three systems, what they had in common was not a lot of evidence for a strong comprehensive needs assessment, which led to really good measurable goals. Those weren't present in any of these, these three systems. So it was really, this was kind of a first step. I mean, obviously that's the first step of, of any type of process. So that was the first step that the ARC addressed with this conditional accreditation. Well, I mean, I get Lawrence Gardner because I know what they're up against. The other two, I was wondering though, I mean, if they didn't have a system in place and I know the results weren't there, should there have been a consideration of just not accrediting them if they didn't have either piece? Well, I guess to, to be fair, there's always a consideration for not accredited. But in this case, that subgroup of the ARC decided that conditionally accredited fit uh, for Healy and for Lake Mary, I think if you're referring to that, um, in this case. And really starting with that process piece, um, they did look at results. And so that's part of it. Uh, but I think, again, they're looking at the area for improvement to first address is that needs assessment, which leads to really strong goals. They really didn't have evidence of either of those. Yeah. So last month we had the discretion of, uh, discussion about meridazine, and maybe we should look in another year. And I'm wondering about all the conditionally accredited. Is there a schedule where, I mean, uh, meridazine kind of feels like we picked on them because quite a few have come through and, you know, we said we or we accredited them, and now we're going to look again. But um, so I'm wondering. I don't want to just single them out for special attention. We let all these others go and don't look back. So the the timeline for these is dependent on the the area for improvement that's identified by the ARC. So depending on the issue that was address uh, that that was identified in each of those systems. The ARC will then make a recommendation for this is how long it should take you. And then that's really where um, the system comes back to us by that deadline saying, we feel like we've, we've rectified this to the level of what the ARC recommended and then bring it back to the full ARC for, for uh, that subgroup 
arc to again consider it before it goes to the full arc. So there's something in a file somewhere that says so and so was supposed to get this done in nine months and now the arc needs to look at it again. That's actually yes. on a schedule. That's somewhere. actually in the in the in the uh, documentation that you have. It will show the dates of when those those recommendations or those adaptations should be made. Yeah, but does it come up on yours or Myron's or somebody's mm -hmm. to-do list? Like, oops, we're supposed to look at so-and-so again in nine months. Yeah, we have a, a spreadsheet, a very involved spreadsheet that we're continuing to improve. But yes, we do have the capability of adding that to the schedule. I think previously, a lot of the conditionally accredited were just a year. So mm -hmm. they got lumped in with that next uh, round of systems going through in that year. I think you'll see a difference with these because some of them, I think, made the recommendation that, for instance, if they need to go through a needs assessment process and set goals, the timeline might be by the end of January of next year. So that would mean quicker action uh, by the ARC in moving, in considering a system moving from conditionally to, a, to accredited. Okay. Well, maybe it's something we can dig into tomorrow then. We have our retreat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. If, in fact, they have a deadline and they don't meet it, what are the consequences? At this point, they, they maintain that, um, that status until in time when they, can, they, can, they want to go through again. But we really don't have a set process of, for how to handle that. Um, so really what we're going with right now is at the point of that deadline, we want to have them go through the arc again and then the ARC makes their recommendation again. And whether that changes or not, that, that will be. But we need to make sure we're scheduled that, we've scheduled that out. Okay. And we don't have, I'll just be honest with you, we really don't have a process in place to handle. They, they didn't address the issue and didn't really communicate back with us that they have addressed it. Okay, and so, Ann, that might be something else we need to discuss. Uh, yeah. Now, one other question. Maybe more than one. Uh, I know that Healy is terribly small. You know, I think it said 42 students. Mm -hmm. There is nothing under success or effective rate for 2018. Uh, zero. Uh, how can that happen? Well, it's um, a good question. Sometimes I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I saw that myself. Uh, the ARC saw that. So that's, that's something that Healy probably would have addressed in their documentation. They should have addressed in their documentation, but I don't know why that would be zeroed out for both those areas. Well, the only way it could be is that in 2018, they didn't have anybody graduate. No graduates. Yeah. And I guess in a school of this size, that's conceivable. No, they, they show a graduation rate, I think, of 100% Oh, year. yeah. Yeah, they do. I mean, what that would mean is no student went beyond graduation to earn a certificate or to school. Okay. And that... And then that size, it may have been one student. Yeah. It, it may have been five yeah, students. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. that uh, well, because it says in the documentation that their classes range from one to six. So, right. I mean, that's possible. There's one student that went to the farm. Jean? One of the things that I, I would be interested in finding out a little more about is. Um, the role of having a, a stable staff and administration and its effect on uh, a district uh, being able to have a, a good KISA process and to be able to have the, the data collection and the programs in place to, to be accredited. Because I, I'm wondering if our, our difficulty in having staffing in, in the teacher and administrator fields is really now affecting um, this program. And I think that might be a topic for discussion tomorrow. But I think it, it may well be, and, and we need to look at that. And I really shouldn't bring this up. When is small too small? that we don't need to discuss that at this point, even though I'm sure that Dr. Schrock is smiling. Uh, 
Uh, but I think that's a legitimate question that somebody needs to answer. Uh, anything else? Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. So my question was on Atchison, but I will just wait till next yeah. month because I think some of the stuff that I had questions on, we can discuss tomorrow in our little um, session because I, th I think it's important to bring up um, like Naviance and Zello. And when talking about individual plans of study, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd prefer mine on a paper form than, I mean, I, we've already experienced that with my oldest son and, and all the information that got out there and all the stuff that we got in the mail. And I think that sometimes that gets breached or the, the privacy goes out there and it, and it, and they've just kind of put something down like, I want to be an engineer or what, just because they wanted to put something down and then you're getting, you're getting on, a, on the wrong track for that child. So I just want to make sure we're not jumping in and putting things down in, 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 uh, in a computer or on a Google Drive somewhere and then it's like they, they can't backtrack out of it. I, I, as a parent, I would want to know, I, I want to know, I, I would want to be involved in that individual plan of study at the school with my child and we're doing that anyway at home and rather than having it be on a, on a, uh, on a computer somewhere or in, in a file. So that, when I see individual plan of study or ACT workies or whatever they want to call it, I just want to make sure that the parents have that ability to understand what that, what that really means mm -hmm. and, um, for their child. So we'll just, we can discuss that tomorrow. Okay, that's a discussion for next month, but I also have some questions for Atchison, but I'll just wait until you present that to us. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. The commissioner is going to start, and at 10 minutes after 11, we're going to take a break. I'm just warning you, Randy, that we're going to leave you at 10 minutes after 11. I, uh, I knew that was going to happen. So, so we're going to do a look back to last year. We're going to be looking at a lot of data, some celebration, but all around um, data that, um, that related to your goals and, uh, and, and how we're doing. And so um, one of the things, as you think about accreditation, that we do a little bit differently in Kansas, and we can, we'll have this full discussion tomorrow, is most states separate out accreditation and accountability. So they put accreditation at a really, really low level, and then they have an accountability part, that, and they run that separate. We run that together. Uh, b because of the decision that we wanted outcomes that would matter uh, for students. So last week or the last couple weeks, I made a little trip starting in Osborne, Kansas, but really went to the far left corner and to St. Francis and then made my way on the very northern counties, as you can see on that map, all the way ending in Wathena. Uh, the Riverside School District, and Gene and Dina joined me on that entire trip where it was appropriate to be in their district, uh, and so uh, appreciative of that. But it made me think of the work because when you think about a mission or a vision and you think about the role of the state board and the role of a local board and the role of families and parents and then the role of students, it's a partnership, it's a partnership that has to be in, in sync with each other for things to move. So you have certain authority given to you by the Constitution of Kansas, so do local boards. Certainly parents and students have rights and responsibilities also. So the question then as we look back to last year is how are we doing relative to the goals that you set forward that school districts have executed on and that ultimately students and parents and families, uh, how have they done? So we started this journey in 2015. I want to lay out a timeline for you that was laid out at that time. And uh, as Betty mentioned, we'll be revisiting uh, soon at retreats. But we said at that time, if we're going to do this right, we have to withstand political changes and wins. We have to be really focused on about a 10-year journey, and we likened it to Kennedy's 
moonshot and we had some redesigned schools. So we did the research in 15, we validated that in 21, I'll talk about that. But we didn't really get started till 16. So we said we would have all the systems in place and all the school districts would be in that alignment by 26. And we would really start to obtain the goals that you said, like 95% graduation of uh, high school by 2030. And I wanna say that again, that the systems would be in place by 26. We would start to hit those goals and we're way ahead of that by 30. All right, now th that's a long time and that's a lot of political cycles. But I I'll take you back to when Kennedy stood at Rice University and made the statement, we ought to land a man on the moon by the end of the decade and return him safely to Earth. We couldn't launch a rocket that went straight into space. And as you know, Neil Armstrong in 1969 set foot on the moon. But what I've always said about that is that even had President Kennedy lived, he would not have been president when we landed on the moon. He would have served, at the most, he would have served two terms and would have exited prior to that. That was a huge commitment to be made in a political cycle. You have made as a board a huge commitment that, that will stand, Mr. Roberts was here, he, he's no longer on the board, right? I mean, people come and go, governors come and go, other people, local board members come and go, teachers come and go, and yet, are we going to get the 95% graduation rate and people get impatient at times? I do too. And then something happened along the way, hard to believe, right? A couple of dark clouds called COVID did set us back. And I will show you some data from last year, which I think is really interesting about some of the challenges with that. So right now, we're setting in 2022. We, we just heard Jay talk about some systems that Ann questioned, why wouldn't you have this process in place? They don't. We, we still have school districts that don't have good processes in place. We would expect that to be tightly done by 26. We, we need it to be done, uh, but that, that's the journey that we're on. This is the vision statement, um, as you know, and, uh, and what we're gonna talk about today, of, of how are we hitting the lead the world and how are our students doing? So let's first start, who are we in Kansas? Now, most of that I'm gonna share with you are all about accredited schools, public and private. This data, the demographic data right now is just the public school, all right? So we're taking a snapshot of the public school, and this is the demographic. When you get to the other category, we like to break that out for you because you're going to ask me, Randy, who's the other category? It's Asians. It's Native Americans. The biggest part of that is multiracial. What students say, I'm multiracial. But when you start to separate it out, you get into small groups that that's, that's why it's put as an other category. But I want you to know it does involve Native Americans, multiracial, and Asian would be the three largest groups within the other category um, that's there. Now, to give you an idea over the last 10 years, here's what's happened is happening to the demographics in Kansas. Just a snapshot of what's transpiring. You can see the dark blue, black almost, are Caucasian students, and that has been slowly declining as a percent of the population of Kansas students over the last 10 years. It started 67% today, or this, this past year, when again, we're looking back, is now at 62.5%. So what demographic has been increasing? Hispanic. The largest percent of, of growth has been in the Hispanic. No one knows that more than Gene Clifford. Because if you live in Garden or Dodge or Liberal, you've seen a total shift over the last decade, two decades, in the demographics of those communities. We mentioned when we talked about Dodge City a meeting or two ago, they are a majority minority school district. And that one time was not the case. It's less noticeable 
Dana and, and Jean, where we kind of traveled in northwest and northeastern Kansas. So, but we see it almost in every community to some extent. So that's the largest growing from 17% to 21%. African-American students have actually declined over that 10-year period. So we're not growing our, the African-American community in Kansas. We're actually slightly decreasing from mid-sevens to upper sixes. And as you can see, the multiracial, the Native Americans, the Asian, or the other category has slightly grown from a little bit over 8% to just under 10%. Most of those are with students that classify themselves as multiracial. That makes sense. So I just, this is just the snapshot of who's in the schools. All right. So a little bit more of the demographics. These are, this is the percent of students on free and reduced lunch. And there's some caveats with this as we look at this data. First, you will see we peaked in the percent of students on free and reduced lunch in the year 2014. See that? At 50.3%. Then you see it's been a slow decline until you get to 21, 22, and you see, my gosh, we really cut poverty in Kansas. No. What happened in 21 and 22 during COVID is that both administrations, President Trump and then President Biden, said, we're going to allow any student to eat breakfast and lunch for free, regardless of their status. And so what happened? A lot, you hear this, Janet, I bet, out of Kansas City, Kansas. A lot of families said, well, we're not even going to bother to do the paperwork then, because we get the food for free anyway. And thus, you see that drop. When we get the data, and we're st I'm standing here next year talking to you, my guess is that's going to go back up. Because this year, that stopped. And in fact, Medicaid expansion uh, actually qualified probably in many of your communities. Um, Betty, I know in Wichita, more students. So I don't want you to think that that was a drop necessarily in free and reduced lunch students. It was a drop in applications of free and reduced because everyone was getting to eat breakfast and lunch for free. Does that make sense? Someone will see that, and you could easily, I think, misinterpret that. But overall... We have reduced the number of students on free or reduced lunch since 14 in a slow decline. It peaked in 14. That's not true for special ed students. The green ovals represent special needs students. That has increased over the last 12 years to now a high of 15.9%. So, where do you think the largest increases within special ed have occurred? What categories do you think over that? That's about a decade, a little bit over a decade. What do you think we've seen increases in students with disabilities? What areas? Autism would be one of the three. Significant increase of the number of students with autism. When my son, who was, is a 2011 graduate, was early in, in preschool and elementary school, and we were going to the doctors, it was relatively still new. I mean, we were, we were giving information to physicians, you know, uh, and he was on the spectrum of high, high achieving autism. We've seen a large number of autism. That would be one. Jim, I, I, did you say autism? I didn't. I didn't hear it. Yeah, yeah, learning disabled, specifically within the learning disabled, dyslexia. Oh, and all the areas of dyslexia. And you know we've done a lot with that. So that would be a second area. And then area called developmentally delayed, which is usually that early childhood, which encompasses, I'm just not showing that typical growth that you would see uh, at a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old. Those are the three increases that we've seen primarily but there are more special needs kids today than there were. When you look at the federal level, because the federal uh, people audit us on this, we are not out of compliance, meaning we're over-identifying kids. You'll hear that, well, they must just be identifying more kids. No, 
we get audited on that, and they said, no, the, we, you literally have more kids that have legitimate needs. So that's the special ed. English language learners is the orange oval, and it peaked in 2016 and has been slowly declining ever since. These are students that do not speak English as their first language. Now, Janet in Kansas City, Kansas, and Betty in Wichita, there are over 100 languages spoken on any given day in those two school districts. Jim knows that well from being in Wichita. A student, though, is only an English language learner until they exit the program they're not, for, they're not an English language learner forever. Once they exit the program, then they no longer are. So what you're seeing there are students that are currently in the English language learner. And as we talk about other data, I want you to know this. The English language learner, the student that has not mastered the English language enough to move out of the program, is the student that tends to do not as well as any of our other subgroups in whether we're looking at graduation, whether we're looking at uh, academics, et cetera. Okay? That's the demographics of who we are. I just wanted you to know that because it's going to play in at how we look then at Kansas. The other thing that we don't show on this that is certainly true, and we, again, saw that on our trip for Gene and Dina, we continue to have a migration of rural Kansas to urban and suburban. So it, that's slow, but if you talk to most school districts that are rural and say, how's enrollment? They may say, oh, we're up five this year, or we're down four this year. But if you say, how about over the last 10 years? Well, we're down. We're down over where we used to be. And you can see that in the classifications. We now have, I believe, 25 six-man football teams, 25 school districts playing six-man. We also have another group of schools that have partnered together to play either six or eight man. A decade ago, we had zero six man football. That's a sign of rural getting smaller. And Jim, you, you mentioned that. All right. And so, uh, and suburbans and urbans getting larger. In some cases, we have an increase in total, but that, but that may be distributed. We don't represent that on chart, but you feel that and that is reality. Now, we're going to get into some data sets, but you need a break because... Yeah, this, uh, this sounds like a good time. It is a great time. Guy. Great time for a so break. Ten minutes. Because Janet told me that five minutes wasn't enough. <laughs>
All right, so now we know who's in school and who's made up in school. Let's then talk about what happened in 15 and where we're going. So you remember the definition. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at several areas. Academic. Academic. We're going to be looking at academic. Academic. We're going to be looking at cognitive technical employability skills, civic engagement, other skills to be successful in post-secondary education. Guess what? You generally can't get to post-secondary unless you graduate. You can get a GED, and there's another route, but, but generally high school graduation gets you there and then uh, without the need for remediation. Went to 27 places in 15 to determine what are the skills necessary to be successful. Kansan said, this is the skills. That wheel then was developed, interpersonal, interpersonal, cognitive, but those are the skills actually listed in Tony's original 110 slide deck around what Kansan said, these are the skills to be successful. Since that time, I have gone out, of course, and I, it's not even fair, Jim, because you've been with me sometimes. I say to audiences, if you only had to pick one, one for Janet, your own grandkids, if you just had to pick one, said, you know, when you get to be an adult, I want you to have this one, which isn't fair because they're all important in the development of a child. Over 10,000 cans and said, if I had to pick one, the number one rated response was perseverance. Interesting enough. Um, but these are the competencies. You then said, we're going to create some outcomes around that. Social emotional growth measured locally. That data will never come to the state other than you'll tell us in your accreditation. Kindergarten readiness, because if kids show up at age five not ready, it's hard to get them ready. Very important what they did not say. They did not say kids or schools have to run that. They said churches can run it. We hope parents do it at home, but we have to have communities bring kids ready for kindergarten. An individual plan a study that's robust, but he will remind me maybe more than once during this presentation, we have a ways to go on that and from the robustness side of that. But again, we're talking about trying to change behavior and then measuring high school graduation, that post-secondary completion. In 21, we went back out right after the pandemic that allowed us to do that. This time to 50 locations, we simply did this. We took the wheel and we asked the question, are these the skills? Now we were around 4,000 people showed up to those 50. Are these the skills that make up success or you want to change them? I mean, in essence, that what, that's what we said. And the people that came out, 93% said, we strongly agree or agree that those are the skills necessary to be successful as an adult. I, 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 you've seen this so many times, you go, he's just doing it again. But I do that because that's, that's the origins of then what you did to then start to measure against those goals. Can you go back just a second, because I can't read the red. The red is... Uh, disagree or strongly disagree, 2%. Okay, only 2%. Well, there was 2%, yeah. or yeah. only 2 however you look at okay. it. There were 2%. So, uh, again, that was those were open sessions, 93% um, agreement with what? Agreement with these are the skills done in conjunction that students need. By the way, I look at those and think about my two adult children, and you, you know, you, you can layer your own kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, kids down the street. And I look and say, hmm, sometimes I think my son could use a little time management. It's not bad, but it's still, that's a work in progress some days, right? Um, but my daughter, really strong creative thinking, and we go on and on, right? Kids have these in different. Now, then along the way, we did some redesign schools, and what we found that they're now part of KISA is that you take those skills and you have to integrate those. Those should not be taught separately. They should be taught integrate, in an in integrated manner. When you see an honor a debate team like you did with, with Auburn Washburn, or you honor that FBLA team from Wellsville, they're integrating those academic skills and those other skills together. We have a ways to go in engagement of family, business, community partnerships 
Michelle would tell me we have a ways to go on that and engaging parents and really making sure that we're engaging, not communicating, personalizing the learning for families and kids, and every time we can to try to give real world applications. And that, those are the basis for what we're doing. Now I wanna share with you a short video clip that you probably have seen before from an organization that you're very familiar with that may resonate with some of the work that you're doing. So here we go. Eric, is there a reason we have no sound? Hang on a second, because my mind's fully up. But Here is it go. still applicable to the 21st century? How about this? Look at amazing technology that I can do. I can go back and I can go forward. <laughs> Melanie's impressed by my skills. And here we'll start again. The current common model of education in the United States focuses primarily on English language arts, ELA for short, and mathematics. This model has been in place and relatively unchanged for over 100 years. But is it still applicable to the 21st century? From early education through high school, the current model encourages students to focus their learning in these two core areas. And this model measures students' progress with two important but limited outcomes, core subject grades and test scores. With high quality education, access to resources and hard work, students may do well in this system. They achieve academic success as they move from kindergarten through secondary education. Unfortunately, this doesn't always mean they're prepared for college or career. These students may not even be aware that there are crucial skills that their education has not emphasized. And when they enter post-secondary education or the workforce, they do not have the cross-cutting capabilities, behavioral skills, or career navigation skills they need to achieve success. Research shows that ELA and mathematics are simply not enough to prepare students for a successful transition to post-secondary education and the workforce. In fact, researchers have long noted a serious leaky pipeline problem in our education system. This leaky pipeline means students often trickle out of post-secondary education before completion, despite having received adequate K-12 instruction under the current model. This is because students arrive to the next phase in their educational journey lacking the skills necessary for success. For example, they may not be prepared to adapt to a new environment, engage in collaborative work, manage their time, or make good decisions about their own education and career path. This disconnect becomes even more apparent when students move into the workforce. Under the current model, students simply don't learn how to build a skill set that will prepare them for a job they're passionate about, or choose a career that's a good fit for them. Meanwhile, employers are searching for new hires who have a wider skill set than the current education model provides. They need employees who are dependable, problem solvers, lifelong learners, and collaborative team players. Right now, many students simply aren't prepared to enter a competitive, complex job market that will call on them to demonstrate all these skills and more. So, students, post-secondary institutions, and employers are feeling the limits of the common model of education. Academic skills are simply not sufficient to ensure success. Instead, research indicates that success at school and work is multidimensional. And if success is multidimensional, we need a multidimensional measurement of student readiness, focusing on a diverse, adaptable set of knowledge and skills. This is where the ACT holistic framework comes in. I end there because ACT, remember them? They do a test. This is the ACT research that just described what you put in place. By the way, I didn't ask them to do that little animation. That was their work, saying, we have found in our 50, 60 years of looking at test data that it can't predict. So as we look at ACT, and we'll, they'll be here next month, Beth and ACT will be here, let me just give you a sense. Student scores 22 on the ACT. ACT would say, you have a 50% probability that you will get an A or a B in college algebra. 
What that also means is you have a 50% probability you won't, right? Because ACT just said there's other skills that get in play. That's the backdrop. Now let's look at this past year and let's set the stage. Chronic absenteeism. A few years ago, it was 13%. I'm going to give you some state averages, and then we'll define it. Then you see this is fairly steady, 19 and 20 pre-pandemic. Uh, it was right there. Then we get to 21 school year. You can see it took a jump. Look what happened last year to chronic absenteeism. A quarter of the kids were chronically absent from school quarter of the kids. Now we can get into all the reasons because I, right, quarter of the kids chronically absent from school. Now I'm just going to give you the definitions of what this means. You miss 10% or greater of the total number of days of school, whether they're excused, meaning a parent called them in, Randy is sick every Monday, uh, right? or I'm suspended in or out of school. It does not count I'm on the FFA trip. Does that make sense? It doesn't count that I'm gone for or cross country. It's, it's excused, unexcused absences, suspensions. So if I go to school, Ben, in Sterling, 170 days a year, these are kids that miss more than 17 days of school, more than 17 days of school. And we have last year, a quarter of our students in our state did that. U.S. Department of Education says, this is their research, children in the early grades, chronically absent, in pre-K, kindergarten, first, are much less likely to be able to read that grade level by the time they get to third grade, much less likely. That same research says, you're chronically absent, you're missing critical instruction, and you drop out of school disproportionately. Chronic absenteeism affects low-income students, students of disabilities, as well as students of color and English language learners disproportionately because they already come to school with less skill sets. Remember a quarter. I want to share with you that that's the state average, a quarter. However, we have some schools that have over 50% last year chronic absenteeism. More than half of their kids missed 10% of the days of school. Betty? Just a clarification question. When we are talking about um, those subgroups that are disproportionately impacted, um, where would our foster care kids uh, in that area fall? Same place, Just, Betty, even I, worse, because they're changing school districts also along with being chronically absent. So Okay, so they don't have just their own category in no, that. They're just not in all the over. research that this is just this is right out of the research. So okay. I did this is not my it's my slide, but I just took the okay. language right out of the okay. research. I was just trying to understand yeah. that, not a biggie. Thank yeah. you. We have school districts that had over fifty percent last year. So here's what I did, because you're going to see now data, but I want you to be thinking, we've got the demographic look. That chronic absenteeism is going to cloud every piece of data I'm going to share with you from this point on. All right? Of the 25 school districts that had the highest chronic absenteeism last year, only one academically did better than the state average. I mean, all the rest did poor academically. Only five of the 25 post-secondary registered above 50%, and that was barely. 20 were below the state average. In, if you invert that, take a look at those school districts that had the lowest chronic absenteeism. Oh, by the way, those areas that had the highest chronic absenteeism last year, school districts, were disproportionately poor school districts. They were the poor school districts. Those that had the lowest were the most affluent school districts. 
So again, Betty, it goes to this slide, right? It disproportionately affected that. What happens if I don't come to school? If school is valuable, there's a loss there, right? So I want you just to think about that because I'm going to come back to this that chart. We went from 13 to 25 in two years. You'll see some recommendations at the end right before we go to lunch. This is significant as you look at this data. So let's see how schools did last year relative to looking at that data. So let's start with graduation. I'll show you some series of years, but I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised in some cases remarkable that our skill, schools did so well with students missing so many days. All students, over time, <clears throat> we've grown that by 2% since we started tracking in 16 when you set the goal. But we went down, we went down 0.2 a year ago. You're looking at the class of 21, the class of 22, we don't close until the end of October. We don't actually complete that data set and send that off until right around Christmas. Let's look at subgroups. English language learners, what did I, remember what I told you? English language learners are the most severely hit in this data set. And you can see that in graduation. They dropped a full percent last year. They still, though, are making up the gap if you look overall. Now, here's what's interesting. Free and reduced lunch in students with disabilities actually went up. Our poverty kids actually went up, and our students with disabilities went up. And here's what we can say about last year. We've never graduated more kids in poverty than we did a year ago, ever. We never graduated more students with disabilities than we did a year ago. And the gap between those students, remember the demographics, the gap is narrowed. Meaning, while we're growing all, the subgroups are growing faster than the 2% average, which is narrowing that gap. If we were narrowing the gap because the all was dropping, you wouldn't want to see that. You're seeing that happen with an increase around those groups. Betty? Does that not indicate that maybe uh, the correlation we're trying to make between chronic absenteeism and the rate of graduation might not be as strong? Yes. I think, I think there's some truth to that. Um, but it, you certainly see it in English language learners, and you saw it with the all students. Those did drop. So I think there was some impact, maybe not as strong as it would have seen. Now, when we get to academic, you're going to see a little bit different, I think, when we look at that. All right, that's graduation. Let's look at post-secondary. Uh, let's look at student success post-secondary. Remember, we need 73% of our workforce to have something beyond high school. It's a 50-50 split. When we started this in 15-16, of those two categories, were we doing better with kids going to baccalaureate degrees or better with certificates and associate degrees, kids out of high school? Do you know? Baccalaureate. Baccalaureate. We were, we were, we were over 30%, Mark Tomlin have the exact data, with students going on to baccalaureate. We were woefully low with certificates in two years, and we you put a concerted effort saying every kid's path ought to be valued. Plumbers, electrician, linemen, physical therapy assistants. We can go on and on, right? Phlebotomy, EM, EMTs. And I want to share with you what's happened over the last six years. Remember, we're looking at a five-year average here. So we're averaging the years 2011 to 15. That was produced in, 19, in 2017. We were at 44%. 44% of the kids, those five-year average, graduated high school and earned something else after high school. That number became 46. That number became 48. That number then stayed at 48. And last two years ago, that number went to 50. And this year, we took a look at the years 2016 to 2020, which is pre-pandemic, because this is in arrears two years. So we're looking at it in 22, but we're going to go back to the years 16 to 20, right? 
and we're at 52%. Most of that gain's been in the certificates and two-year degrees. And that gain is 8% in the last six years when graduation has only grown 2%, meaning more kids went on to school than even graduated in that increase, which is what we want to see. Next year, you're going to see the effects of the pandemic start to occur because you're going to be looking at the class of 21 in there and eventually the class of 22. So we want to make sure we can hold our own and coming back to Betty's comment, can we, after we see the effects of that pandemic. So graduation, down slightly overall, up slightly with two subgroups. Post-secondary, up. But again, this is a five-year average, two years in arrear. And I just want to caution you as you look at that. But that's still good news as we think about how do we get there by 2026 and in the future. We're, we want to get to 70 to 75. Betty? Okay. I'm, I'm a little lost okay. on, on this. Um, I'm, and I'm not sure if that's state or federal where cohort graduation is not counted. Uh, if yeah. It's a federal oh, definition. That's a federal definition. That's correct. So that's not what we are looking at when we... We are looking at federal definition as it relates to graduation. So it's, I started as a freshman four years later, right. give or take a few months, I graduate high school. The post-secondary effect, do I go on, is us looking at that. Okay. So that could include, when we look at at the difference, it could include those that graduated later and, and weren't counted? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that's good news, but, but a caveat, that's always in arrear. Okay, and, and you look at that data when you look at the accountability report. In fact, here's the number of school districts over the last four years that have achieved over 70% of post-secondary effective. Eight, seven, 10, now 14. Small numbers, right? But, but look, you've gone from seven or eight to 14. It's about a 40% increase in four years at 70%. And then look at the number of school districts that have achieved 60% or greater. Look what happened to that number in four years. In four years. So as you're out and people say, hey, we're looking at this data. I don't know that we like this data or we do like this data or, or and let's talk about this data, right? People are paying attention. We're trying to get kids with those skills. We're doing a pretty good job. Now let's shift to academic. Nationwide, test scores fell. You've been reading the NAEP? things, lowest ever. Former Governor Jeb Bush said, wow, we, we've just erased a decade. You know, if you look at NAEP, you'll hear about ACT and SAT next month as that gets released. I uh, can't speak to that, but I'm just going to tell you it may follow some national trends. In Kansas, literacy, English language arts fell again, following the national trend. Math did not. Math actually rebounded close to the 2019 levels, not quite. So we've got to reverse that, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reverse that. Everyone, Esser, those monies that you approve, that's what we're trying to do. So I want to share with you some longitudinal data around that. These charts are going to be busy. You'll have them. We'll want to revisit them. The light blue, this is English language arts, how kids scored as a 10th grader. You know our state assessment, right? Level one, level two, level three, level four. We subdivided those. One and half, two and half, three and half. So that far left bar, that's the lowest level one kids. Does that make sense? And the top far right are the top level four kids because we divided those in half. You're looking at less than 7% of the kids in that bottom level one. Not very many. 
and you're not you're looking at about four percent of the kids at the top level of four so not very many but here's what you can see the blue bar talks about I scored level one or two three or four and did I graduate high school in the lowest level one 69 percent of those students in 20 17 that took the exam graduated high school, and you can see all the way over to level five, it's 95%. And then did they go on? You can see the yellow bar is did they go on? Only 14% of students in the bottom of level one went on for 81% in language arts. I scored level four in language arts, went on. And then the yellow, or excuse me, the orange bar is the equivalent ACT score that those students scored. Okay? The blue bar is graduation. The yellow bar is post-secondary success. The orange bar is ACT score. Uh, and they, um, we're comparing it to how did I score on the 10th grade state assessment in language arts? Does that make sense? If I scored a two, those are how the kids did that scored two, if I scored a three. All we did on these levels is do, right, we just did the lower level one, the upper level one, the lower level two, upper level two. And then we did mathematics. Same thing. Here's mathematics. I scored level two in math. Did I graduate high school? Did I go on? And what was my ACT score? Okay. Now I'm going to put them together and then we're going to talk a little bit. So now it becomes really busy. That's why I didn't want to start. It was busy enough, right? The two bars on the left are English language arts and then math to graduation. The next two bars are post-secondary success and the next two bars are ACT. These are Kansas kids. We now have done two classes fully class of 17 and the class of 18. While they vary just a little bit, statistically they're, they show very similar trends. Obviously, the better academically you get, the more likely you are to A, graduate high school, B, go on after high school, and have a higher ACT score. Do you see that? Where do you get the biggest bang for the buck? Level two. We really start to move the needle in level two, and while level three is higher and level four is higher, it's nominal as you go up. There would be some in the state of Kansas that say over and over that kids in level two are failing. That discussion needs to cease today. They are not failing. In fact, most of them graduate high school. The vast majority go on to post-secondary, and they're scoring an ACT average of around 21 which is the college admission score to get in. And that's why when you look at the state assessments of how we describe it, we say they have a basic knowledge of academic skills to go on, and level one is a limited knowledge. You certainly do better in three and four, and you do not do as well in level one, even though the most of the kids in level one are at the top of level one. We must move students out of level one. We must move students out of level one into level two because that correlational data is compelling to say it's possible we could have a better outcome academically for the future if we can do that. So I want to say both things. Betty? I could, I could have finished. I could have asked after you finish your sentence, but thank you. If we are looking at 37% um, of the jobs in Kansas require um, post-secondary Certificate or a two-year degree. I thought that was 73 for the certificate. That, no, that's total. That's total. So that would be baccalaureate, master's, PhDs, professional <laughs> certificates, and associate. That's total. Okay. Because... On a chart you, you, you showed us, it looked like um, careers or jobs in the state of Kansas had were more in the high school graduation with a two-year 
So let me go back to that. 73% of the job market in Kansas requires you to have a high school education and something else. Of the 73%, 37% of that market okay. are baccalaureate, master's, okay. PhD, or professionals, like okay. law degrees. Okay. 36% are certificates or two-year degrees okay. so for the total of seven. We combine those. That's, that's correct. That's kind of where I was a little uh, baffled in the sense that this this chart is showing us for post-secondary going on to college. <laughs> going on to something post-secondary. Yeah. 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 And and I was looking more like the four-year degree and not including the two. Yeah. No. This so one, this that one was includes certificates. Thank you. Yeah. So we're going to use this chart a lot, and we're going to add to it, right? The class of 18, the class of 19, we're going to add thousands of pieces of data. The important thing to know is this: these are Kansas kids, and we're then following them to graduation and after, and then asking the question, kids in level two do well. Kids in level three do slightly better. Kids in level four do slightly better. But notice, the very top of level four, these are kids that averaged 31 on the ACT. That's a 36-point scale. We're talking some pretty high academic kids. 17% of those kids did not go on past high school. And 4% of them didn't even graduate high school. Yet they were the top academic kids in our state as some tests would measure. State assessment and ACT, if you, if you put those two together, right? Why? And then look at the bottom of level one where you're talking about 7% of language arts kids and less than 4% of mathematics kids. How did those kids, 68% of them graduate high school, 14% of them went on and the average ACT score was in the upper 14s. Why, why wasn't that much lower? Because there's another skill set that we're talking about that you add together to make this work. Understand, we must move students out of level one, but we should never call a student in level two failing. I want to make, and again, we're going to talk a lot about this chart um, well past today. Randy. Yes. Whenever this Whenever we approved the uh, cut scores, we were told that level two was basically grade level. That's not a term that we use much, but you know that that level two was sort of on track, and level three and four were college, uh, were, were post secondary level. This is another example of what I've been talking about for the last two or three months. Other people are controlling the message and saying inaccurately that anybody that is not in level three is failing. This, first of all, what we see here is consistent with what we were told whenever we, whenever we did the cut scores. It is proof that kids below level three are successful and it re-emphasizes the point that we should not be letting others that do not have the best interest of the majority of Kansas students control the message. We need to do that, and we need to work with our partners to do that, and that's the end of my sermon. I'll sit down and shut up. <laughs> I'll, I'm just, but I will add to this, because I, I, Mr. Talma and I have this conversation a lot. That is, everything you said is correct, right? Level two. We must move kids out of level one. Like, it should be urgent for us to move kids out of level one. So I want to say both, because, because both we're trying to tell you this is what the data is telling us, and it, and, it, and it shows that if you can move kids, remember, the vast majority, over 90% of the kids in level one are in the top part of level one. So we're not, we should be able to do that. So, Melanie, you did you have a question? Yes, yeah, I can share that with you. In the bottom, it's 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 seven percent language arts, four percent uh, math in the in the bottom half. But most of the students in our state are in level one. 
And that's unacceptable. So, Jim, it's both, in my opinion. All right. Now, I, well, I mean, the, the greatest number of kids, if I say, where are the greatest number of kids? They're in the upper part of level one. We ought to move them out. But kids in level two are not failing. They're doing extremely well. All right. I know your head's swimming like, I want to spend three hours on this. Let's, let's talk. About, and it's such good data. And we're going to be talking about the annual conference next week. We'll be talking about it for a lot of time. Our researchers are adding to that data set. What's, again, so instructive, this isn't some, oh, we read a research article. <laughs> These are Kansas kids and families that we're looking at. So as you know, we're going to recognize some school districts now in eight different areas. Very quickly, because I understand I'm between you and lunch. Janet told me that five times before I got up, Randy. I, I need a break, and it's and you need to make sure you're done. All right, we're gonna we're gonna go through this, and and again tell you some very successful school districts. As you know, they have to know the rate of outcomes. Remember, Jay said, well, they don't really have a process. If you don't know your eight out, you don't know your data, you can't go hit that data, right? Interesting enough, last night, did you watch the Chiefs? And Kelsey had, what, seven receptions? Pretty good, right? But only for like, was it 20, how many yards, Mark? 25 yards. You'd say, well, that's a dud, except four of them were touchdowns. Remember how the data, right? You got to look at all the data, right? Because you could say, he didn't get many yards. Well, he got seven receptions. Well, he got four touchdowns. Yes. All that's true, right? So I have to know the outcomes. I have to have a process, a game plan for how to do it, and I have to go execute the game plan. And I have to look at the data all the time and say, what does it tell me? And then I get to measure that. We're going to tell you about the outcomes today. So you know star recognition. We honor at the copper, the bronze, the silver, and the gold levels. That's how we honor. And it's really hard because you set the bar really high to do that. The diamond, we're not even going to talk about that. Why? Because in order to get the diamond, you have to hit all eight areas at the gold level. I can't wait for that to happen someday. We're going to invite Janet back because it's going to happen, but we're not there yet, right? We're not there yet, but we'll get there. If you ever watch the Olympics, I'll ask you, how many of you have ever known an Olympian? Okay. How many? How many, Ben? How many Olympians have you known? Jim, how many Olympians? Two? How many? One. In your life? A lot of you haven't known any. It must be pretty hard. I see a lot of good Kansas athletes that never become Olympians. It's pretty hard to be an Olympian. And then it's really hard to win a medal at the Olympics, Right? It's really hard to stand on this metal stand and what I'm going to share with you today to be recognized. It's really hard. It's not a participation ribbon. So let's look at graduation. 25 school districts were between 88 and 89. 37 school districts, the bronze between 90 and 92. 32 school districts between 93 and 94. And then gold, 95% or greater. I'm just going to let you soak that in, all right? It's going to give you screens. You'll get this data. Um, and uh, right now, Barbara's going to pass it out to you on paper. You'll get these electronically. You can see big. By the way, if you want to know, Blue Valley 229, is that big or little Blue Valley? I'm going to tr – oh, we don't know. It's little Blue Valley. 229. Two, it's big. I'm sorry. 384 is Little Blue Valley, or Randolph Blue Valley, is, or Blue Valley Stillwell, which would be the large. All right. You got this memorized? <laughs> I always say that because we have another slide of 95% graduation, public, private schools. By the way, if you're, if you're Blue Valley, we're talking about the whole school district, All right? Every individual school. Is that easy? That's not easy at 95%. Same thing with the Wichita Catholic Diocese. So from Wheatland to Weskin, graduation, 95%. Now I know you're looking at that data. 
prepared for academic, academically post-secondary, highest cut scores and standards in the nation, highest cut scores and standard in the nation. 125 school districts receive copper. Here's your bronze school districts. Lutheran schools, first year, hitting that. Congratulate them. Most of those are in Topeka. There's, there's, all right, that's bronze. We have no gold. We have zero gold. Does that tell you how high we set this bar? We'll get there. How about silver? How about silver? Four eleven were second year in a row. Silver. Congratulations to them. And Haviland. Haviland is a pre-K eight school district in um, that that then sends their kids to Kiowa County in Greensburg for high school. Those are the two at the silver level. We'll hear from them um, later on this year, I'm sure. Let's look at post-secondary effective. We just talked about it. 44 school districts achieved at the copper level above 50%. 45, between 55 and 59, 63, as I mentioned, 60 to 69%. Here are the ones above 70%. These are the gold. Blue Valley. I'm not going to read them to you. You can see them. You'll see some new. How about Ingalls? Gene, that's new on there. How about Inman? Ben, new on the, on the list. And there's some new ones in there. And there's some ones that are repeating. 70 to 75%. Four years ago, that number was seven districts. In four short years, look at what's happened. You want to talk about hard? That's hard because it's after the students leave you. Commissioner's Award. These are school districts outperforming their risk, meaning they do better than we predict. This is the equalizer for equity. If you do slightly better than we predict, we're going to give you the Commissioner's Award. If you're a standard deviation, like you're really knocking out of the park, you get with distinction. And if you're two standard deviations, you're like crazy good. Like, it's, it's unbelievably good. So, we have some awards to give out. Commissioner's Award, 70 school districts achieved a 0.4 to 0.9 standard deviation above their mean, meaning here's what we were predicting, they did better. This, is, these are, this is, takes into effect poverty and, and uh, movement. 35 school districts achieved the Commissioner's Award with honor, but guess what? There's only one school district, only one this year, that received the highest award. Dina and Gene and I had the opportunity to go visit. It is Smith Center, Kansas, and they are two standard deviations above the norm, and they're the only school district in the state to achieve that, meaning they did two standard deviations better than they're predicted. This is the equalizer. This is the people say, Janet, you would say, Randy Turner and Piper aren't the same school district, and they're not. And so in this award, we measure them differently. We measure them very differently for that equity piece. By the way, we're going to honor all of these awards next week also. Individual plans of study. Here are the ones at the copper level. Here are the ones at the bronze level. It's a metal stand. These are school districts really robustly doing an individual plan of study. So, Betty, there are, there are some robustly doing this. Silver level, Baser Linwood, you had a presentation from them. DeSoto, Nemaha Central. And then there was one school district at Gold, individual plan of study. It's a repeat. It's a repeat. I means second year for Piper in Kansas City. And you heard from them last year. We may hear from them again. How are they doing as they really work with families and kids on how to do that well? Social emotional growth, copper level, really working with kids on that. Again, look at the diversity. Gary County to Baxter Springs to Prairie View, St. Francis. We were just there in St. Francis. Bronze, social emotional growth. Again, look at the diversity. Derby to Cal Valley, Smoky Valley, Turner. Silver, pretty good. Garden City, Hayes, all the way to Neota Shea, Topeka. 
and then goal, social emotional. Barnes, Hanover, Lynn. There's one. So you're seeing big school districts, small school districts, right, achieve this. And we're extremely proud of the work that they're doing. Kindergarten readiness. Coming to school ready. The bronze level. Silver level, kindergarten readiness, there are two, there are no gold in kindergarten readiness. Arc City and Beloit. So Arc City, you haven't seen, that. that's good work on their part. We'll have them come and tell you what they're doing. Civic engagement, remember Baser here talking about their, their, their work. Bronze Award Civic Engagement, Atchison County, we were talking about them earlier, Cimarron, Winfield. There are no silver, there's one gold, Southern Lyon County. Southern Lyon County, the only gold in civic engagement. They talked to you about their honor flight that they did. Now they really incorporate that. Now, there are eight areas that we're looking at. Here are school districts that hit four of the eight. Any four of the eight on the medal stand. So first time I remember this happening, well, we all are different ages. It was Mark Spitz in the 72 Olympics. Like, he was just dominating the swimming, right? I mean, and he was winning medal after medal. Think how hard it is to be on the medal stand Olympics four times. Hard in any given year. Here's four. They're on there four times. Here they are again, different ones. Four times, and this is alphabetical. That's hard. It's really hard. But you know what's even harder? To get on there five times. <laughs> Look at these school districts. Five out of the eight. By the way, I had a school district that you're going to see, actually right now, I believe, at six of the eight, Concordia. A lot of affection for them. Uh, there. Piper, Prairie Hills. You know Prairie Hills? I know where Dina knows where Prairie Hills. The rest of you know? It's the home of what more? Axtell, Sabetha, three, three communities. I actually had a superintendent email me when they, we, they, they received notification this week that they were winning these awards. And one of these that, that, that we've been talking about said, we're at X right now. Next year we'll be one above that. And in two years we will have all eight because we've written our plan. We, we already know that. How about seven areas? Our good friends over at Barnes and Hanover and Lynn, Baser, Linwood, and guess, and Topeka Seaman. Didn't see them last year either. Congratulations to them. And then there's one in all eight. They're not gold yet. They're not a diamond yet. Southern Lyon County. And by the way, this morning, the superintendent of Southern Lyon County was named the Kansas Superintendent of the Year. Deservingly so. So I know I'm running out of time, actually over time. Can I, can I finish here, Betty, and then I'll answer your question. Go congratulate these. You have these on paper. You'll get this electronically. We're going to celebrate them next week at our conference. This is hard work. It's dedication to students. It's dedication to families. So what should we be doing right now? How do we wrap this up? As I mentioned, we have to lower chronic absenteeism immediately. We need to get that below 5%. We've got to get kids in school. We have to get kids in school. And if you're at 50%, we really have to lower that. How's that? You've got to get families and kids, and you've got to work together, and we've got to lower that. I'm, I'm confident that we will this year. We must move kids academically out of level one. These are, ought to be top priorities in the early grades. We need to help students with self-regulation skills. Why? These are the three things. This is Randy, call to action. Why self-regulation? Let me share with you Amy and Patty's work. Dr. Doctors Garmer Erickson and Noonan that work with us on the, on the wheel. 
Perseverance, remember, Kansan said that's number one. You can't get to perseverance unless, unless you self-regulate first, and then you motivate. They, they build on one another. Early on, you have to learn to self-regulate. That's behavior. We'll talk about this. In middle school, call to action. Again, lower chronic absenteeism. By the way, it gets worse in middle school from elementary, and it's not good in elementary. It gets worse. Academically, scores go down in the middle grades from elementary. Must move students. We have to help students develop the perseverance skills, so now we're building on those skills. Or they, you know, Michelle was talking about military families. They are very resilient. Right? They learn that skill. Some of our kids don't learn that very well at home, and they, learn, they need to learn that. And we must lay, raise the level of rigor academically and in and, and those Kansas can competencies and have high expectations for all students. Finally, high school, there's our self-regulation chart again, motivation. You'll see chronic absenteeism, move students out of level one. We have to have a robust IPS where we're talking with families face-to-face. -face. If there's one thing we're not there yet, and it's Zello does not tell me what I want to be. It starts to give me some career interest that I need to have a conversation, right, Michelle? I need to have a conversation with my students. That's why I had the lovely opportunity with someone's daughter to be able to do, was have a conversation with the family there. That's, that's the missing link that's, that's what Piper's doing. Does that, does that make sense? That's the missing link, though, to take that. And again, raise the level of rigor and high expectations. I'll give you one example. I'm a big fan of advanced placement. It's really rigorous. And there's a, there's a couple of courses in there that are not subject specific. They're called AP Seminar and AC, AP Research. And they teach kids how to look at data and analyze. It's kind of like what debate and forensics do in some ways. Great course. It can be substituted for an English two credit and they can get college. Anyway, schools ought to do it because small schools can do it. They train you. You don't have to. It's great. That's just one example. And I'm not, you know how, how we have to get the IPS. And that's a lot of information in one setting. I encourage you next week to be at the state conference. We're going to honor these people. That chart, we're going to talk a lot about it. We're going to issue those challenges. We're going to talk about what the data is telling us and what it isn't telling us. And Ann and Betty had questions, so I'll start with Thank Ann. you. Um, thank you for all this. It's, it's uh, really intriguing. I got, I'll just throw these out because we don't have time to talk about them, the questions that I have, and maybe we can talk about them another time, but I don't think we want to wait past the end of the year. Um, one is graduation levels going up, but academics are not. So that begs the question of can we disaggregate post-secondary success to see if those free and reduced lunch kids are actually going on or they're just pushing them out the door. Um, and another, the answer is yes, we can do that. Okay. Another one is I see we need to move kids out of one. What are we telling districts they have to do to make that happen? Okay. So I will say this. We ought to be teaching our core instruction at level three. Core instruction ought to be at level – that's the expectation. Most of our core instruction is happening at level two. Not These, enough rigor then. Not enough rigor. Got it. Okay. Then we've got to be uh, – We've got to have an intensity about helping kids, especially in the early grades, Ann, mm -hmm. get those skills. Okay. Um, we just do. The, the last one is um, I just want to make sure that the criteria for the Star Awards are things they would have to do anyway for KISA. Because I've had people say, do you want me to get a Star Award or do you want me to pass KISA? And, like, they don't line up. So Ask we, that question wrong. Yeah, we'll talk about that I think you'll be happy with tomorrow. the answer. Okay. <laughs> Betty. I was wondering, um, and again, thank you, um, Brandy, because you keep us on, on target with where we're trying to go, getting this kind of information. But I'm wondering if um, I can get uh, something that will show, narrow it down just on the urban school districts. My reason being, um, when we look at those subgroups that represent 
the challenge and the chronic absenteeism and all of those uh, economic factors, I make the assumption that urban districts would um, probably have the highest representation of those subgroups. Um, and I am wondering if we could just get, I could just get some information that would show um, the level of achievement just only in those urban districts that are affected. Absolutely. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. There's a lot of stomachs growling right now, and I understand. We're fine, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. There's a lot of information there. We will reconvene at 1.30.
We are called back to order. Our first item of business after lunch will be an update on the teacher vacancy and supply committee and highlights of the annual licensed personnel report. As I told Shane, that uh, the only expectation we have is at the end of his presentation, there will no longer be a teacher shortage in Kansas. <laughs> so I wanted to set the bar at that level. I wish that were the case, Mr. Chairman. But uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, uh, Commissioner Watson. So today I'm going to cover uh, our vacancy report information. It'll cover a few years, or last year, spring or fall 2021, spring 2022 and uh, the fall of 2022's data. Uh, we'll also give you the annual report for the licensed personnel data for the 2021-2022 uh, school year. And then at the end of the report, um, we'll give you, uh, update you on recommendations from the Professional Standards Board and Teacher Vacancy and Supply Committee. Yes, sir. Let me uh, just interrupt to say that I now, my handheld thing is uh, working so you can, or, so if you have questions, if you'll use, if you'll use that, yeah. You don't have permission to speak. <laughs> you, you, you do. All right, so we'll go ahead and get into the vacancy data. So the data that you're going to review, uh, uh, like I can, we have a quick rundown. It's going to cover information you saw this time last year from fall 2021. Then the spring information you received in April, uh, where you can compare the fall 2021 data and the spring 2022 data. And then you will also see this school year's uh, information that was collected. Uh, officially on uh, September 27th. Uh, before we get into the actual data, I'll first provide you definitions for uh, the vacancy. Uh, so any position that's not filled is considered a vacancy. Uh, also, any position that's filled by a person that's not licensed appropriately, for instance, if you have an individual that's licensed English language arts, teaching math, that would be reported as a vacancy. Uh, this is also the same case for an individual that holds a substitute license uh, that's filling a long-term position for which a contracted teacher, they're not filling in for a contracted teacher, this would also be classified as a vacancy. Uh, individuals that have an expired license or never licensed, uh, they would also be uh, considered vacancies. Positions that aren't considered vacancies. So if you look at, um, you know, on your consent agenda every month, you've uh, approve waivers for school districts. So an individual in which a district has a, applied for a waiver, it's not considered a vacancy. Individuals that, who move off the waiver and then achieve that provisional license uh, for a particular area, that's not considered a vacancy, nor any participant in our non-traditional uh, routes to the classroom, which consist of the restricted teaching license, the teacher apprenticeship program through Wichita State, the limited apprentice license program, or the limited elementary apprentice program, or LEAP. So this is uh, the vacancy data. So starting in the left column, our assignment vacancy top five has been consistent over the last few years. Uh, our number one and number two have remained the same. Uh, special education uh, continues to be the largest area of need, uh, followed by uh, elementary classroom teachers. When we move down to English language arts, mathematics and, si mathematics and science, they're all, they've, they've always been in the top five. However, they've kind of jockeyed for a position who was number three, four, or five. So there has been slight changes, but the top five has remained consistent. So this time last year, uh, school districts reported 1,253 vacancies. And then later in the spring, when we collected the same information, of those 1,253 vacancies, 228 were filled. However, we ended up with uh, an additional 1,381 uh, new vacancies. So moving forward into fall 2022, uh, special education continued to lead the way with uh, the highest number of vacancies uh, with a pretty significant increase as well as elementary. English language arts did go down uh, a, a small amount as did mathematics and then science had a slight increase. But at the end of the day, we're still sitting at around 1,628 vacancies. And then just to put that in perspective, if you wanted to compare it to a previous year, uh, back in school year 2013-2014, we roughly had 44,000 educators. Uh, we're close to that number uh, currently today. However, uh, we're still short at about 1,628 educators. Yes, sir. Even though the special education vacancy is alarming, mm -hmm. it doesn't count seven or 800 waivers. So the actual people that are in the classroom that are not fully licensed for special education is probably above a thousand. That, 
Potentially, yes. So also our limited apprentice license programs and the TAP program has a special education component to it as well. So those numbers could potentially be included in that as well okay. to get that whole picture. Yeah, I just, when people see that, they well, 385 is bad, but not real bad. When you add another seven or 800, it's real bad. So, yes, Betty. Um, I understand that that uh, this is a national dilemma. So do our categories align nationally with where the shortage is, or do you know? Well, at least for the special education and the elementary and the science, yes. Uh, okay. Those uh, pretty much across the board uh, nationally are the highest level, highest areas of, um, of vacancies. Are you aware of any kind of um, federal or national incentive that's uh, addressing this, or is it each state for themselves? It, well, it's it's not necessarily, well, at the end of the day, yes, it is each state for themselves, what they want to adopt or what they want to move forward, but there are some national programs that are out there. For instance, uh, we'll speak about an apprenticeship program a, a little later. That's a federal program, uh, which uh, there's potential that we could increase uh, the number of licensed teachers through this particular program in which the federal government awards additional money uh, for individuals to complete teacher preparation programs as long as certain requirements are met. So uh, that's one area that's out there to look into. And one final question, mm -hmm. um, because I understand that, and I'm not sure what it's called, but um, the teachers that are actually uh, licensed versus those that are actually in the field, that there was a, a greater number of licensed people that are not actually working. What what accounts for that, or do we know? Well, uh, there, there is, you know, for the state, we in licensure, we don't collect a specific uh, recruitment retention survey that addresses that, but there has been some work in that area, uh, but that's not through our office. But if we want to talk about licensed uh, personnel uh, comparison, we, we basically, we roughly have 44,000 educators in Kansas. Uh, as far as our licensing area, we have 50, 50 almost 51,000 professional licensees in Kansas, and then another uh, right under 6,000 that have initial licenses. So right there from a population standpoint, that's 56,000 individuals that hold a license for whatever reason. They, you know, maybe they actually don't live in Kansas, but they want to maintain their license, they're here, or it, you know, most likely a large percentage are individual, individuals that have left the field for for whatever reason that is. Well, let, I, I, I'll listen to my own admonition and I, we'll wait, let, let you finish your presentation and then we'll ask questions. But Betty, one of those 56,000 people is me and I'm not looking for a job. <laughs> and I, uh, Pending any additional questions? Okay. All right, so this is the breakdown of those top five vacancies by your board district, and this is the 2022 board district that's listed, not the 2023. And uh, consistent uh, board district number five has consistently had that higher number of vacancies. Pending your questions. All right, so for our vacancy reasons, uh, we'll start with the no applicant. So this is the, the most concerning, or what I would consider the most concerning uh, because there's not an individual there. There's no applicant, there's not a body, there's not someone that may have training that we can work to get them in some type of program to get certified. Uh, so that has continued to rise, uh, as has the reason directly below it that's our not fully qualified. So the good news is there is an individual there, so we can work with them through some type of program to get them certified appropriately, and uh, then that vacancy would potentially go away. Uh, the rest uh, of the vacancies that are listed on here, I kind of, I guess, self-inflicted would be the best uh, way to classify them. So, uh, for instance, the preferred non-qualified uh, person interviewed, the district chose not to select them. The budget um, basically uh, canceled a position because they couldn't afford to, to keep it, I suppose, or a qualified applicant refusing an offer, an individual, uh, was gonna be hired, but decided they didn't wanna take the job with that district, and then personnel moves within the district. Uh, perhaps you had an elementary teacher that would fill a vacancy, but you found they were better served to teach math at the middle level, so you made that decision and, and moved them around to fill some other position. Uh, you may have had an individual that was qualified, uh, has a license, however, based on their professional attributes, something in their background, interview, you decided not to hire them. 
And then for this, uh, Pat, for this school year, uh, COVID, very few have been reported, but this has been, this was zero for this year. Pending your questions. So now we'll go ahead and transition into the licensed personnel report data. Uh, so the, inf the information that we're going to cover for the 2021-2022 school year uh, includes entrance and exit data, uh, demographic data, school retention rates of third-year teachers, alternative pathway licensure programs, and then overall licensure data for individuals that have applied for licenses. So what do we know uh, in this comparison of um, the school year? It should actually be uh, school year 2020-2021 to school year 21-2022 but we did have a decrease in stability uh, for the previous couple of years. Our, we had remained stable around that 89% uh, range, 89.5, but that did drop uh, by about 2%. So directly below it, we have movement. So educators were moving from one district to another, um, which obviously affects that stability. Uh, for our new grads, we pretty much stayed exactly the same as uh, what, we've, what we've had the last few years, um, very little change. Our individuals from other field, fields has increased. So if you look at the different options that we offer for those non-traditional routes to the classroom, uh, targeting those non-traditional students, uh, that would be a direct result of that. So your restricted teaching, your uh, LEAP, uh, limited apprentice license, and TAP, TAP license. As far as our exporting, uh, our exporting numbers did go up. However, we imported more over the last year as well. So even though we lost folks out of state, we did bring in more than we lost. And in your questions. All right, uh, so we start looking at, at additional exit data and uh, kind of this will feed into why we have some of these vacancies. So one, retirement uh, over the last couple of years, it has increased. That should be school year 2019-2020, uh, school year 2020, 2021, and 2122, but we have an increase. Uh, over the past year, uh, the left of profession, this was one that's uh, continued to grow and not included in part of this number is there is an, um, a selection for move from area, unemployment, unknown, and that, were, that was around 370 individuals. So you add that in together, that's like another 1,100 that potentially could have left the profession. Our health numbers, uh, uh, nothing real significant, nor with COVID, uh, our deceased uh, individuals did increase slightly in your questions. All right, so our uh, demographics, our larger, largest group of educators continue to be uh, five to nine years of experience, and that has uh, been true over the last three years. If we move down to that mean years of experience, we did have a change, so that's down to 13. Uh, so the 13 is the current, the 2021, 2022 school year and the 14 in parentheses is the previous year. So as we go on down, if it's in parentheses, it's the previous year's information. Our average age of teachers basically stayed the same. Our average age of educators dropped slightly. And the difference between teachers and educators, the educator group includes leadership and school specialists. For our salary, our first year teachers, it did increase, uh, a, a pretty significant increase, as did our average salary for teachers across the board. Pending your questions? It does. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, this is one of our most significant pieces of data, I, I would say. So our retention rate had been steadily climbing back in 2017 uh, as part of the Teacher Vacancy Supply Committee. There was a rec recommendation to have two years of mentoring uh, for an individual uh, to upgrade to that professional license. So we had we'd been tracking with um, our retention rate rising. However, this past school year uh, that dropped. Uh, and obviously I think we could point to the fact that COVID has affected that somehow between teacher burnout and uh, individuals challenged with difficult circumstances as part of the pandemic. Um, but that is a pretty significant drop. Been in your questions. Admonition. Okay. Is there any way to know how many, if any of that decrease is related to the fact that teachers there's an increasing number of people that say things that are disrespectful, leadership in some areas that say things that are disrespectful. And at some point you just give up. Is there any way to track that? 
unfortunately not at, at our level, we're not able to collect that particular piece of information. Now, I think possibly at a district level, they would have exit surveys uh, for employees that left where that could be tracked. Okay, Ann. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we're supposed to have two-year mentoring, but the legislature doesn't actually pay for two years, does it? Um, as far as you're talking about the stipend reimbursement mm -hmm. program, yeah. So it, they will actually authorize stipend reimbursement uh, up to three years. Um, and typically how we have to pay that out is individuals that uh, serve a, a mentee in their first year, those take precedent over second year or third year. We're always limited to the amount of funds that we can pay out, which uh -huh. is always set at like 1.3 million. Mm -hmm. So as far as who gets paid, it kind of depends on when we run out of money. Um, so between how much that first have we been able to pay for? Oh, it, it, every year we exhaust the the 1.3 million. So roughly, as it's, it ends up being around 1,800 or so, mentors get paid something. Uh -huh. uh, as far as like the full thousand dollar stipend for that first year mentee, it would be, uh, I believe our numbers are around 1,100, 1,100 for for individuals that qualify for that. So in some cases, we have paid for the second year mentoring. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And this past year was the first year we actually had enough money left over to pay some for the third year mentors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Betty. I'm kind of wondering um, when we look at that significant decrease, mm -hmm. was this a trend that was in the makings that just happened to coincide with COVID. And that's based on, if we look at um, um, colleges graduating students in the field of education, is there a correlation to that decrease? Or is well, it just those graduating and maybe going on to different professions? Yeah, so uh, I did take a look at our, our numbers of, of programs that from last year projected and uh, the previous year, and our numbers are been pretty consistent. So I, I don't think it's necessarily that. I think, you know, this particular set of data, I think the, the impact of COVID is really what okay. reduced it. Okay, I was curious about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. All right, for our, our alternative pathways to licensure, so for the 2022 school year for our restricted teaching license, and just a reminder, that's for individuals teaching in a secondary area. They have a content degree in a particular area like business, physical education, whatever the whatever that secondary content area is. They enroll in a program, and um, basically while they finish their pedagogy, they're teaching. So it's been a pretty popular program, and our numbers are right around 400, and uh, since 2019, they've approached that 400 uh, mark. Uh, the limited apprentice license, uh, the teacher apprenticeship program, and then the LEAP, which is a, a new program, limited elementary apprenticeship program that K-State offers. Uh, so all of these are part of that alternative non-traditional pathway that uh, we're trying to get those non-traditional students into the classroom. Uh, so for that limited apprentice, which is geared towards uh, high incidence special education, and it requires an individual to have a year of para special education experience, uh, have a bachelor's degree, they enroll in the program, so a pathway for parents to become teachers, basically. Uh, we had 244 individuals participate in that program. Uh, the, te the, the teacher apprenticeship program through WSU, it's geared to capture elementary K-6 to educators and also early childhood unified. And with that ch uh, unified endorsement, uh, those individuals can teach general content uh, grades birth to three and also provide special education services birth to grades three. Uh, we had 145 uh, participants and then the LEAP program which was just approved over the summer. Uh, we have our first uh, licensing school year for, for that and 31 members have uh, been licensed and but that number we expect that to grow over the next semester significantly. Depending on your questions. Shane, this yes. is very unfair. Okay. I apologize because nope. you and I would have these conversations. I'm trying to maybe figure out as I go out and talk to teachers, and I and there seems to be in some schools kind of a split between I was traditionally trained and you weren't. Uh, I'm generalizing. Yeah. So as we look at those numbers, let's just use restricted license of 398. At some point, I move off the restricted license into a full license, right? Two Correct. years or whatever that Typically, process is. Two years. Yep. So 
that's also true of the limited apprenticeship and the tap and the leap, correct? That is correct. So are those numbers on the currently valid, those are all in either year one or year two because aren't all those a two-year program? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So my question then is, do we have a number that says here are traditionally trained teachers coming out in their first couple years and what percent is this relative to the traditionally trained, if that makes sense? And again, that's a really unfair question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because maybe in 14, that, that number was significantly less. Yeah. Almost everyone is that number now 6%, 2%, 10%. Yeah, so... You know, right now taking you know numbers over the last couple of years, we're probably looking at about eighteen traditionally eighteen hundred traditionally trained students. Uh, now that's not that includes all areas. So some of these restricted programs they may may not be rolled up in some of these specific programs that are out there. So you're looking at eighteen hundred traditionally trained versus uh, making me do math on the spot. That's never good for me. Yeah, so about a, four uh, about four hundred fifty or no eight hundred yeah eight hundred or so. So you know. Roughly, we will say about 50% of uh, individuals trained through a restricted or non, non-traditional program versus the traditional. But uh, to be more exact, I would have to yeah. run some additional data, which I'd be more than happy to do. I apologize for you. Yep. No, no issues. Mr. Porter? Do we have data on teachers leaving uh, that, that is dis uh, aggregated as urban, suburban, and rural? Uh, we have a breakdown by district, so, um, but, but, but not by specifically those categories, but we could pro potentially fit that into um, a breakdown of those categories. So okay. yes, we could get that data for you. And uh, do we have data on who's successfully using the alternative pathways? We talk about for uh, school school Future. districts or for the universities. Uh, school districts and universities. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we can we can pull a number of individuals um, that participate in a specific university's program and then also pull out connect them to a district. So we can get that information for you. Okay. Yep. Well, we'd like to encourage those that are doing well and use those strategies in other locations. Yep. And also, I, I I'm just curious. As I visit districts, mm -hmm. the smaller districts are having different challenges than the larger districts, but they have the same numbers, vacancies. Yeah. You know, and, and the strategies and the responses that we should have to support them may need to be different. I don't know. Yeah. No, that's uh, no, that's a that's a fair statement as far as you know. Some of each district, when we start looking at vacancy information, it's it is a little different in what that. Smaller district may need may be somewhat different than what a one of our larger districts would need. So, and I'm interested too. And in, and when you look at the small rural districts, okay. with distance issues as well, um, how you think about district learning, uh, uh, um, not district, uh, internet and, and and technology. You know who's using because I've been in, in visited districts, and there may be four kids in one district sitting at a table and each one's online and each one's in a different class, you know, for a, from a different institution. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, our, our districts have been very, many of them have been very um, innovative in how they're approaching these um, challenges of having uh, licensed teachers in front of a student. Do we have any data on how they're using those things or any collecting any data? Um, if we're, if we're talking about the uh, pre-K to 12 students, I, I wouldn't have that well, data, yes. but I can, like most of our non-traditional programs, school. Yeah, so the, the non-traditional programs, most of those are all delivered uh, online or a majority of the instructions delivered online for, uh, for those individuals participating in the, participating in the program. Uh, one of the issues for um, school districts on, our, on the western side of the state is there's not really a a physical footprint of uh, a university that's out there. Some uh, universities have tried to establish that and have an actual physical uh, institution on ground, but for the most part, uh, these programs are delivered online. So that allows those individuals that live on the western uh, part of the state to participate in those programs and that district to participate. But I don't know if I answered your question. I think you may have been, I think you may have been geared more towards the pre-K to 12 students' uh, data. Yes. Okay, yeah. So I. I don't think I would have that. I'd have to check with uh, one of our other team members to see if they collect that information. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm <clears throat> thinking in South Central Kansas, I've seen uh, we're running buses, we're uh, allowing transportation, uh, we're sharing, districts are sharing uh, uh, certain licensed teachers, teachers. They're doing a lot of innovative th um, uh, strategies to respond to the uh, issues we're dealing with here. Okay. I don't know if we're capturing all of that or how we, or if we're supporting them as, as well as we could. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. All right, so for our licensure numbers uh, over this last year, we processed 25,166 applications. Now that doesn't mean 25,000 new licensed individuals, people added endorsements, upgrade licenses, but purely from an application standpoint, that's what we processed. Uh, we also have a breakdown of Kansas graduates and new out-of-state teachers uh, over the last nine years. Uh, and this is uh, just for, for teacher information. So in 2022, we had, uh, 1,773 individuals apply for that first license after completing a program in Kansas, and our out-of-state uh, individuals that applied for a license did go, did uh, increase slightly to 944. Any pending any questions? No. Okay. All right, so we'll move into the next part. Uh, so back in June, uh, teacher licensure in coordination with the Professional Standards Board and Teacher Vacancy Supply Committee were to take a look at substitute shortages and to make recommendations uh, to address uh, those issues. Um, and today I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you the update, but I also have uh, Mr. Michael Reed, who's a technology teacher with USD 361 and is a member of our Professional Standards Board here as well. And this is a breakdown of our working group members. Um, here you can see what particular entity they belong to and then if, if they were a teacher, administrator, higher ed um, representative or uh, KNEA &E representative. All right, so what we're gonna discuss are our, our initiatives for consideration and what those are, are number one, what I call the third option, which is currently called the expanded emergency substitute license. Um, basically think of the training modules uh, route, you complete the training modules uh, versus the 60 college credit hours and the, uh, or having a bachelor's degree to qualify for that subst emergency substitute license. We'll also discuss the substitute handbook guidelines uh, being set up for uh, each LEA, uh, expanding the emergency substitute license to be valid for two school years, and then discuss a legacy license that to be established for retired educators. So based on the recommendations of the group, one of the first recommendations um, that, that we wanted to make was extending uh, the, the current expanded emergency substitute license throughout the entire 2022-2023 school year. As far as our numbers for individuals that currently hold that license, we're sitting at about 210. Um, 379 individuals have uh, completed the Greenbush module training. Uh, some individuals, their applications are pending fi uh, a fingerprint background check and then those will be issued. So I would expect our numbers to be somewhere around 300 uh, qualifying for that license uh, once that background check is through. But uh, one of the limitations of this license now, it was a four month license, which if we compare that to our COVID, uh, our teal license that was set up last January when the price was free, we had about 914 people apply and qualify for the license. So I think, you know, having to pay in that limited amount of time that that license was valid has impacted uh, the success of that program. Pending any questions? No. Yes, ma'am. There seemed to be a lot of pushback from teacher organizations about extending it at all. Why did they want to go through another school year? Why couldn't we just end it at the end of the 22 school year? Well, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I, I was... Well, a lot of the teacher organizations did not want this to continue at all. And we said, December's it. So I'm kind of surprised they wanted to take it on for another year and a half rather than just end it spring of 2022. Yeah, so actually when we get to the next slide, what we're trying to do is recommend it as a permanent option. And we tried to be inclusive and in including teachers and uh, other teacher organizations in this uh, planning space uh, to make these recommendations. So, uh, you know, me personally, I feel that, 
you know, we have that view in there and uh, the field is supportive of it. Well, it says through 23. That would be yeah. a well, yes. I mean, but starting. So that's the. Okay, I guess it is 23, isn't it? Yeah. God, it's sneaking up on me. Yeah. But they've. Got, but um, if they already have it, then they can continue through the spring, no additional charge. Correct. Okay, thanks. Yep. So it would be extended. And then the reason this was brought up this way is because on the next slide, this is where it's making it permanent. And I didn't feel that we could make it permanent or make that recommendation without, or we felt that we could make it permanent without extending what we currently have. Yeah, so for this third option, uh, which the requirements would be the high school diploma uh, completion of the Greenbush substitute training modules. And as we go through and look at those modules, there is a change to what has been um, required or recommended be changed in the future. So every um, listing of a module that has an asterisk next to it, that would be a new um, training module that would be under development and created uh, for individuals to qualify for this particular license in the future. So uh, it was focus, focused on special education strategies, uh, cultural competencies for our, our ESOL students, some de-escalation techniques, and then uh, and an additional confidentiality and ethics training for those individuals. And then continuing on with those requirements, of course, there would be the background check, application, and fee. And then as far as this particular license, it would have the same limitations as an emergency substitute uh, for an individual that has 60 college credit hours, which is limited to that 15 days in the same assignment and no more than 60 days during the semester. Continue your questions, yes ma'am. Why did they want to limit, so if I was a substitute teacher, I couldn't do it more than 60 days in any job? Right. So I, for, for I know that. there was at least one district that said, if you will come on as a full-time sub, I mean, be here every day, we'll pay you 225 bucks a day. So would they have to stop that? Yeah, so right now, uh, the couple of things that the state board implemented, one was waiving the limitation to number of days for individuals that have a right. standard substitute license and um, uh, emergency substitute with a bachelor's degree. So there is a process where a district could apply for a waiver uh, since um, the goal of this was to get away from some of these temporary extensions and um, things that we've done over the last couple of years. We could potentially follow the same waiver process that has been established for years for individuals that if, if a district needed that individual to serve for additional days outside of that scope, uh, they could apply for and be approved individually. Well, I agree they shouldn't be able to be a long-term sub, but I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why if somebody wanted to do subbing as a job, we wouldn't let them just come in every day and do some different job. Yeah. Well, it's part of our regulation for the uh, emergency substitute license oh, right now for, with, for the 60 college, yes, for the 60 college credit hours. That's the exact limitation that's on that license. Well, if that's the case, I wonder how that one district is offering a full-time job. Yes, yeah, so we go through the district to, to us and through the P for the board to approve on the consent agenda. Pending any questions, okay. So uh, the next thing we wanted to take a look at is we um, reviewed different substitute teaching policies that districts had created. Some districts have handbooks, some private schools have handbooks, some do not. Uh, but looking at this, if we're looking at changing um, who's allowed to, to substitute, we wanna make sure that they have some type of support that's um, that's there and available for them as uh, districts hire employees and bring them in. So as part of this guideline or handbook that we're looking to create, you know, each district would provide some type of district orientation. This could consist of their mission statement, uh, their vision statement, uh, a breakdown of their, their students, a breakdown of their district as a whole uh, from a, a demographic uh, look or just kind of what that particular district values. It would have the structured employment information, you know, everything from how to fill out an application, et cetera, how to get paid, uh, but also detail those duties and responsibilities that substitute teacher would be required to, to have. And then if there was specific district training that individual needed to complete, they would know up front and be aware of it. Uh, 
and then build a space, some type of uh, way for those substitute teachers to collaborate with full-time staff. That way it's not just a revolving door of individuals coming in, serving in a, a particular classroom, you know, once a week, but de develop some space so that they have that opportunity to collaborate and work with um, those students. And then also um, detailed emergency protocols and procedures from everything uh, from school lockdown, uh, different policies that they may have for um, alcohol, drug abuse, et cetera, and then uh, a list of lining out those mandatory reporting requirements that each district has to make sure that um, those substitute teachers are aware of when they actually have to make in and make a report. Then our, uh, the next recommendation was to go ahead and extend all sub emergency substitute licenses to two school years instead of uh, the current uh, breakout in which it's one school year for the first one and then every renewal after that is two. Uh, this will help reduce uh, confusion in the field and it will also remove additional costs for substitute teachers. And the final um, recommendation that we made was the creation of a leg or the group made was a creation of a legacy license for retired educators uh, so at the end of determining not only the name but the, the period there's a lot of discussion about it but 20 years is uh, the number that was was settled on and uh, so this particular license would allow an individual who retired uh, to serve as a, either a substitute teacher or a full-time teacher in that particular area for which they were changed or trained. So this would reduce financial burdens on those retired educators. For instance, uh, a couple months ago, I had um, an educator, uh, she was 83 years old, came in, just completed her three hours of college credit through K-State to renew her professional license uh, and paid for that and then paid to renew that license. And she had you know, consistently done that since she'd been retired for uh, numerous years. So at the end of the day, helps eliminate costs for renewal credits for those retirees and can be thought of as a way to entice them to come back into the, into the profession. So as far as the requirements, it would be a verified retirement from uh, a state retirement agency or from a state accredited private school. So based on our recommendation in June, it was for CAPERS only. Uh, so it did, we do have individuals that are retiring through, you know, the diocese or other private schools that we, you know, would like to include in this conversation as well. Uh, these individuals have to remain enrolled in a RAP, which is for background checks, so that will affect the price, and then they would actually have to have the application and fee to qualify. Um, Additional initiatives that we're working on uh, in the teacher licensure department, uh, the recruitment retention, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, we're talking about apprenticeship. Uh, so the federal program, if we're gonna start one of those, of those types of programs in Kansas, uh, it is an opportunity, uh, a space for us to potentially uh, bring more uh, individuals into the field. Uh, we're also having uh, a group look at leadership in Kansas at the district level, building letter level, and to include recruitment, retention, ways to, um, to keep those uh, teachers in the classroom. Also looking at classroom redesign as far as, you know, everything from professional development to, you know, how we structure our schools, how we, how we deliver instruction, uh, a communication plan for the, the agency in the field as a whole, and then also relooking our testing uh, requirements as well. So all that work is uh, going on in small groups. Uh, it'll eventually get filtered in through the professional standards board and then depending on what recommendation the professional standards board makes, it would come to the board for review. Pending your questions, that's all I have. Go ahead, Betty. This is um, really kind of uh, an unpleasant thing to approach, and I'm not sure it falls within your area, um, but as we talk about substitute teachers, I know of, of um, so many situations where all of this is such a negative area. Um, we have many substitutes, uh, I understand, that oftentimes will just leave because they don't have the control of the class. Um, the perspective of students toward substitute teachers is 
real. I mean, it, it, this is not a perfect situation that we have uh, where we get qualified candidates to come in and we are moving learning forward. What ends up happening in classrooms is with substitute teachers, it's very, uh, in many cases, disruptive. Um, students are um, non-cooperative, and I have heard of instances where the substitute teachers pretty much say, I'm just here to babysit. My purpose or my goal is to make sure that learning is occurring. And although this is probably the best solution, um, I have some concerns. Uh, and, and my concerns are focused on are we moving students forward? I know of situations where this late in the year there are still um, classes that don't have a permanent substitute teacher. And we talk about uh, how important stability is in the learning process. Um, and we look at a situation where it's nothing but instability, where you may have a substitute for a day or two days. When do we have that real discussion on what impact this is having um, on the students? I mean, I know sometimes you have to build a plane while you're flying it, but what's the loss? What, you know? It's not a perfect uh, thing to bring up, but it does really concern me, and I don't know if you are able to address that or if that's something that we should be talking about as well. But the environment that this has created just doesn't seem ideal right now. Yeah, yeah. so as, as far as that, the, the training that we tried to create uh, through these modules, it, it was intentional for you know, specific strategies, pedagogical training that would assist those substitute teachers to have tools to where they're not just command and control managing that classroom, but trying to deliver effective instruction and trying to build those skills, which it's it's gonna take time to do that. That's, you know, you, you take the modules, it's still gonna take time for them to build those skills, but that's that's part of it. And then also building, uh, you know, the guidelines for the the, the school district of having some type of support for that individual as they're going through this process and collaborating with other teachers that's the only way that you know we saw that, that that we could potentially get after that learning loss but at the end of the day we're still there's always going to be a situation for a substitute teacher and it's how do we want to prepare them or ensure they're set up for success at the end of the day and and i understand that what i'm saying i mean we have this pedagogy in place and it sounds good that's the ideal world. Yeah. The real world um, is what's happening in those classrooms. Uh, I don't know if having this pedagogy uh, helps substitute teachers take control of the learning process. Um, I don't know how much monitoring we have in place. I don't know if there is enough monitoring that um, students are actually learning. So in a sense, we are babysitting a classroom where learning is not happening, and that's the sole purpose of education. That's not a great topic that we like to talk about. I mean, oftentimes I feel we focus on the ideal and we ignore the elephant in the room, which is the real world and what's actually happening. And I, I don't know if this is the opportune time to have a look at what is this impact having, this significant, this significant um, shortage on learning. And it has to have uh, it has to have an impact. There are some areas 
um, where it's just not working and I don't know what's the backup plan. I don't know the solution. And I'm not trying to suggest that I have an answer. It's just that being aware a problem does exist and what kinds of things can we really put in place to prop or support the idea of having substitutes. Yeah. yeah, earlier on we talked about the, before you got here, we talked about the impact of chronic absenteeism. Yeah. Chronically not having the right person in the classroom, I would assume would have some of the same reactions. So I think it'd be, I, I think, you know, we. I don't know how you deal with that. I have the same frustration that you do, Betty, but you know, having the wrong person in the classroom has got to also have a negative impact on learning. Uh, are you? Well, I know, Ann has a question. I, yeah, Ann's next. The classroom redesign, this is, this is Randy, I think we have to take a look at. From a mentor standpoint, from a teacher shortage standpoint, from a, again, you've heard me say, I can be next to the Kansas Teacher of the Year, next door to the Kansas Teacher of the Year, who's going to be my mentor. I'm a first year teacher. But when eight o'clock happens, the Teacher of the Year goes and teaches her class. I go teach in my class, and at three o'clock, we get to see each other and have a conversation. If I could watch her teach and be a part of that, I, I, I think I could cut substitutes down. I mean, I think if we look at that, it's a huge lift because you're talking about changing a, a dramatic structure, but we're in an isolated profession, I think, that, that leads to turnover, and I think you could help on the substitute. But I think to watch what they talk about with classroom redesign and maybe see some things may have some promise, may, uh, in the future. And to follow up on what Randy said, you know, if you had those same two people, and one of them is a coach or a sponsor, you don't even see each other at 3 o'clock. So, you know, we have to do a better job of, of quality mentoring. Ann. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's something I'd like you guys to add to your list of things you're looking at, like it's not long enough, but okay. it's um, the transition to teaching program. Yes, ma'am. And I'd, I'd be interested to know um, what the retention rate is on that. Okay. Only because if you walk in the, the door the first day and that's the first day you've ever seen kids, that's a very long day, particularly if you don't know what curriculum is. And I mean, I've just known too many of them who walked in the door the first day and, and totally unprepared or maybe didn't even have a curriculum in, in some districts. But I'm wondering if that program shouldn't be changed to require that maybe the first semester they're not alone but it just depends. I mean, maybe it's totally fantastically successful and they all survive those first two years and, you know, sign up again. But my guess is that isn't what happens unless they're really, really tough. But, but to follow up on what Betty and Randy were saying, uh, Ben and I sub sometimes and, and I can pretty much tell you whether sometimes. he's some, sometimes, he's more than sometimes. I'm just rarely sometimes. But, whether or not learning takes place really depends on what the teacher left you to do. I mean, there isn't a sub out there that knows every topic, and 60 hours certainly doesn't prepare you for anything, really. I mean, we talk like that was the gold standard. It just means you went to school longer than some other people. It doesn't mean you're an expert in anything. I think the only class I really taught anything in was chemistry, because <laughs> that's what I taught, or English, because I'm pretty good at that. But you know, if the teacher didn't leave you anything or, um, you know, if you got lucky and it was one of those classes that was up online so kids could work through it themselves and you could kind of help them out. But um, whether or not learning takes place is something we probably ought to have a discussion about. But I think it's more up to what you were left than who you are. But I, I do like the... I, the modules where you talk about class control, because that's tough. If you have never been in a classroom, <laughs> you're really learning it on the fly. So thank you. Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. I think what we heard um, from time and time again from teachers were that we had all those programs with literacy, 
back when we were talking about literacy and um, adopting different programs. They had so many different things to offer. We kept hearing the practice. We need to we need we need to have time to practice it or put it in the practice. So if you have a if you have a if you're walking into a classroom and you have the confidence, like to like a, even a substitute or a teacher, they have the confidence to to be in that classroom. The kids can sense that. So I think a lot of times it's just that it's, it's having the time, like the mentorship. You said go watch a class before we go into a classroom. It's it's putting it into practice. It's just like with anything. If you practice a few times and get that confidence. You, the, the classroom's going to sense that, and I think back to Betty is, is just going back to more time to have a mentor, more time to have to be, be able to put this into practice to, to save it so we don't keep losing teachers. So we don't have to keep replacing them with substitutes because we'll have good quality teachers in the classroom because they have more time to, to, um, to, build, that, to build that confidence while, while they're teaching, and the kids, like I said, can sense, can sense that. So kind of went off subject from the topic of substitutes, but I think I'm going back to teacher retention. Thank you. Jean. You know, in listening to this, I I'm, I'm keep going back to uh, what we're trying to solve is a teacher shortage that we have, and we're trying to do it through various initiatives, um, primarily that are divided into recruitment and retention efforts. Um, in terms of recruitment, I think we have um, some uh, ability to design those recruitment efforts in a way so that we can attract more teachers. Um, but I think we also need to talk about the retention efforts. And I think those are really at the district level, at the school level, uh, in dealing with um, the climate and culture of each school, the, the opportunities for advancement for teachers, the professional development that's provided, uh, and, and the pay. Um, you know, that's certainly part of it as well. And I don't think we talk enough about those, those types of efforts. Um, and I, I think it, it would be helpful if we could maybe provide some uh, information to, to school districts on uh, things they might consider because I think these two go hand in hand. We can't recruit uh, a lot of people and then have them walking out the door a few years later. Uh, I think we need to be able to retain the good teachers that we have and to, to do those things that make being a teacher in that, in that school, in that district, you know, the best job that, that they would like to keep. Uh, and Thank you. Uh, for that, uh, the initiative for leadership, that it was one of the areas that uh, we were looking at as a whole, that recruitment retention piece as well. So hopefully the group is working on, on, on that particular piece as well. Thank you. Betty. I'm, and just to follow up too, because this does seem like the perfect time to um, underline, underscore, family engagement, getting parents involved with uh, appreciating. We're, we're in a critical um, spot right now that's really going to determine um, the, the success of your students. And if ever there was a time that parents need to step up to the plate, it's now. But we fail to um, help them understand how important, how the, their, the importance of their role in this equation. And as we try to transition through a difficult time, when we have a shortage of teachers, this is not just uh, a state board or a local board or or a teacher problem. This is a problem that's going to impact all. So we really need to enlist the army of family engagement, let them know we are really at a critical point. We need you to step up, to step in, to show up to do whatever to support our teachers. 
so many of them feel like they're just out there. We're, we're fighting this battle by ourselves. And then parents get to sit back and say, well, you did a good job. I don't like what you did there. They get to critique. But they need to be in that battle zone with them, seeing what's going on, seeing how we can help and support. So I am talking more about um, toning up, hyping up the message. We're at a critical time. We need your help. And it not just say you have to be in a classroom, even if you can't come to your child's school and help them. Maybe just talk to your kid at home and help them understand. You need to be a little more respectful of these people that's trying to help you. It's not helping them, it's helping you. And if they can do no more than have that conversation on a frequent basis with their children, maybe it won't make a difference with all of them, but boy, if you could cut the number some. I think that at this point, we need to try and go with what we have available. And I would love to see um, look ways of engaging families in this process and not just seeing them when it comes time to say, you know, your kid got an F or your kid got an A. Um, or they could do better here or there. Engage them on an ongoing basis. I think that's probably an ideal area that maybe we could look at and develop and, and, and do something magical there. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Shane, I'm sorry that you have to be the one right there because I, I feel like okay. I need to respond to some of my colleagues' comments and at the same time, we're not addressing the root cause of the problem. Um, Betty, I completely acknowledge some of the things that you're saying about engagement, but as a parent, what I see often are initiatives on the school's behalf to get parents to come in for open houses, for conferences, which may be on Zoom, and there's not a high level of parent participation. I sat in classrooms during open house in high school with just a few other parents, and there should have been dozens of parents in those rooms. So yes, there's a disconnect in where the districts are meeting parents as far as the needs of the district, the needs of the parent, the needs of the family, whatever that family looks like, it may not be a parent, and, and the needs of the student. And we have needs of teachers. And what we're looking at is a situation where lots and lots of people are saying, I no longer want to teach because I don't feel respected and it's an impossible situation for me. So when I come back to this plan that you have before us, what I see, I, I guess I have some questions in terms of, is this an effort to, to free up more of those long-term subs so that they can stay, stay in that one classroom that they've been assigned to? What, how, how does this move us closer? I, I look at the, the Greenbush um, trainings, the modules, have those changed? Have they gotten more robust since this came before us previously? So I'll let you jump in. So for the Greenbush, no, not at the moment, but they are building additional trainings based on the recommendation of the team. Uh, for those four additional areas, de-escalation, uh, special education strategies, uh, SOL uh, training, and then ethics and confidentiality. Now, as far as getting towards, is, is this to extend um, substitutes? No. So what this does is, unfortunately, it's a complex issue, and what Garden City needs is different than what Topeka needs is different than what Hayesville needs, et cetera. This is just another option that allows uh, some of those districts where they don't have the support or have the population that meets the criteria for the current substitute uh, rules to uh, engage their community and get individuals uh, into the classroom to potentially serve as not only an emergency substitute teacher, but every individual that you have that you get into the classroom, you have that opportunity to take advantage of them getting an interest in the profession and then potentially seeking uh, to become uh, some type of licensed teacher in the future through one of our different initiatives, whether it's 
you know, a, a parrot a limited apprentice license or participate in the TAP program after serving as a, as a substitute. So it, it can be used as a, a recruiting tool and it's not there to solve every single problem. It's just, it, it's complex and, and some, of our, some of our districts need more assistance because individuals can't, our, our teaching population, um, an individual is trying to go to a doctor's appointment it's causing a burden for some other individual to come cover their classes while they're doing that. And since there's no substitutes, there's not even the option for them to truly go take uh, leave to go to their dentist, for example. So that's that's kind of the issue that we're trying to tackle with that. It's not trying to populate our classrooms with substitute teachers. So a follow-up. Is there a possibility that for this license in particular, there could be a restriction on what classrooms they can be in? I, I saw the restrictions on number of days. Um, but, but can we narrow that focus even more? You talk about you know filling in for an appointment. Um, there's there's a difference between a sub who can come in and teach a lesson plan and one who's just there as a babysitter. No. Is is the room potentially yes? But every time uh, a restriction is put on there, the value of the the license for that LEA it's gonna it's gonna be reduced for what they can do. So, you know maybe that is the right answer. I don't know. But I would, I me personally, I would be against adding any type of any more restriction other than those days that we have that are equivalent to the emergency substitute for 60 hours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. At some point, we're going to have to pause the discussion, but Janet gets the last word. No, I get the last word, but Janet gets the next the last word. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Betty brought up a wonderful point. Uh, this retention to me is huge. And I think this is one thing we really need to visit strongly. Needless to say, the, the substitute issues uh, wouldn't be probable, a prob big, as big a problem if we, had, we were able to retain them. Yeah. Now, here's my concern. First of all, I agree 100% with bringing the fam The families need to be involved. And I think, I was going to talk about this even next month, we need to open our schools up a little bit more to make sure parents come in and volunteer. Do some volunteer work. I know they got to go through some rigmarole to get it done, but I think that they need to be in there. I don't understand why parents aren't contacting, staying in touch with their teachers. When my children went to school, I knew every teacher, every teacher my student had. I made sure I knew who they were even when I couldn't be there. I volunteered there. I did everything there. I don't understand that. And I, what Melanie said about conferences, my daughter told me that yesterday she had conferences all day long. Guess how many parents showed up? One. Now that's sad. They're opening the schools to have these parents in and, and so many are just not showing up. I mean, and yet they're complaining and they're criticizing the teachers. Our teachers have, have been really, it's just been terrible what they've, what they've gone through. And I've talked with several people about how many teachers are teaching three or four years, and they say, I don't want to take this anymore. I can't take it. And then to top it all off, the politicians are calling them all kinds of ugly names. There was a time when teachers were the most re one of the most respected professions that we had. They ranked up there with, with uh, pastors and other people like that. You know, I mean, so I don't understand that. So I think so if some way we can get our parents involved, we can make our politicians understand the ones that are so negative about our schools, how our teachers are raking their backs to do the best that they can. And I think this retention is huge. We really need to get on top of it. We need to make sure parents recognize their responsibilities and follow through with them and come to the schools and volunteer because that'll save, that'll help a little bit <laughs> with more people in our buildings. So. Anyway, those are my concerns. Thank you. Several weeks ago, several of us attended the Teacher of the Year banquet where we see excellence. And they are not just those people we're talking about. They represent thousands of other excellent teachers. And the people in the room are going to get tired of me hearing, hearing me say this, but I'm going to say it again over and over again. We have to deliver the message that there are positive things going on in Kansas classrooms. Uh, other people are controlling the message. 
I haven't done research, but I anecdotally know that there are people that I consider to be excellent classroom teachers that just quit because they no longer were allowing themselves to be disrespected. We have to control the message. We have to tell the real stories. This is having to do it. But I think, I think, it's my opinion that part of the retention problem is directly related to lack of respect. Uh, and uh, and like everybody else said, they, the teachers that are doing better job, as I as I said in one of my statements later, on, my children got a better education than I did because the teachers were better prepared. My grandchildren are getting a better education, and I was their superintendent, so I should, you know, that, that's my fault. Uh, my uh, grandchildren are getting a better education than my children did because the profession has increased and improved over the years, and it continues to improve, but the respect has declined, and we have to address that. Uh, and that, I mean, that's not your job. That's our job. That's everybody's job to do that, and so that is... Uh, I, I just, I, and I'm sorry, but I'm going to, I'm going to say that every chance I get until somebody pays attention. <laughs> well, I believe Shane, that is all we have for right now. When will we see the recommendations for approval for the substitute? Is it next month? Okay. Well, we're going to. I have some questions about, yes, about that too. Yes, so uh, when we make that agenda, let's make sure we give ourselves significant time there. And I'll not mention any names. But the vice chair told me that ten minutes was not long enough to a break, so we will we will we will reconvene in fifteen minutes.
now going to open the discussion of graduation requirements. We have a hard we have a hard deadline because uh, at three thirty, our uh, Miss Kansas is going to be here, and that's a hard deadline. So we will continue the discussion up to that point. Anything that we do not finish today will be a discussion topic in November. If we get finished today, we'll have to decide whether or not uh, it's going to be an action item in either November or December. But we want to have plenty of time for discussion, but we have to be through today uh, of this discussion by 3.30. Are you going to talk to us, Commissioner? Well, you need to have the discussion. Um, one of the things that Dina and Gene and I did on our tour is that we ask every school district that we set with administrative team, here's the current graduation task force recommendation setting in front of the state board. Here's kind of the current discussion. What do you think? Is that paraphrased pretty well? Um, and, and I, I really do want Gene and, um, and Dina to jump in because I'm going to paraphrase. On the mastery of competencies, my takeaway, and they may have a different we really are intrigued by that. We really kind of like that idea. And then the high school principal would say, how in the world do you do that? Like, I'm really kind of intrigued by that, but I don't know how to do that. On the post-secondary assets, uh, generally a favorable response. Yes, we can see that our kids could do those. We think those are valuable. And we generally like those. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And then on the courses, there, there really wasn't a whole lot of feedback. I think we got a little bit like you did. Maybe the fine arts is really valuable, a little. But I think overall, there was general agreement. The other thing that we found is that the, um, the range on these, on these total credits was 23, I think 30, we had one at 32, if I remember right, Gene, isn't that right? But the general range was 23 to 28 with one outlier of 32. So whenever we were talking about 21 credits, they were like, well, we, we, we require many more credits than that to graduate. The 32, I think, was an eight, four block by four block, and they were on a block schedule. So... As you discuss, you have a lot to discuss, and I know you want to hear, uh, hear from each other. You could, I'm just going to share this with you. This is Randy trying to listen and put something together, right? And since you're in discussion mode, you can see here, this is what we have on the left. The task force is on the right. Okay? I just changed it. You could look at raising the total requirements to 22. That's still, now, now you, not, <laughs> there's nothing magical other than you're, you're going to bump into some foster care kids, juvenile delinquent kid, uh, uh, centers, and maybe small alternative schools. That would allow you to keep social, social studies at three, fine arts at one, and you could still take the recommendation to add a humanities fine arts. So you've increased the fine arts. On this one, STEM would remain the same. The unit of P, six unit of electives, could still be that with a half a credit of life skills, and I'm, I'm probably saying that wrong, Melanie, but what students said, we want some kind of life skills. And then what I did here was I reduced the electives from 4.5 to four. Nothing magical. For, and that brought the total then to 22. So I, I think as you were thinking about 21 and listening to how people were talking to you, maybe that was the hang up. But Mr. Chairman, with that, I'm just, don't, I mean, I, I'm just, you have a lot to discuss and you have about 40 minutes to do it before Miss Kansas comes. So I'd be happy to, there's nothing magical about this except we, Gene and Dean and I listened a lot Melanie thinking about the life skills class and then thinking if, if you can go to 22, you can keep the fine arts and even enhance it. You can keep the STEM. You can, you can enhance uh, the employability and life skills by adding the life skills. And what you're taking away is a half a credit of the electives. And for most school districts, you haven't impacted the total credits whatsoever. 
what's all about. So anyway. I've also been touring a lot of places and I asked this, these, the same questions and basically got the same response. Of course, we've heard from the, the arts community probably more than others. Uh, a couple of recommendations that one school that had a significant alternative school uh, was concerned about the assets, and, but not uh, that everybody supported the post-secondary assets, but they were looking at perhaps uh, some enhancements uh, that, uh, and one of them, and I'm not, I'm not taking a position, I'm telling you what I heard, uh, that uh, one of the things they were concerned about that many of their students that are in the alternative schools also had jobs that may not be uh, associated with their individual plans of study, and they wanted us to at least have a discussion about that. Uh, and I, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, taking a position. I'm just simply saying about what I had. One, one of the uh, superintendents that I talked at, at a group that I was meeting with suggested on the on the thing that's on the board right now that that be not just STEM but STEAM courses like for instance advanced uh, music theory you know that would that, that is that is pretty rigorous uh, again not taking a position uh, I ask uh, every place that I was meeting with school superintendents and I met with school superintendents and teachers groups uh, when I met with the school superintendents and I asked how many of you uh, offer or require financial literacy, almost every every hand in the room went up. So of, of the people that I talked to, that was common. Uh, and those are basically the things. I, I got a, a pretty extensive uh, email uh, from the, uh, about the alternative schools, and I'm going to send that email to uh, to Barbara so that she can send that out. I'm mean, not right now, but before we have it, continue this discussion, you'll at least have a chance to see what they say uh, and see whether or not we want to take that. Uh, Anne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking at the assets, and I really, really like that. I'm, I'm struggling between two things. One is that we should require more than two, because I think almost every kid's going to have two in the bag anyway so it doesn't really mean anything. But then I also had the question when I sent this out on my newsletter, um, is, and, and I just don't know about this, so I'm just asking, is there a financial barrier to some kids for getting any of them? So I don't know why I'm, well, I'm struggling with, I think we ought to have more. I don't want to add a barrier to graduation for some kids who couldn't do it, so we might want to really look at that list. Um, and I'm not, was life skills on there before? Or, or did you say, I'm not sure that, what life skills is. That was not, I'll, I'll defer to Melanie and people on the committee because that came out of the survey of the students. Well, I, I know, but I just don't, I think it's amorphous. You know, I, I don't even know what it is. I mean, unless we have standards for it and can define it, I don't think it ought to be on the list. That's my concern. If, if I may, I'll answer your question real quick. Um, we surveyed over 300 students who returned detailed survey comments, and one of the key things that they said when we asked them what classes would you, what, what classes would you delete, they all said PE, top of the list. Um, we don't want to be required to take PE. And a number of students came back and literally said that they wanted an adulting 101 course. Those were the words that they used. Yeah. And then many of them mentioned life skills. And so I think that this is up there just as something to consider because so many of those kids were asking for that. And it, it ran the gamut, and from how to, say, fill out an application to buy a large item yeah. to how to make mac and cheese. I know. That's what I'm saying. It's so amorphous. I don't think it should be on the list. I think a lot of districts already require something like that or provide something like that. But if we can't clearly define it and set standards for it, it shouldn't be on there. I think we may have that in our uh, facts course offerings right now that could be come if you want it if you but want if like you want. she said what they what a kid in twin trees thinks life skills is and one in blue valley is 180 degrees out right so i don't think you can take it out of out of one course i'm just just saying thanks 
Another comment that I forgot, one of the superintendents from a very, very small school was, talked about uh, advanced technology, advanced uh, math, advanced science, that uh, many, many students that are not really good students struggle past that third math or third science class. And maybe uh, some other alternatives might be part of that process. Folks, we got 30 minutes, uh, and I don't see any questions. <laughs> Go ahead, Ann. To follow up on what you were saying, because I think right now it just says, what? yeah, they have to take algebra and geometry. That's just two. So that third class, and some kids more and more take an algebra in eighth grade anyway, that third class could be some alternative math class now. <clears throat> They were specifically re reacting to the third item, that additional, that additional class. But they could take computer science if we define that. Yeah. Did and you, did you have a yeah. comment, Jim? You said something that, as the uh, task force worked, people determined that algebraic and geometric mean algebra and geometry courses. Uh -huh. They don't. They don't. What does that mean? It means math classes that include algebraic and geometric concepts. So it could be one credit that had both? It could be one, but it, 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 you said the life skills wasn't really well defined. Oh, Don't yeah, think that, that algebra and geometry are well defined. Well, we have standards for algebra. Well, we do. Yeah, we do. We, do. we have standards, but that doesn't mean that those, all those standards are being met. And those standards know. say what you should know at what right, grade. For instance, it doesn't have to be Algebra 1. It could be pre-algebra. Gotcha. Okay, and geometric, it doesn't mean it has to be geometry. It could be construction, math. But all the same, what you're saying is what Jim's saying too. There are alternative math available exactly. already. No, I just yeah. wanted to clarify that gotcha. we're not talking in that recommendation that it's straight algebra and straight geometry. You know, as it's been interpreted over the years. Thank you. Betty. Yeah, thank you for making that. Okay, thank you. Um, let me go on record as um, stating that I don't like the idea of change just for making a change. There has to be support. There has to be Justification, I'm sorry. I was looking at the clock and didn't want to go over it. You got plenty of time. Plenty of time. When we, when we look at making these changes, what is the impact for the student? I think when we started this, I was really excited. I knew that it wasn't going to be something quick, that you can just come up with a change that was going to... Uh, satisfy whatever it was we were searching, but opening the door, realizing that we needed to revamp the way that we do things, that we revamp the way that we look at things, and to come up with a final plan is concerning to me. I feel like this is just saying we need to do a little more in-depth, looking at what we can do, what we should do, that's going to um, um, serve a, a, a tangent role to the student. Why, if this student took 3.5 versus four, what difference will, will that make, or, or what kinds of things can they really substitute? I felt like as we got toward the end, the idea seemed to be, okay, let's just um, um, not feel like we've wasted so many people's time and coming together for these meetings. And there, there was a lot of support on that committee. People, um, I know on the Zoom meetings, they were there, they were engaged. Um, they took this task seriously. Um, but there still were a lot of unanswered 
questions, even in the area where I served. I don't think we ever came to a consensus. Um, it was, okay, well, this is what I'm gonna take from all of it, and a recommendation was made. That kind of concerned me. I, I, I take this seriously. I felt like it was a lot of work that's been done, but it indicates that there still is some things we really need to do to, um, to fine tune this. So for me to say, okay, these are the recommendations that we're gonna go with. And if that's the case, that's fine, but I don't wanna see this closed. I see this as maybe something ongoing that we really need to drill down and, 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 and um, uh, look into some of the responses indicated something that really there was not a great research that went into a perfect example was when Melanie spoke about the responses that she received, the 300 students. Well, when you compare that uh, ratio of that to the number of students in, in Kansas, it's really insignificant. But it's significant in the fact that we did have a number that indicated we really need to be researching or looking elsewhere. So with that being said, no, there's no definite path forward in the life scale, but it is an indicator that there's some people out there that really wanna see this developed. That's why I'm saying if this is opening the door to maybe ongoing, let's look into this a little more. Some things have been presented that weren't considered or weren't a part of the, the real change, um, and we need to investigate it further. I would love that option because I don't think we're really at a position to say, okay, this is a final package. Let's go with it and be done with it. That's not where I am on this. Thank you. And remember, no matter what we do, uh, you know, if, if we adopt this at some point, and Ann's concerned about life skills, I have the same concern, uh, the first class, if, if we do this now, or pretty soon, the first class that this would impact would be current eighth graders. So we have years to develop the standards necessary if we decide to do that. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman <coughs> Border. Um, this is the first time that I'm seeing this on a slide, and it's a change from what's been presented to the board before, and there are certainly some aspects of this that I like. Um, the big, I, I served on the Mastery and Competency Subcommittee on the task force, and we put a lot of work into talking through what does Mastery and Competency look like, what problem are we trying to solve for these students? And I come back to some of the gaps that we talked about, which were, you know, the life skills is a gap that was noted by students. Um, preparing for college was another gap that doesn't, it's not addressed specifically by any of these. So there was a conversation at one point about the opportunity to be able to t have dedicated time with a um, counselor with someone who can help them prepare for college. Um, there was a long, con we've had many conversations about IPS and ensuring that that IPS is of a very high quality for every student in Kansas. And in doing so, we guide them on this path as they're planning their path through high school and beyond. And another thing that's been discussed that's not up here was the potential ability, we, and we've talked about it like when Baser Limwood came and presented what they were doing with civics and um, they had a semester long class that was an entire afternoon and when you took that one class that was the entire afternoon, you would get several different credits um, based on that civics project. And so what does it look like for a student to say, I wanna create my own class and here's the individual project that I wanna work on Here's the study that I plan to do, and how can I fit that into these classifications? Um, 
we also talked about the potential for students to petition and say, I, I want to take this class that's already on in the course catalog, essentially, um, and I think that it should count for one of these credits. And so I feel like a large part of our job here in the next hopefully couple of months as we wrap this up is to really provide the framework for schools to say this is what the state board said we can do. Because what I hear so often is we can't do that right now. Um, our district won't let us. Uh, the principal won't let us. The principal won't sign off on, um, Randy, you've talked about how a student who's in training for the Olympics should be able to maybe check that box for PE. And so I, I think that this is an opportunity for us to provide guidance on what mastery and competency looks like and, and how that is applied to checking the boxes for these different classes. Um, but that said, I, I like the idea of being able to, to swap um, for instance, the STEM elective provides a lot of flexibility. And so I, I think that we need to be really focused on creating the most flexible system possible and really encouraging, kind of back to the conversation we were having earlier, encouraging students to participate in their own decisions about their education and families and caregivers to be part of that conversation as well as they design what, the, what their path through high school looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Melanie. Yeah. One of our recommendations as a task force was that the Department of Education here create the guardrails, the uh, supports for mastery and competency so districts would have some consistency and guidance. Because in, in our research, we found in experience that many of them would like to do it, but they don't know how. You know, and saying no is easy when you don't know how to do it. You know, so that recommendation is what we made to as part of our recommendation to, to the board and to the department. You know, so yeah, I agree 100% with what you said. You know, if we're gonna move forward on this, we're gonna have to provide supports for the people who are going to be doing it. Can't just say you can do it now and, well, like, what is it? <laughs> do I just give them a test or just have, do a portfolio? Or what, what are the guardrails? What are the supports? What's the, the what, what are we, and how do I assess that? What rubrics do I have? Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a ton of work behind that mastery competency and demonstration, you know, a portfolio that has to take place. I have a, a school, a small school in my district that for at least 10 years has been heavily involved in project-based learning where a student can get numerous credits for the project because they have to they have to defend the project which is a speech speaking they have to uh, outline the project they have to plan the project they have to do the project which may require a lot of math geometry especially uh, we have to encourage uh, and and in, in, encourage and uh, school administrators to be creative because there are ways to do this. And all of this, we make the assumption three math, that means I have to sit in the math class three times, regardless of what I already know. So we also have to make sure that people understand that they have the authority and encourage them to look at competency-based credit. That does not mean I've got to sit in classrooms for a year to get one of those credits. If I already have the skills and I can demonstrate those skills, uh, and, and, I, and that, that's, that's missing because, you know, whenever anybody looks at this and the people that I've talked to look at this, they think, okay, that's three courses in math, that's three courses in science, that's one extra course, that is a half year of physical education, that is, but the fact is, there are kids that already have those skills and those that don't have any of them. Uh, and so we have to encourage and value creativity. Janet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to, like, I kind of agree with what everyone said, but I'd also like to, uh, to suggest that we do change STEM to STEAM. And uh, the reason why is because uh, I was sitting here thinking about this and how children, should, our students should be able to get credit for things that they have done outside of school. 
And uh, I want to just talk about my grandchildren. I have two grandchildren who were very involved in music, and both of them were in drum corps for a couple of years. And why couldn't they have gotten two credits, one for uh, music and the other for PE? I mean, you know, because I don't know really you know what those drum corps do, but they work them, those kids to death, and they play all the time. You know, so I think that would be a simple one, even though it's during the summer. I still think the school could give them that credit ought to be able to be given. I think that would be... I mean, there's got to be many other things besides that that our kids do because I know a lot of kids are involved in in uh, uh, in sports or in other art uh, pro pro activities that could do so many things. There's just so much, or particularly scouting. My goodness, the the things they do. So that's why I would like to see that be at, made in esteem and also make sure our students are allowed to have credits, maybe outside the school or on their how, well, things they well, were able to uh, to recommend that they should get credits for. And secondly, this life skills class. I, I agree, I think this is very important. And now my, and I have one question about it. My question is, why couldn't we put life skills as determined by each district? And that way each district would look at what they felt was necessary for their own students like we do social emotional growth, social emotional. Why couldn't we do the same thing with life skills? Because I do think that's important that they learn how to fill out a job application as well as learn how to make macaroni and cheese. But I mean, each district could kind of develop their own or we could develop a general one and make suggestions or something. But I, I think that's one way we'd get it in place. Thank you. And just on the side, Janet, whenever I was in, in school, which is before most of the people in this room were born, Not me. Uh, except you, except some of you. Uh, I got a PE credit for being in the marching band. Did you really? I did. Well, my De son didn't. <laughs> Dina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a member of the group that uh, was on the highways. 36 tour, uh, we also did hear from students and the idea of life skills being was being a class was broached to them. And while I think what Ann was mentioning that it could be more than likely would be different, we think of it differently, what do we need? It could be a part of your uh, IP, not IP, but um, now I'm forgetting the, the acronym. But anyway, of our pl plan for what we're going to study and it might not be the same for each student. Some students may learn how to change a tire and change oil from their family point of view. They may be taught that. In a rural district, more than likely, the kids that live on a farm have already been taught those kinds of things by a parent, but there are other things that they don't know, and things that a child in, in Johnson County may know, but because we're a mobile society, it would seem very important to be able to take those kinds of bits of knowledge with you. So I think the life skills course was one that students found very intriguing. I find it intriguing because it's not something that we've normally talked about in the past. Because a lot of those things 
have already been, in our experience, we were taught those kinds of things when we were kids by our parents or someone within the family. But today, that's not necessarily happening. So it seems to me that that is one that possibly is needed. And we can determine how that would be approached. I also would um, say that what Dr. Watson was talking about, the way administrators, the concern they had about, I like the idea of being able to allow students to um, do a project and be able to to count those various skills that I've learned there as a part of my learning and I get credit for. But how do I actually work with that? And I would agree that it seems to me we have a lot of experts who work in this department and they can advise us. And so I think there's ways to begin that process. So I find the idea of all of this much an exciting type um, move forward but I would like to see us add another credit because every school district we saw just kind of said, we already, we could fit that in. So um, Jean may have a different view of what I've said, but um, I think what we heard was very positive and encouraging, really, what, what we were planning to do. And I think the districts, small, very small districts, are looking for this as kind of a a boost in enthusiasm. So, thank you. Well, since since, uh, since Dina referenced you, do you have anything to add? I, I do. I think when we were speaking with the the folks at those those districts and and others that we I visited, um, it, what struck me is that in looking at this, all this has to work together as, as one. These are not sort of three separate additions to the graduation requirements. They're, they're three different ways of approaching meeting competencies and skills that these, these students need. Um, I, it, one of the things that I was struck by, though, is that most uh, folks are really unaware of the authority they currently have to grant credit for mastery. And they really um, would like to have more guidance in that, including whether that, that credit needs to be earned while in high school. Perhaps it could be earned in middle school or, or, or earlier. Um, and um, with the post-secondary um, uh, types of uh, assets that students would be expected to, to earn. Um, a lot of those are, are, are um, really recognizing work that students already do on their own, for which they receive no credit um, other than uh, their own personal uh, skills and, and enjoyment of those activities. And I think that also honors um, what students are, are learning from those those situations. So 
I, I really like that we're doing this. Um, I was interested to see that really none of the districts uh, objected to expanding the number of credit hours um, required because that to me showed a, a flexibility in terms of um, their thinking that they felt that their students could um, could achieve that and, and that their graduation rates would would still uh, be as high or higher. So I, I think this is a, a really good plan and we just need to, to get some information out there and to make sure districts really understand um, the parameters and the authority that they have. Thank you. Mr. Jones will be the next speaker and then we'll continue this discussion after he gets through next month. Ben. Because you got accidentally removed. Okay. Yeah, he did. Well, technically my colleague to my left was on there before I was, but. Um, well, then be fast. <laughs> I, I really do appreciate the work and, and the conversation. And I had um, a lot of concern regarding the arts credit. And I have out, been out in my district uh, as much as possible. Um, with me being in the classroom full time, it's a little bit different and challenging. But we're make, finding ways to making it work. Um, and my concern was was over the arts, and that was that would be no surprise to anyone in this room, uh, because of my background. And and I'm very happy to see the change in there. With with that, I'm looking at some of the the life skills and and those courses. And, and I agree with you, Mr. Chair. I really like the STEAM idea because I'm a big proponent of STEAM education. Um, I'm going to tell you, music theory is very, very difficult um, uh, to go through in very high level um, and, and several other uh, art classes that, that are very upper tier, I want to say. But when we look at some of those, those classes, especially in the employability and life skills section, there comes a conversation of what classes qualify and do we have qualified teachers to teach them? When I look at life skills, and we talk about facts, I have schools that can't find a facts teacher. They want to offer it, and that comes up because every time I ask them, do you offer the teaching pathway in your school, they say no because we don't have a facts teacher. Because a facts teacher is required to teach human growth and development. And so that is an issue when we look at that, who teaches it, and most of those standards, like personal finance, financial literacy, you can probably, a math person could probably teach that. But typically it falls into facts. Uh, when it comes to, when I learned how to write a check and how to balance a book, that was through facts. A facts class that I had. And the life skills. And so when we look at that, do we have the personnel, when we look at that section, to deliver that? And require districts to deliver that in a way that it's meaningful and, and quality. And, I, and we just had the report about how many teachers were short. I know facts wasn't in the top top five, but how many of you have just given up and just eliminated altogether, not even looking for it anymore, which then wouldn't show up on that teacher vacancy and supply report. Um, so those those are some concerns that I have. I think they're important skills to know for kids, and we need to figure out a way to do it. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to do it. And I think we've been very upfront about there are alternate ways to get these credits. They also need to be quality. And they can't just be, oh, I just did this check the box. There needs to be that follow-up. There needs to be that qual assurance of quality that, you know, you know, for 4-H, I go to the state fair every year, go to the 4-H building. There's a lot of kids that fulfill a lot of those things. It's, it's demonstrable. FFA, same thing. There are things out there, uh, the scouts. Um, and, um, and I've been a big proponent of that. But that, that is something that can we deliver this? And is it deliverable for our schools to do and, and workable? And um, I think for the most part, yes. I'm really happy with the change in the arts. You're welcome. Thank you uh, for that in the humanities. I think uh, expanding history government courses as well as the arts is, is a good thing um, for all kids. But when we get to the employability and life skills thing, that, that is some concerns of what, what courses qualify and, and, and making sure that it's doable. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Unless I'm mistaken, we can decide who can teach what. So that's. So the, can can we help the teaching pathway we, thing? We, we can do that. Uh, Ann, did I miss you? Can, can you wait till next month? Yeah, I'll try to make some good notes so I remember what I was going to ask. <laughs> well, <laughs> can you do it in two minutes? Well, um, I had a question about, I sent this out to a lot of people, and the question came back, what the heck is humanities art? So I'll do that offline. But the STEM thing is highly technical. So I have a real problem saying taking band an extra year satisfies STEAM. Yeah, and I don't, and I'm getting to you. Ben assures me there are highly technical music classes and maybe one or two districts in the entire state teach that. So that's why I have a problem changing STEM to STEAM. It would have to be highly technical and we'd have to have a whole lot more people teaching it then. Me, me, but, what, I, what we tried to do there in that humanities arts was address just that. That could be your advanced music theory class. Yeah. It could be an elective social studies. It's that additional. So, so we've got you, the. So we try to keep that in the society humanities part and leave the STEM. Th and that was STEM. the attempt in trying to hear yeah. what people were doing anyway. Okay. And that, and I still that think recommendation, I did not recommend that. I just merely reported know, that's that. That's what, and it was yeah. done by a superintendent who used to be a band director. You know how those <laughs> folks are. Five, five credits for band. We're out of here. But I, and I still think if we can't, I mean, everything we have up here, we have standards for. These are state standards. There is no state standards for life skills. And I just, you know, sorry, but that's just too loosey-goosey for me. And I'm kind of way out on the left edge, so. Okay, we'll continue the discussion next month. I believe you have a special guest to introduce to us, Commissioner. I do. She's been waiting patiently. Had the opportunity through the Sunfire Summer Program to meet uh, this year's Miss Kansas when we were out at uh, one of the uh, one of the events where where people were camping out, and uh, uh, what an what a great joy and an opportunity to meet her. And so she's here to tell you a little bit about her journey and about the program, and we're just honored to have her with us. So it's all yours. It's good to see you. You too, Randy. Thank you. Welcome to the State Board. Thank you for having me. It's It's been a journey. I've had several appearances before today, so I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off. But we're here. I'm grateful to be here. I figured before going into Miss Kansas and what it, exactly it is that I do, it's very pertinent that I talk about what led me to that. Um, and it really started from the moment I was born. I was born in 2001. My mother was 18 years old. Um, naturally, I was a surprise. And she was barely in a position to take care of herself, let alone me. Not only that, she was struggling with addiction. And I'm grateful that I can talk about these things because we have since healed and life is what it is now. But it was a journey to get me here. And that was just the start of what my life ended up being. I had experienced the homelessness, the poverty, severe poverty. So we were talking about life skills. I learned a lot about life before I was even in second grade. And moving forward, I had moved to Colorado for just a just a short while. Moved back to Dodge City. Life was really great. I was in dance. I learned how to play the violin. I was doing things that my father was able to sacrifice his time and money for that got me to where I am today. But through that, about sixth grade, and I take it like a timeline, and I'm grazing over. I, If I could talk about my life, we'd be here for quite some time. So I'm trying to graze over the important aspects. And about sixth grade, my dad was in a medical-induced coma for an entire summer and, and some change. And when he got back, he's a statistic. He shouldn't have made it. His esophagus ruptured. He was infected for, like I said, quite, quite a while. Um, made it out, but you quickly realize that life is fragile. And you try to control the aspects of life that you can control. And for me, that was the only daughter within a household. Um, I took that. I took the brunt of that. It is a double standard if you are the only female sibling. And because of that, it was my senior year of high school, and I decided that it was safe for me, safer for me to be out of the home. I was homeless at 17 years old, legally homeless. I didn't live with either of my parents. I had to do what I needed to do to get by. I was a full-time high school student. Um, I went to Dodge City, the USD 443 organization, and through the dual credit program at the college, I was able to be a full-time high school student, a full-time college student, and I worked full-time. Um, I don't know where I got sleep. 
I really don't. <laughs> I was involved in cross country and track. I was on the dance team. I was in orchestra, National Honor Society, doing things out in my community because I wanted to. I knew that I needed to for self-development reasons. And like I said, I don't know where I got the sleep. I ended up going to Fort Hay State University on a full ride through the Red Foundation. And that was that was weight off my shoulders. Education was so important to me. It really was. We can go back and I remember specific moments and specific teachers that had changed my life at every single phase of it. And one of them in second grade in Buckland Elementary before I had to relocate to Lamar, Colorado to live with my father, Mrs. Bartholomew. She has since relocated out of the state, but she was a young teacher. She did not know any better and she knew that I was hungry sometimes. She would give me snacks out of my Ayana's drawer. She would pull me outside of recess and instead of going to be with my peers at recess, I was overwhelmed. There were days where I just could not focus. And so instead of going to recess and being way overstimulated, she brought me in and I got to read a book with her. And like I said, education has been so important because moments like that mattered to me. And I wanted to go to college. I knew the importance of it, it was instilled into me. And so with that full ride scholarship, I was now able to pursue a medical degree. I wanted to be a doctor from day one. Actually, I wanted to be an ICU nurse. Um, so my first burn patient, I passed out. <laughs> I could not do it. So that was the introduction into it. But in order to be a medical professional, whatever that may be, school comes next. And it was scary, it was a scary thought. And then after the Red Foundation came into my life, I finally had time to breathe. And I had an identity crisis. I really did. I had to survive up until this moment of my life. And I had an opportunity, it's a new saying, survive versus thriving. I get to say that at Miss America and I'm so excited. But how was I gonna thrive when I was never taught how? And that's where Miss Kansas came into the picture. Along with the, fun, the foundation and the scholarship, I needed to get career ready. I needed to do something beyond just me. And I wanted to, I've always had that desire. I didn't know what it was gonna turn into, but here I am today. In that very first year, I was Miss Boot Hill. It was pre-COVID. I know we hate talking about that. Um, and I go in with this idea of just making friends. This is a new experience, something that I wanted to try, be out in my community, meet such like-minded individuals. And I go in, COVID made it two years. By the time that two years is over, you're just ready to get it over with. I was ready to make some friends. I was ready to just say I did it. I wanted to make top 10. If you make top 10, you get some bragging rights. And so I get called for top 10. I get called for top five that very first year and I am panicking. I had no clue what I was doing. I knew this organization was so much bigger than myself. I think I would have made a great Miss Kansas, but I wouldn't have been able to do it in the capacity I'm doing it now. So then I get second place. You guys got the chance to hear from Taylor Clark, our music education girl herself. And I was her runner up and I remember praying over her harder than I've ever prayed for anyone in my life. And when she was announced, I was so relieved, but it lit a fire. And going in this next year, I said, I'm not doing it for the friends. Yes, I've made some great friends along the way, but I'm going to do it to make a change. And so same concept, top 10. I was called, I now have some bragging rights. Top five, I didn't say, oh shoot, this go around. And before you know is five, four, three, two, me and Jetta Smith are holding hands. She's now an educator in Oklahoma, actually. Um, she's teaching social studies and government. And she's praying over me out loud, saying the legacy that I'm gonna leave behind. And it's important and it matters. After my name was called, don't remember the next 48 hours whatsoever. But up until this point today, since June 11th, I've had over about 160 appearances. I wanted to be Miss Kansas to leave an impact. So the life that I'd lived before is important because now I get to go and help those dealing with trauma. Um, I've done it through the Big Brothers Big Sisters organization, um, Lead for America, keeping talents in Kansas in the respective states. I'm on the national team. That will be an announcement soon. Um, and I've built beds. I've gone to campouts and I've helped children fish. And I've gone so far as to having one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I get to go to schools and I have these motivational speeches, um, talk about my life, leadership, really whatever people want me to talk about. And I've had children come back to me and they've told me their stories. I've had grown adults come back and after a two month conversation, I had a conversation one time for maybe five minutes. Two months later, she reaches out to me over social media and says, you know, for two months I've been going to therapy. I had taken my first ACEs score. I guess I ought to tell you what my social impact initiative is. It's ACEs low, overcoming adverse childhood experiences. And you guys know the ACEs score all too well. And she took her first score, got an eight. And she says, it was because of our conversation that I realized that's not my burden to carry anymore. And so she's been going through therapy and it's just this connection as to why I had gone through what I had gone through. I might get a little bit of emotional, but 
growing up in those circumstances, you have to question why every single day almost. And after I'm crowned and after I've lived the life that I've gotten to live in Miss Kansas until this point, it makes sense. So I'm loving kids. Oh my goodness. Everyone always asks, what's your favorite part? And it's always the kids. I'm sure each and every one of you in whatever capacity it was during your education, even now as an administrator, you understand that. It's so much bigger than ourselves. And now I get to go forward as Miss America. Sorry, Betty, I'm getting really emotional too. Um, I get to go to Miss America and say that because of the great state of Kansas and because of the opportunities within our education system, the Miss Kansas organization and some of the perks that I've been given as a Red Scholar, I get to do it. And I get to do it and I love it, I really do. And for you guys and for those who are on the stream and for some of my educators back here, um, thank you. Thank you for what you do because it matters. I, my second grade teacher, I didn't message her or give her any indication of what my life had looked like until I was a junior in high school. For how many of those years, she had no clue the impact that she left. Um, she had moved. I mean, I remember when I had to move to Colorado, she gave, she gave me a card and it had a little teddy bear and a little halo on it with her contact information and just who she was. And I kept that with me until my high school graduation. I still have it, but it's in a keepsake box. A keepsake box. And I guess my motivation aspect of it is even if you don't see the change and the impact that you're leaving immediately, it could be 10 years down the road. And that person's going to reach out to you and say, you know, you changed my life. And I know education is hard. I know. My grandmother was, is, or was a fax teacher. And I remember the first time we had ever watched Miss America, I had just gotten my LASIK surgery. So I wasn't watching it, but she was. And she was taking notes for me. And she was so, so excited that one of the candidates or competitors now was a fax major. And so she was just beyond herself with that representation. So I know, you guys, it's, it's short. And you don't get as much kudos as you should, but it's a hard job. And I thank you guys for all that you do. And thank you for having or giving me the opportunity to come up here and share my story a little bit. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and then I think naturally we have a few minutes for questions, even if you guys back there have questions. So what's next? What's next? So after Miss America, it's in December. Um, obviously, if I win, I get to carry that title for a year. If not, I get to come back to Kansas and live it up as Miss Kansas for a little bit longer. And I will crown the successor in June, historically. And then I'm actually going into PA school. I am in my gap year. Um, I applied in April. You usually wait a full cycle before you know where you're going. I actually have an interview at Creighton University on the 21st. And to even get an interview my very first year is pretty Amazing. I graduated with my undergrad in three years, and I'm young. And that usually does not correlate to getting into a PA program right away. So fingers crossed that's what's next. Okay, thank you. Betty. Can you handle this, Betty? I'm going to try. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Really, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there are so many kids who um, they see somebody that's successful. And they feel like, well, yeah, but you had all of the mm -hmm. opportunities. You had all of this in your background. And they don't have anyone to look up to mm -hmm. who has gone through adverse situations. And so I am forever grateful that not only that it's you, but that you have a story that so many can relate to, that can look at you and say, I can do that. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that it's in your heart to be moved to mm -hmm. share that because there are so many people who, once they've gained success, then we want to blur that background yeah. as though it's non-existent mm -hmm. um, because of a stigma or feeling embarrassed. and. I am so proud of the fact that you stand and you show what can be done. So congratulations and <laughs> regardless to what the future holds, you have probably made such an impact on so many mm -hmm. students. 
you certainly have me. I, I, I was just crying. I'm glad I don't have <laughs> mascara. <on. laughs> Thank you. You know, I have ran into that as Miss Kansas. When I walk into a room, especially middle schoolers, they scare me just a little bit. Um, but I go in there and they're so testy and I walk in with a crown and sash on and they do not take me seriously. And especially when I get to talk about adversity and that's more often what educators want me to go and speak about, which I'm a, I'm a pro at it at this point. So I go in there and I leave the crown off and I leave it off for a reason. And I have a conversation and I do the icebreakers and then I finally get to tell my story and to have middle schoolers dead silent dead silent, I can hear pins drop and they're leaning forward in their chairs because all they want is someone to connect to. And I've learned that as I keep going to um, school presentations, I have more and more children brave, getting brave and coming down and to talk to me. I've had some report reportable conversations and I do, I know that rule and educators are also aware of the situation. So they'll be standby as children are coming up and telling their stories. But it is, it's that relatability and human connection factor that we all desperately crave. And especially at that age, I, I know it. So I try to be there for them. Anything else? Well, we are to no. congratulate you. You are obviously a very good representat representative of our state. <laughs> and we are so glad that you came to be with us and, your story is transforming. Thank you. And we appreciate that. Uh, would you mind uh, taking pictures with us old people? Oh, of course. <laughs> That's the easy part of the job. <laughs> okay, yeah. We will just stand here. Okay. Ann, can you do that? Can I get one on my cell phone too? I'm going to go grab it. <laughs> well, I eliminated you. <laughs> We're going to reconvene at 4 o'clock. We'll be 15 minutes early, but we'll go ahead and start at that point.
Does everybody have a chair? Do we have anybody standing? If, do we need to get more chairs? We'll start in one minute. We're called back to order. Our next item is to receive Kansas Advisory Council for Indigenous Education Working Group recommendations about mascot reform. Uh, our representative uh, is Ann Ma, and I believe Ann is gonna make the introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I just wanna thank you and um, the board for giving me the chance to work on this project. Uh, it has been enlightening and engaging, and I think in the short amount of time we've been working, we've made a lot of progress working on indigenous education issues. Um, today, we're presenting our first work, a statement on mascots, uh, mascot reform, and a recommendation that's coming to us and the Board of Regents in regard to mascots. And I, we have a lot of distinguished guests here, many of whom I serve with on, on the working group. And so uh, just to kind of give you an idea what the lineup's gonna be, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Alex Redcorn, who you, you've met before. He's gonna give us an overview of what's in the statement. Then we have tribal leadership. We have Chairman Joseph Rupnick from the Prairie Band Potawatomi Tribe, along with Raphael Wawasik. I think they're all gonna speak. Great, now you are. <laughs> then we have Olivia Brin, who's with the Iowa Tribe. Uh, and then we have three educators, Eric Davis, you may have met Superintendent of Royal Valley, Dal Dombo from uh, Wichita School District, and Carol Cadu Blackwood, who's on the Lawrence Board of Education and very involved in their developing indigenous education curriculum there, and her daughter, Georgia. So uh, we have a really good lineup of people today. I encourage you to ask all the questions you can if you have any questions about the statement, what it means, what the implications are, why it's necessary. We really want to have a robust discussion today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Redcorn. And welcome, Dr. Redcorn. Thank you, uh, Away. Nice to see everybody again. <clears throat> Since the last time I was here, we've done a lot of stuff. Um, we've, we've brought the, the council together, or the um, advisory council together, and we've been getting to work. And so, um, I like to write my stuff down, that way I don't go off on tangents and say something I shouldn't say, so I'm gonna go ahead and read from a statement here. So, um, as established by the State Board of Education earlier this year, the Kansas Advisory, for, uh, the Kansas Advisory Council for Indigenous Education Working Group was created in an effort to engage in unprecedented relationship building in our state with our, federally recognized, with our four federally recognized Native nations. I'm here to report that it appears to be working and the potential of this is, uh, it has a lot of potential to work very well. We have leaders from various educational institutions and tribal nations engaging in substantive dialogue about core issues as it relates to education for, about, and with indigenous peoples for the first time in our state. Today, you are receiving the very first advisory statement from our committee, and we are hopeful that this will be taken seriously as a first collaborative act of co-governance. As a reminder, we have over 10,000 native students attending almost every school district in this state, and so it's really important to recognize this isn't just places near reservations. And if Kansas wants to truly focus on the success of each and every student, we believe taking action against American Indian mascots and branding will help improve the educational experiences of all students and also better prepare all students to be productive and respectful citizens in this state. They're the future leaders of this state. As indicated in the statement, 
The research is clear that American Indian themed mascots and branding practices are detrimental to student learning. The American Psychological Association in 2005 passed a resolution that explained how these practices undermine educational experiences of all communities, especially those who have little or no contact with indigenous peoples, and they create unwelcome and hostile learning environments for Native Americans. And I want to emphasize that that was in 2005. And so we've, there's been a lot of research and a lot of things that have developed over the past uh, 15 to 20 years, really. Uh, Stephanie Freiberg's research in 2008 um, has shown us that these practices are harmful to American Indian students' self-esteem, and they limit the way that they see their future-related, uh, future achievement-related possible selves. So this research is also shown to be true even when images and branding are, appear to be honorable. So another study from 2010 showed us that the exposure to American Indian themed mascots and increases the likelihood that students stereotype other ethnic groups. And so really this isn't just an American Indian issue, this is an all students issue and how we learn about all students and all diversity. Um, so we know that teachers and school leaders mean well, but the research shows, it that these shows us that these practices are harmful and they have no place in our schools. So therefore, we are asking that the State Board of Education do the following. So number one, affirm the statement that we were uh, passed on to you that uh, Ann passed on. So number two, review Kansas Board of Education and Kansas State Department of Education policies with a specific attention to how the practice of using American Indian themed mascots and branding may be in conflict with goals and goals related to student learning and well-being. Number three, ask that schools review their policies as well as their improvement plans to determine if they are in conflict with goals related to student learning and well-being. And this includes schools that may not have American Indian themed mascots or branding, yet they're still affected by mascots and branding of others to other institutions. And I think that's really important to emphasize is that when American Indian schools with American Indian themed mascots and branding go to other communities, it's recognized and it affects those communities and it affects American Indian children in those schools. And so that's why it's really important that this isn't just a, the school's problem with the branding issue, it's, it ripples out to other schools. Um, and I actually experienced this in Salina, Kansas when I was living there. I was sitting at Applebee's and the liberal Redskins came into town and a whole bus full of liberal Redskins um, themed stuff was surrounding us at the restaurant and my kids were there and there was a level of discomfort there. And so when people go to other communities, um, that, that discomfort and the, what happens because of those branding practices, it ripples outward. Number four, ask that schools with American Indian themed mascots and branding retire these practices as soon as possible. When more in-depth community engagement and long-term planning is necessary, ask that these institutions develop plans to retire these practices within the next three to five years. And so there is a sense of urgency, um, as was stated in one of our meetings, this probably should have happened a long time ago. Um, but we do understand that some communities are gonna need to engage in some dialogue and do some learning around this issue in order for it to be successful in some communities. Number five, develop a support network for schools that may need help transitioning away from American Indian themed mascots and branding. This includes helping school this includes helping school leaders have access to content area experts, as well as helping them connect with other school leaders who have already been involved in transitioning away from American Indian themed mascots and branding. And so our group, the Kansas Advisory Council for Indigenous Education Working Group, has expressed that we are willing to be collaborators in this work, this community engagement work. And when these communities have to engage in this dialogue and learn from the literature, learn from new perspectives, uh, we're willing to be an active partner in that work. And number six, explore funding opportunities to help institutions transition away from American Indian themed mascots and branding. So we know that funding is a common thing that comes up. Um, we've got to go rebrand all these things. Um, that's one reason we talked about some schools may need to transition, uh, a longer transition period. Um, we know that schools have done this before where they make long-term plans and every time they up and recycle their new uniforms and things like that, there's a long transition away from these. Um, and we knew we know that if we can find funding opportunities, whether it's uh, whether it's in the state of Kansas through st uh, our infrastructures or whether it's through nonprofits outside, um, there's there's opportunities um, to find funding to help these schools along is what we're asking for. 
So while we know that not all natives agree on this issue, you can act with confidence knowing that the tribal nations of Kansas have collaboratively been involved in the development of this statement. And this work is also aligned with statements and resolutions from the Kansas Association for Native American Education, the National Congress of the American Indians, and the National Indian Education Association and hundreds of other professional organizations connected to Indian country with elected positions and democratically approved statements. So this is a, this is a collaborative, collaboratively developed statement from the four tribes in Kansas, the four federally recognized tribes in Kansas. And so what we're doing here in this act of collaborative co-governance, since those tribal nations have students in our public schools, um, it's a really important layer of this to recognize that it's not, this is a national conversation. The two leading national bodies in the, in the country, the National Congress of the American Indians and National Indian Education Association have come up with, have, have passed resolutions democratically um, on this exact same issue. So lastly, uh, we recognize that the same issues that are connected to mascots are also found in our curricular infrastructures, and we are already in conversation with our advisory council trying to work on that as a parallel issue um, to do curricular reform. So our advisory council is working on that too. But again, I want to urge you to see how this has the potential to symbolize a new beginning for the state of Kansas, an era that begins the process of embracing the potential that can come from ongoing productive government to government collaborations with our native nations. And with that, I wanna step out of the way and make room for representatives from some of our tribal nations, because once again, it's their children that are in our schools. Thank you. And for the board members, we will listen to all the presentations and then have opportunities for questions. Chairman Rucknick. Welcome, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> uh, as you stated, my name is Joseph Rupnick. I'm chairman for Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation. And unlike my distinguished uh, presenter here, Alex Redcorn, I don't write anything down. So I have a tendency to stray off a track and probably will say something that's not appropriate, but I will do my best. <clears throat> I think we all know why we're here and what came about and why this is needed in the state of Kansas. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I walked in is that you guys have the uh, American flag displayed behind you. And I would guess that before every meeting, you probably say the American, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. And in that, I ask how many really understand what those words are? What do they mean? You know, one nation under God, indivisible. That means that we're not supposed to be divided. But I'm here to tell you today, we are divided. We're divided on many fronts. And when you look at us, and because we don't look like you, you know, we are separated or segregated out, whether by intentional actions or unintentional actions. Some of those that you have to think about too is when our students go to those schools, today is a lot different than it was yesterday. Today we have these. Today we have social media where bullying, harassing, and things like that are a lot easier to do behind a camera instead of coming up and addressing people in front like we are today. That makes a big difference. And that affects our kids' social and mental well-being all throughout their life. You know, uh, one of the comments that Mr. Watson had made, you know, where, where and, I, and I understand where you kind of embellish on a story and you kind of get wrapped up in everything like that. How many under or know when we actually were recognized as citizens of the United States? Anybody? 1925, before we were recognized as citizens of the United States. I have relatives that fought for this country under that flag before we were recognized as citizens, World War I, that gave their lives, their blood for this country. I too am a veteran. I'm a lifelong member of the VFW, 
I'm a lifelong member of the DAV, both of where I served and the injuries that I sustained. And I can tell you today, I have never felt more uh, pressure and or fear than I have today because of the politics and the division that we see in this state. One of the things that uh, we just attended a, a K-State meeting uh, yesterday with the Indigenous Peoples Day at K-State, and a young lady who was a lifelong member of the Manhattan School District. Um, she's on the uh, Leadership Council. I believe she's the chairman for Indigenous People Leadership Council there. Um, started, uh, started a uh, petition or started talking about changing the mascot in Manhattan. When she was relaying her story, you could see in her voice and what she was saying that she was traumatized. And she's going to carry that for the rest of her life. Her mother was afraid. They were receiving death threats and everything like that because those folks were saying, well, we've always been Indians and we're going to be Indians. They have no idea what it is to be an Indian. They have no idea what it is to walk in anybody else's shoes. Yet here we are with those folks trying to tell us how we're supposed to be, what we're supposed to do. Every day we have to battle where we are demonized across with some of those same comments. And, and just after we raised the issue because of the comments Mr. Watson made, not no more than 60 days later, we had a member, a lawmaker in the House of Representatives make another derogatory comment to a Native American lawmaker in the House of Representatives on the floor. Not less than 60 days. I understand that change is hard. And I know that many of you are sitting there going through your mind and you're like, oh God, please, let's move on. This doesn't affect me. But I'm here to tell you that you probably don't know. In those districts, because of the way Kansas extracts the information from many of the students that are in there, nine times out of 10, the easiest way that we're categorized is in the other column. We're always put in other. And so you don't know how many Native American students are in those different school districts that you represent. No idea. Kansas doesn't know. And I know that initially when we got this group together, that was the direction that we were looking at. Because there's you know, Title VI funding for those students that they're not taking advantage of. And so, uh, again, those are some of the things that we need to, to take into account. Our children, when we go to these different athletic events, they're the ones that are the brunt of the prejudice and the bigotry when they go there. They're the ones that have to absorb that, and they're the ones that have to live with that. Unlike these guys here where they went to public school, I graduated from a government boarding school. Another, you know, black mark in the history of the United States. But these guys right now, I'm thankful that they're able to stay home. They're able to be part of our community. They're able to participate in our ceremonies. However, going to school is still a challenge. And going to these different communities is a challenge. And so today, I'm asking you, and I know that before you all sat in that position, you raised your hand and took an oath to defend or to follow the Constitution of the United States. And does that following of that Constitution of the United States only carry for those that look like you and not like us? Are we still going to remain divided? Or should we take the necessary steps to start changing that mindset? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon again, everybody. 
It's uh, good to be here. Thank you for allowing us this time and this space. Um, wasn't really prepared to follow these two gentlemen here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best. Um, I'm going to ask you for a second, if you will, think about the most recognizable native mascot. When I say that, what comes to your mind? We all have a picture in our mind of what that is. Now, I'm going to put our young people on the spot here, and I want you to look at our, our young people and want you to see that we are people. We are humans, and we are proud. We are proud that we are still here. There were policies put in place hundreds of years ago that I don't think anybody in this room was probably part of, but we aren't supposed to be here, okay? We are not supposed to be here anymore. Kill the Indian, save the man. That was federal policy. Any rich lands, waterways, minerals, anything that was of value was taken away from us. You know, there's, there's all kinds of statistics, information about our demographic and our people. We have relatives, two states north of us here, they live in the poorest county in the United States. This county is in such bad shape that it is even worse than some of what you see from overseas in some of those other countries. And this is right here in the United States. We're in the year 2022, and, and we have relatives that are dealing with that because of policy that was enacted years ago. And that's what we're here for today. We're, we're here to talk about policy and how it affects our people. And I understand that the board here can only make a recommendation. You had no authority to force anything on any of the school districts within the state. But again, I appreciate your attention today and listening to, to what we want to talk about. So as Chairman Rupnick mentioned, uh, he's a veteran. When you look at our, our young people here in front of you today, our families have fought in every military conflict that has ever been on this soil. And we can take that all the way back to the initial contact. Every military conflict that was fought on this soil, our members, Potawatomi, have been a part of. Okay, as the chairman mentioned, you know, we've got the most treaties with the United States government out of any other tribe in the nation, okay? And, and I want to um, share a, a little bit of history about that. We had an opportunity in a battle where we, one of our warriors wounded George Washington. Okay, that could have been a major turning point for this country had that individual been successful in that battle, right? Um, but as we all know, Mr. Washington survived and things progressed. I wanna share with you a little bit more history, more recent. Um, we have a relative who uh, had homelands in the state of Illinois. He was a friend of President Lincoln. He was a friend of Tecumseh, and he was with Tecumseh when he was mortally wounded in battle. And at that moment, he made a decision to not fight the government anymore after that. And what he did was another major turning point in the history of this country because what he did was similar to the, uh, the story of Paul Revere. He knew through uh, some of the, I guess, informants, if you will, what was about to take place because Black Hawk was about to come through the state of Illinois and wipe out every um, white, excuse me, uh, community that there was within the state. He had formed a large enough alliance to come through and do that. But what our relative did was he went and he warned those, those, those little cities and those communities. He said, look, this is what's coming. And if you don't take cover now, you know, there's, there's a, uh, uh, life and death seriousness to, to what's going on. And so he did that, and that saved uh, numerous people, saved a couple of forts in the state. And again, that's how he became a friend of Lincoln because of the actions that he took. He, took, he did that to preserve his people. He was tired of fighting. He saw what kept happening over and over again. And these are some of our relatives uh, from history. And, you know, they, they like, like we said, We've, we've had veterans in every military conflict on this country. 
Um, and so again, you know, thinking about our young people, when I look in this room here and I, and I see the young people that came down today, um, I want you to know that they are battling also. And in their short lives, they've probably seen more frontline as far as mental and emotional battles than a lot of us that are adults here in this room. Uh, I'll speak on behalf of my daughter over here. When she was about six years old, she was on the front lines to stand up for our language. Our language is endangered, and there was a movement at the time that was gonna even uh, further hinder our ability to access and to learn and to take part in our language. Six years old, a couple years after that, we were up at uh, North Dakota. She was battling for our water at Standing Rock. Our water is put in jeopardy by the interests of corporations and businesses to further profit. And as we all know today, when we look at Lake Mead, look at some of those bigger lakes out west, that water is drying up. It's even happening to our aquifer out here in western Kansas. And she was there, standing up for our water. And now here she is today, standing up for herself and for her relatives that are here with her to let you guys know that we are here, we are human, we are people, and this practice is outdated and it's unacceptable. 13 years old, and she's already experienced all that in her life. And to her credit, she does it because she knows the importance of it. So again, you know, how do we move forward, right? That's, that's what we're here to discuss today. Um, we are um, citizens of our own nations. And it is through those old policies, the reason why we are where we are today. Majority of our Prairie Band Potawatomi children attend public schools. And in that, you know, we, we have a separate status under the United States, right? Where we are uh, sovereign, right? We're, we're independent domestic sovereigns uh, under the United States, which gives us a different status, right? So when we're talking about data and information and when we check the boxes, you know, we have a political status here within the United States that is often overlooked also. And that is maybe one of the things that we can work towards correcting. Because of that status, that is a benefit, you know, not only financially for those districts that take advantage of the programs to, to supplement those funds, but also I would say for, for the other students. It enriches their experiences. It enriches their lives that they get to interact with and learn about other kids that are kids too. We just happen to be fortunate enough to have a different background, and we share that. We share that openly, especially at Royal Valley. They've been really good about sharing that. Um, you know, so I, I would just ask all of you today, again, I understand you cannot force any district to take any action, but you and all of your positions, your leaders, you were elected and selected to your positions for a reason, and it's because of your leadership qualities and abilities that you've shown. So I would ask you today to be those leaders, adopt the recommendation to put out to the rest of the state that this is unacceptable and we must move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. Um, I've learned so much working on this uh, working group and um, I've just had a wonderful time um, getting to work with um, people from the different tribes across the state as well as um, educational leaders and other um, leaders. So something you may hear and may even think yourselves is that when you have a native mascot, you are in some way honoring or respecting our cultures. 
there is actually a University of Michigan study that came out in 2020 that found that among Native Americans who frequently engage in tribal or cultural practices, 67% of them find the um, Washington former Washington R words um, team name and mascot offensive. 70% found sports fans wearing um, headdresses offensive. 65% find sports fans chanting the tomahawk chop offensive. And 73% find sports fans imitating Native American dances offensive. I can guarantee that every single person sitting behind me here finds those things offensive. The thing is that we all, everyone in this room, is hoping for all of our students to have an opportunity to learn in a completely distraction-free learning environment. I mean, that's what we all want. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't happen for those of us that um, are in public schools and are experiencing mascots such as these. It, mascots like these um, negatively impact self-confidence of Native students, and they actually increase the depression rates among Native American students. Uh, Native American youth suicide rates are two and a half times higher than the general population. Now, I find these things sad and horrific, and experiencing them also sad and horrific. But what we have the opportunity here today to do, and in November to do, is to change that for all of us and actually be leaders. We have an opportunity as the state of Kansas to be a leader nationally. Things are changing nationally. Just recently, all, there were hundreds of names of, native, of places that had offensive native names changed across the whole United States. Um, you've seen, like I said, the Washington R Word team, they've changed their mascot. This is just where we are. This is where we're going. And I think it's a really great opportunity for us leaders in the state of Kansas to move forward and to be an example for other states. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so my name is Eric Davis. <clears throat> I'm the superintendent at Royal Valley, just north of Topeka here. And I'm proud to serve the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation in my job as the school superintendent. Um, I'm here today to um, speak on behalf of the students in my district and the Native American students across the state of Kansas because I found recently there aren't a lot of people standing up for these kids. As Dr. Dr. Redcorn mentioned earlier, there are over 10,000 Native students enrolled in the Kansas public school system. In this past year, <clears throat> it has come to, ugh, in this past year, it has come to my attention that these 10,000 students are invisible to a portion of the state, including some of its leaders. The way the United States government has historically treated tribal nations is one of the major reasons that these students appear invisible. The native student population is widely spread throughout the state due to intentional acts to separate families and strip them of their language, their culture, and their lands. The purpose, these purpose, purposeful acts are a dark mark in our history. Our school specifically does not have a native themed mascot. However, the stereotypes of mascots have directly had an impact on our native students. We've experienced the tomahawk chop at the conclusion of a competition where we lost and it was simply done to make fun of the native players on the field or on the court. This wasn't 10 years ago, it wasn't five years ago, this was two years ago. All right, we hear the opposing student sections doing war cries from across the gymnasium. This imagery, these acts, and the lack of education around, surrounding Native Americans in Kansas creates an unsafe environment for my students. The Kansas State Board of Education does not have the power to change history, but you can begin today by helping other fellow Kansans see that there are present day Native American students in the state. These students should not be viewed as caricatures to be laughed at or to be taunted. These students have a right to attend a school or a school activity without having to see these images on display. I don't believe that these schools are purposefully acting to create an unsafe environment for the Kansas students, but I do believe that there is a lack of understanding and how these images impact others. There may be districts that say they're honoring, honoring Native American students by using these mascots, but the four federally recognized tribes in the state of Kansas have approved this document before you today asking for reform. The four federally recognized tribes are not honored by these practices. I'm asking for your support today to start the process of making the 10,000 Native students across the state and the 303 Native students in my district visible. 
Help us by start educating Kansas about the contemporary Native American population and how these images have a negative impact on our state. Encourage students or districts to co collaboratively talk with our four tribal nations about these issues and come up with a solution. Support the Casey Work Group statement and help, these, and help facilitate the change that we need in this state. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carol Cadu Blackwood. Uh, I would first like to thank Chairman Jim Porter and Vice Chair Janet Waugh and fellow board members for this opportunity to be here today. I'm an enrolled member of the federally recognized tri Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas and affiliated with the Prairie Band Potawatomi Tribe in Kansas. I'm also a licensed social worker in Kansas and hold certificates in Missouri. My education, my education was matriculated in Lawrence, Kansas, where I attended Lawrence, Kansas Public Schools, Lawrence Public Schools, USD 497, K through 12, and hold a degree from Haskell Indian Nations University and two from the University of Kansas. In accordance with the 2015 Every Student Succeeds Act, which requires extensive outreach and genuine agreement, engagement efforts to everyone from policymakers to educators to tribal organizations to parents. The 2021 Governor's Commission on Racial Equity and Justice Report for Social De Determinants of Health stated that the time is right for the state of Kansas to take intentional, intentional steps to remove the use of Native American mascots and related imagery in public education settings. Furthermore, the commission recommended to review and eliminate the use of Native American mascots imagery and names by educational institutions and sports teams unless used by a tribal school or education educational institution. I ask this board as a parent, a member of the Kikapu tribe in Kansas, a licensed social worker and a substance abuse worker, as counselor, to remove the practice of using Native American mascots and imagery immediately. A 2014 study uh, completed by the Health and Human Services Department um, state found that our students, the 22% 20, uh, of the youth in that study had, um, had PTSD at the same rates as soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, which is also the triple the rate of the general population. I'm sorry, that's um, hard for me to read every time because these are just not numbers on, on, on paper. These are people. So I ask you to, to, to um, stop this in practice immediately. A 2020 publication in the Race, Ethnicity, and Education Journal described a comprehensive review of the studies on the psychological, the socio-social effects of Native-themed mascots. They are psychologically detrimental to Native American students. For non-Native persons, they are associated with negative stereotypes of Native Americans. These mascots undermine intergroup relations by increasing negative stereotyping of Native Americans. Lastly, supporters of these mascots are more apt to believe prejudicial ideas. Now, I don't fault those who may have misconceptions or prejudicial beliefs for those who may believe tornadoes are worse than Indians or we all carry tomahawks. This may be due largely in part to a lack of Native American curriculum in schools. The state of Kansas can do better to educate our future leaders and lawmakers today. One goal can be to begin in the creation of study, setting standards for indigenous curriculum. This will ensure all students across Kansas, including Garden City, Coffeyville, and Topeka will become educated for working with tribal governments. I strongly urge this board to discontinue the practice for Native Americans and imagery for mascots immediately. Again, as a licensed social worker, Kickapoo tribal member, and an elected board of education for Lawrence, Kansas. And I'm also a, um, a social worker for the Kansas City Indian Center. And they have expressed full support for my being here today. I love Kansas, but I'm not sure if it loves me as much as I love it. My tribe was forcibly removed from ancestral territory in the Ohio Valley and placed us in Kansas long before statehood. I met my husband in one of the finest institutions, Lawrence High School. We have three children and we have raised all of them and they are now adult children. We only want our children and grandchildren to experience a learning experience, experience free from institutional racism. And this can be done. I successfully led a name change campaign for Billy Mills Middle School in Lawrence, Kansas. It is the first public school in America to be renamed after a Native American, let alone living. So I know that the cost can be minimal. Thank you, miigwech.
Good afternoon, and I want to reiterate, like everybody else has said, uh, I want to thank you for allowing us to come and have this space. Uh, my name is Dal Dombo. I am the director for the Native American Indian Education Program for the Wichita Public Schools, and I've been asked to come here uh, to speak about the process that we did uh, to remove uh, the derogatory mascot at one of our high schools. Uh, in regards to how we approached it, um, Initially, I sent a letter to our Board of Education uh, through the summer and asked them uh, to have an earnest conversation about the mascot. Um, this mascot issue has kind of lingered in Wichita for uh, decades. Ever since I've been in school, I'm a USD 259 product. I graduated from West High, and as they stated here today, the mascot at North High has always kind of been a lightning rod in the community. So when I had made this request, it was brought to the board. Uh, and the committee, after they, uh, they saw that it was something that they wanted to take up, so they ordered a committee to be formed uh, to address the all the aspects of the issues surrounding this particular mascot. The committee was made up of teachers, administrators, a student representative from North High, as well as an alumnus, myself, an elder and spiritual leader in the Indian community, as well as the Indian uh, Education uh, Director at uh, Mid-America All Indian Museum. We met monthly over the school year and explored all aspects of this particular mascot. Uh, topics covered uh, North High's history. We went over the history of the mascot name itself, why and how this and other mascots are offensive and the perception of Native American mascots and the impact it has on Native American students and how they dehumanize us as a people, which in turn allows others to see us as subhuman. Our committee met monthly and at the end of the school year, we presented our recommendations to the school board. The first recommendation was basically to ask them to remove this offensive mascot. After that, the secondary to that was we asked the board to follow and adhere to its own district policies pertaining to school themes that is already put in place. And that policy states that building principals are responsible for the development of school themes, songs, flags, mascots, etc. The principal is particularly responsible for determining that these themes are not offensive to minority ethnic groups within the school. Thank you. You. Bojo Minogishko Kwe. I would just like to thank Chairman Jim Porter and Vice Chair Janet Waugh and fellow board members for giving me the opportunity to speak here. My name is Georgia Blackwood, and I am an enrolled member of the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas, as well as affiliated with the Prairie Band Potawatomi Tribe as well as the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. I was born and raised in Lawrence, Kansas. I graduated from Lawrence, Kansas, and I am currently a freshman at, the at Haskell Indian Nations University. Growing up with Native American imagery has made me feel like my culture is a joke to non-Native Americans. It made me feel like non-Native Americans uh, had already preconceived notions of me just from seeing their taunting depictions of my people. Along with that, I feel that the defense and support of these blatantly racist depictions let me know that my op opinions aren't valid and that what I have to say is not being taken into consideration. I didn't feel respected as an athlete. I didn't feel respected as a student. And I didn't feel respected as a human. I have felt and seen the actions and in inactions of implicit and explicit bias. I have encountered adults who have already had preconceived notions about me based on my ethnicity. When I had I lobbied numerous times at our state capitol across the street. I lobbied successfully for the passage of the regalia bill, or known as House Bill 2498, which prohibits schools or public institutions from prohibiting Native Americans from students from wearing our regalia to formal functions and such as graduations. Imagine my disbelief and disgust when a Senate committee me member, <laughs> member asked if we were going to carry weapons at our graduations. I have lobbied for the state to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day on Kansas's birthday. The bill was deemed as too controversial, as if acknowledging state legislators deemed that acknowledging Indigenous Peoples Day 
indigenous people were too, was too controversial. Kansas loves Native Americans in our public intuition, institutions. It, sorry. Kansas loves Native American imagery in our public institutions, but where is that same representation and support for our indigenous students? The American Psychological Association has published numerous articles on the negative social and emotional outcomes that our mascots have on our youth. I urge this com committee to acknowledge the racism against Native American peoples and to act on it. By stopping the use of Native American mascots and imagery, I urge this committee as a member of the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas and as a lifelong resident and lover of Kansas. Thank you, McWitch. So I just wanted to add, like, as we kind of wrap this up, and um, I wanted to to commend the three schools and the school districts in Kansas, uh, Shawnee Mission Schools, Atchison, and uh, Wichita, because um, the decisions to do these things do often come with a lot of um, pushback from community members, and I just want to commend those schools for the work they've done. And um, I think if we take a moment to, as we had the, the tribal leaders speak to um, some of the histories, so if we just take a moment to recognize that the entire land base of the state of Kansas which taxes are derived from that fund our institutions were taken from Indian people. And so if we can for a moment recognize knowing that this is not gonna fix all that, but lots of small things like this are at least small first steps to moving us in a better direction and uh, closing up some of the divisions that we have that we all inherited really, we inherited these things. And so um, in this moment, I think uh, this seems like a pretty good first step um, in building a new future for the state of Kansas. So just wanna say that much. Um, I wanna wrap things up by um, asking you uh, within the, by the time we meet again that if you haven't done it already to get the statement out, if you look at the digital format, there are a lot of links that will lead you to research and statements and reports that I think you'll find very interesting and informative. Um, next month, and I'll have to talk to the chairman about this, I do plan to bring back a motion. It'll either be a motion or a resolution asking the board to adopt and affirm the actions that are described in this statement. And I wanna give you just a few things to think about why I believe as State Board of Education members, we need to take this action. Recognizing that you know the choice of mascots is a local decision, and we have no authority really to tell people what to do, I, I believe we should make a strong recommendation for several reasons. First, our KISA accreditation system requires that districts provide a safe climate and culture in our diversity, equity, and inclusion foundational structures that cannot be accomplished if Native American students, more than well over more than 90% of whom attend our Kansas public schools, are forced to endure, endure ridicule for their culture and race. Second, both the state legislature and the board have addressed bullying in schools and set out requirements and recommendations to eliminate bullying. It is clear from the research and from the testimony that the use of Indian themed mascots and branding can create an environment and does create an environment hostile to Native American students and it must be addressed. Even if the intent is to honor Native American cultures, it is not welcomed. It may also very well be that when districts start this conversation and review their own policies and procedures, they will find that having Indian themed mascots and branding violates their very own policies and procedures. Further, we have not been asked once but twice to address this issue, both from the Kansas Association for um, Native American Education and the Governor's Commission on Racial Equity and Justice. They both re recommend the removal of Indian themed mascots and branding. Finally, I think the board should make a strong recommendation in light of recognition of the sovereignty of the four Kansas tribes that serve on our KC working group making this request. We believe, and I do too, that the board and the school district should take this concern seriously and start a discussion toward action immediately. 
And with that, Mr. Chair, um, I or anybody on the working group would be glad to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate that. And we do have, we'll have some questions, I'm sure. Betty? Thank you. And it's actually not a question. It's a, it's a statement. I am very, very appreciative of the learning experience that this has been for me. As an African American, I know how easy it is to get caught up in those problems that consume my race or our race without even thinking elsewhere. So I say that to say, listening to your concerns has taught me so much. And I respect and appreciate the way that you have come forward. This is something that probably should have been done a long time ago, but uh, that's in the past. Looking forward, I'm appreciative that you, you did so. Um, when this first started, I, I, I took the liberty of, of looking back at uh, some things that uh, were pointed out and I was amazed. And I know ignorance should not be an excuse. But clearly, there are so many people that have just not stopped to think about what this is saying to someone else, how this is hurting someone else. And your coming forward with this statement points that out. Ignorance is not an excuse. So I thank you. I appreciate the information. I really wouldn't have to wait to next month to affirm what you're saying, but if that's how we have to do it, that's how we have to do it. But thank you so much. Jim. Thank you very much for your presentations. <clears throat> I've lived by a philosophy that if I find out that something that I'm doing hurts, harms, insults another person or persons, whether I believe what I was doing was okay, is not okay, and I need to change. Thank you for bringing this issue before us. It has taught us that we have much to learn and what I've learned today is we need to change. So thank you. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Thank you all for being here. I'm gonna say the same thing. You have my deepest gratitude for being willing to let us be part of this conversation. Dr. Redcorn, I appreciate the many things that you've included and invited us to. Um, I, I feel, I have learned so much. I feel for my children who haven't had the opportunity yet to learn some of the things that I learned. Um, I've got an eighth grader right now and a 10th grader. And so the eighth grader just finished the, the Kansas portion of history. And I went through that textbook. We just, we just got a brand new textbook and there's so much that's missing. And it's so hard to look at what they're being taught, which is minimal. Um, so I just wanna say, Thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn. Um, thank you for the opportunity that I know is coming for Kansas kids. I, I deeply appreciate it. And um, Al, I don't know where you went, um, but I, I was one of those Wichita North kids as well. And I just want to say, um, I don't miss the mascot. It was a wonderful thing. And I look forward to the day that we can eliminate those mascots from all Kansas schools, which I hope is very, very soon. You have my full support. Thank you. Ann. Now, I'll bet everybody has a question they're scared to ask, so don't be scared to ask questions. I think we spent, we spent a lot of the first two meetings just going, is that the right word I'm supposed to be using? Is it Native American, indigenous? I don't know. So don't be afraid to ask a question. I'll just ask one I, I know comes up uh, to people I brought this up to, and maybe Dr. Redcorn or Ray, for somebody can address it. But sometimes you'll hear school districts say, well, you know, we have Native Americans in town, and they don't mind that, you know, we're the Braves or, or whatever. How, what do you have to say to, to those folks? 
So that's one of the reasons I included. Um, it's a it's a good question. It does come up, but that's one of the reasons I included um, that this is in line with uh, statements from the National Congress of the American Indians, the National Indian Education Association, and the Kansas Association for Native American Education, along with literally hundreds of other professional organizations. Um, but even more than that, as well, <clears throat> there's. Indian identity is kind of a, a very complicated thing. It's a gradient that's um, that we could spend a week talking about the different layers of citizenship, non-citizenship, um, blood quantum, cultural connections. There's all kinds of stuff in there. But um, one of the things in um, the study that uh, I believe Carol was bringing up is, um, so there is work that says like the, um, the majority of American Indians are against mascots. but that is also connected to work that says, um, I think they use the phrase identity centrality. The more closely that people identify with the cultural norms and customs and the traditions, um, the more likely they are to oppose American Indian mascots. And so what's important about that is, um, talking about these boarding schools, we have generations of people that were sent to boarding schools and the whole goal was to kill the Indian, save the man. And so why would we be surprised that we have people that are um, enrolled members of federally recognized tribes that really don't have a co uh, connection to their culture. And so there are people that show up sometimes and say, well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I got this membership card and I'm not opposed to this. Um, and so those are some of the layers that communities are going to have to talk through and try to understand. Um, but that's why it's a, I think it's important to lean on the confidence that we're in line with, if we do this, we're in line with the Kansas Association of Native American Ed, the National Indian Ed Association, and the National Congress of American Indians. We discussed, too, there's a difference between having some Native American in town think this is okay and actually having a reason to say you're honoring, you know, the tribes in some way. In other words, I think we talked about having a relationship or... Yeah, and they need to build relationships. So, so, so that's part of this as well, is having an actual tribal relationship. So for the most part, uh, there's a quote that... Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, American Indians are everywhere but nowhere at the same time. You see our names, Shawnee County, Osage County. You see, it, see them everywhere, but the mascot is kind of that same thing, where it's this kind of empty shell, and all it really carries with it tends to be stereotypical stuff. And so um, some people attach to that in different ways, but yeah. Yeah, I was really struck yesterday um, by the young lady I think was brought up. She's the president of the Native American Student Association there in Manhattan. And I guess for they may have changed it, but for a long time there was just this silly caricature was their mascot. And she said she refused as a Native American student to even join clubs or go out for sports because she did not want to wear that mascot anywhere on her or be called an Indian um, in Manhattan. And she said people have actually moved out of town. Be uh, Native Americans have moved out of Manhattan because of that. So I think, um, you know, it's the things you don't see below the surface, too, that are hurting. And I think if this board can do anything to stop kids from hurting, we ought to take that action. Yeah, and I think, to, to your point earlier, one of the, one of the key things to, I, I believe people should stay focused on is we have this issue of, like, oh, let's look at the images and let's start comparing them all. And if you get lost in that conversation, like which one's more racist than other names, then you're missing the point of what the research says, no matter if it's honorable looking imagery or not, and how it's also attached to these curricular infrastructures where we're not really learning anything else about American Indians. And that's why that's also a parallel thing that our advisory committee is looking to tackle as well. Well, I want to thank you. I need to... The reason that we're going to vote next month is because our procedure and policies are that it is presented one month that they have plenty of time to have discussion, and then uh, we rarely if, uh, rarely do anything other than have a presentation one month. And Ann said she's going to have something. It will be on the agenda as an action item next month. I've had in the last couple, three or four, well, since we've been having this discussion, I've had the opportunity to visit uh, a couple of times with uh, Chairman Rupnick and Councilman Wawasik. And I don't know whether they realized it or not, but I realized how ignorant I was. And they have, and I appreciate their tolerance of me, 
uh, because they've taught me a whole lot. Uh, and what I've heard today uh, is, well, first of all, our vision is for Kansas to lead the world in the success of each student. And we have policies and procedures in school districts that are not consistent with that vision with 10,000 students. Uh, and so I will assure you that I am in support of the of the, and uh, and you know my vote will be there, uh, and uh, I sincerely hope as as many of you have said, uh, we do not have the authority to tell X school district USD XXX what uh, what they can do, but we do in fact have influence, and we are as has been pointed out we have been elected as leaders. And I hope that we step forward and take that leadership position because it is obvious. If it's not, it, it has become every time somebody made every time somebody made a statement, it became more obvious that it is negatively affecting some of the students. And if we believe in education for all, we better put our money where our mouth is. Thank you so much. Anybody else have anything? If not, I guess we'll see you next month. <laughs> Wait, we know. Thank you. Motion would be in order to approve the consent agenda minus C, D, H, and J. Betty makes that motion. Melanie seconds that motion. Discussion? And that. <coughs> Is it? We're doing C, D, H, and J first? Or the no, we are everything doing but those? with the exception of C, D, H, okay, and so. J. Um, I have more information that I received. Do I need to just pull those as far as the, the two that I pulled out, or the four that I pulled out? Right now we're voting on those to others. Okay. Okay, yeah. All in favor? Thank you. And now a motion to be in order to approve C, D, H, and J after the motion is made and seconded, then it will be time for discussion. Betty and Dina. Discussion, okay. So the two so the two I have more information on would be um, items 16H and 16J. I will go ahead and vote uh, with, uh, for those. It's, it's C <coughs> and D I will still vote against. Okay, we, but according to our, we don't have that option now. Okay. The, the motion is for C, D, H, and J, so you'll have to decide. We can't. Okay. We oh, we, we okay. split. We split them at the beginning. We can't. We can't split them out now. Okay. Okay. All in favor? All opposed? Okay. That motion is nine two one. Thank you very much. And at this time, it is the uh, chair's report. Are there additions to? It, are there additions to the travel? Dina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I need to add, now I can't find my, um, 
Anyway, it is the day before, what is it, the 19th, uh, the, the conference the begins. Okay, it would be the 18th. That is a regional um, Acacia Board of Directors meeting that will be held in Salina. Anybody that, that'll be it. Okay. Janet. I'd like to add uh, two days to the uh, the meeting in Wichita also. Anybody else? Ann and then Ben. Thank you. Sorry, but I know Barbara works so hard to get us <laughs> get this stuff in. But I totally forgot about the uh, Indigenous Peoples Day yesterday at K-State, so. Ben. Um, the, getting the email into Barbara last week was kind of lost in the middle of my life last week. Um, I just need to add October 13th this week uh, for a legislative meeting Thursday plus a uh, visit to a Buncey Schools on the way home on Thursday. Anything else? Jim. I don't know if I have down November 18th for the uh, Kansas Leeds Conference, a conference in Dodge City, Friday and Saturday. And you have a list of those of us that are going to be the KSB thing. The KSB. Yeah. The, uh, yes. Yeah. So you make sure they're all. Yes. They're all added. Yeah. That actually, yeah, I was planning. I was going to. Yeah. Have Anything else? Yeah. That, we'll add that. Anything else? Not a motion to be in order to approve the travel. Dina makes that motion, and Betty seconds that motion. Discussion. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries unanimously, I guess. If I'm going to ask for discussion, I would at least give you more than three seconds to do that. Legislative liaison report. It is now. <laughs> Last time. Okay. Uh, we did not receive, neither one of us received any suggestions from any of you. So we will be setting down and um, subtracting things that have already been dealt with and um, maybe adding some things that have been said today that I think might be appropriate to include and uh, we will bring that back to you next month okay and whenever you do that would you go ahead and give it to Barbara so she can send it out to us in advance uh, we will certainly and, do that uh, and then we need to make sure that we have time for discussion on the agenda when we put and if agenda anyone together. wants to um, add something later I mean uh, Ben and I will still consider your idea okay thank you committees and thank you I was just gonna say you know we still haven't had that discussion on how we might respond to some of the legislation that was passed this spring so I'd like to make sure we get that done yeah, we need to make sure that's on the agenda also. For yeah. Um, we'll be here on that Thursday it, next time. In terms of our KC working group, uh, we've got several other things we're working on. I think the next thing up will be a, a recommendation on data gathering uh, to try to um, improve the way we gather data on students so we'll know where Native American students are and maybe even what tribes they're from. Um, for a lot of different reasons, 
we'll talk about, but I'm not sure that has to come to the board. We're gonna send it to the data, what do they call it, the data governing board, who makes the decisions on how these things are changed. Um, then we're also working on a curriculum. We're looking at curriculum from around the country and um, a couple other things. Oh, and maybe even down the road having some, you know, government to government uh, memorandums of understanding about how things will work as we are working with four sovereign nations uh, trying to figure out some things. So anyway, lots of work to be done. We'll meet again this Friday. Okay. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Yes, you may. Oh, wait a minute. And I, when, yeah. When's the transition happening from the work group to the permanent committee? Well, I think uh, we think uh, the only thing left not in place is um, representatives from the out-of-state tribes. But we have a method in place now to get those chosen. Um, if you go back to our original document, we wanted somebody. We have a lot of students in Kansas who aren't in the four recognized tribes, but they're here like Osage. A lot, a lot of those are located in southeast Kansas. So um, we have a lot of interest from other states in weighing in on uh, curriculum and that kind of thing. So it's, I think after we get those folks on board, maybe for a couple of meetings, see how they get integrated, then we're going to move to a formal. So I'd say mid next year. It won't be the three years that we were first talking about. We're ready. I think after we get a couple more things done to move to the permanent group. Any other committee reports? If not, Mr. Ferguson. The topic for my presentation today is on uh, fentanyl and I will tie that in um, to a legal perspective um, based on some research. Um, it just happens to be something that is being mentioned a lot by not just political candidates, but um, I've just happened to have had a lot of intersections in life and professional uh, interaction and uh, I'm interested in this subject and am very um, concerned about it um, because I think it's a, it's a, it's, it's an extremely um, uh, important issue. So a little bit of my soapbox, but as to re to relay it to the board and uh, the legal issues, um, annually the Kansas Attorney General issues a number of reports that I've referred to um, in the past, and there is a uh, specific board called the State Child Death Review Board that the Kansas Attorney General um, uh, supervisors or, or is in charge of putting together. Uh, they recently issued a report that's published on the Attorney General's website. Uh, interestingly, there is a representative from the uh, agency and the uh, Kansas State Board of Education uh, that, that is appointed to that board. Uh, that representative's name is Kim Jones. She's a uh, RN and BSN, a school nurse, and so she's a representative on that particular board, so you have representation from this agency. Uh, I'm, I think it, the way it reads is the commissioner makes that appointment. Um, the, I, I found that to be, I found a couple things to be interesting because when I read the, my, just like you get your weekly and monthly notifications from different, um, uh, publications and trade organizations, I'm seeing a lot of notification that either at state level or at district level, um, they are equipping, sco equipping schools with Narcan and other um, uh, what they call emergency opioid antagonistic protocols. And they are either funding or permitting uh, Narcan to be used in schools, and I'm just seeing that just uh, almost exponentially in terms of, of of the notifications about actions. Of course, it's also um, overshadowed by the number of deaths that you're seeing in schools related to headlines related to athletes and students, and whether it's you know, and that's that's I guess to tie it back into the state child death review board. Um, the conclusion was that. 
uh, children between the ages of three and 17, overall deaths have declined, but the category of deaths related to um, drug overdose, particularly uh, fentanyl, have dramatically increased and are continuing to increase. Um, a couple interesting things about the um, statutes that relate to um, what this uh, terminology, emergency opioid antagonist protocol, which is essentially emergency measures to mitigate um, opioid or uh, uh, fentanyl uh, use is that the pharmacy board has certain has a, a statute that 65-16 comma 127 that um, gives immunity to school nurses, pharmacists, and all a lot of other categories, first responders, if there is a um, harm caused by administering uh, Narcan to a, a, a victim or other, I, I think there are others, but the common um, is that's being being referred to as the, is the Narcan spray or shot or pills to give to uh, a victim. Uh, I, in reviewing that statute, it, it it attempts to target mostly first responders and school nurses, professional nurses who are licensed by the Board of Nursing and employed by a school district, but it also provides immunity to bystanders. And bystander is defined in the statute, means a family member, a friend, a caregiver, or other person in a position to assist a person who the family member, friend, caregiver, or other person believes in good faith to be experiencing an opioid overdose. So I think that the, by the language of that statute, it's broadly stated, and I think it would provide immunity for anybody who, who administers um, Narcan um, or other opioid antagonistic uh, mitigation measures. Um, the other reason why this is, this is timely is because um, the, there are a number of other funds that are set up um, led by the Office of the Attorney General uh, and, and in 2022, a number of press releases have identified that $200 million in settlements have been uh, achieved by the state of Kansas from the various um, opioid uh, uh, companies, uh, and that's just a share that is expected to be received by the uh, state of Kansas. In distributing that money over a very long period of time, uh, much like the tobacco settlements in, in the years past, uh, there's a separate organization called the Kansas Fights Addiction, or excuse me, there's a statute referred to as the Kansas Fights Addiction Act, and there's a grant review board that is set up and, and um, uh, carried out by the uh, Kansas Attorney General for the purpose of uh, distributing the $200 million in settlements over a long period of time. Um, I thought it was interesting how they determine, you know, how that those funds um, are distributed, but there's two separate funds that the Re Grant Review Board will um, manage and um, filter the, the application, the grant applications that come in. Kansas Fights Addiction Fund is a fund that 75% of the money collected will be distributed. And then there's a separate fund where, which 25% of the money uh, uh, that is collected will go into the municipalities fight addiction fund. And so municipalities, it, it would include any government uh, subdivision. So cities, counties, and, and school districts are considered political subdivisions of the state and they would fall within this fund. Um, many times when you look at the purpose of the money, how it's going to be distributed in the future, of course, much of it has to do with uh, treatment, uh, as you would expect, but a large port, well, I should say a, a portion, not a large portion. The large, largest portion is aimed at uh, prevent, prevention and treatment, but uh, there is a portion that is um, expected to go towards mitigation. And mitigation includes reducing the effects of substance, excuse me, substance abuse and addiction and 
the effects have to do with overdoses and, and deaths. So uh, I anticipate that there is gonna be a substantial amount of money that would be available uh, to school districts as not only as they are members of the Mun municipalities fight addiction fund that is set aside directly for political subdivisions of the state, but in other grants that they might submit in the years to come. And uh, so I think it's, uh, I just kind of give that not only to, to educate myself, but to educate the board about this particular legal issue. And I think it's, it's uh, on the horizon to, um, as a public service announcement, to help school districts and um, boards and other municipalities think about ways that they can uh, tap into those resources uh, in the future. That's my report. Thank you, sir. Uh, the uh, Sometime later this week, all of you will receive from Wendy Fritz the evaluation of the uh, commissioner, the uh, uh, secretary, uh, administrator, and, and the attorney. And I would ask that everybody to fill those out uh, electronically and get them back to me by October the 28th. That's about a week and a half. Uh, to give time to to comply with that. Uh, tomorrow, the ESSER votes will be right after the approval of the agenda. So it'll be the first thing on the agenda before uh, before the presentation of the Teachers of the Year. Uh, We've been asked to make recommendations for the Kansas Advisory Committee for Career and Technical Education. Uh, and... Uh, you should, we, I, we received that application on the 7th. So now, request for future agenda items. Betty. Um, before I make that request, I wanna give kind of a brief introduction, simply because I'm not sure of the format or who would be giving us the information. Um, and this has to do with um, parent-teacher conferences, because many times um, the misnomer is there, parents don't attend. And that's such an antiquated process, simply because most parents have access to what's called parent view. They know in real time what's going on with their students, communicate with, with the teachers, um, have some kind of plan of action or, or whatever. Uh, many parents use this as a vehicle. And because that's in place, I would expect that that has a lot to do with why a number of parents don't duplicate and go to um, a parent-teacher conference. Because of that, and in talking uh, uh, with the Commissioner, he was talking about uh, an innovative approach that Emporia took, which I was fascinated with that, in that it wasn't a conference about um, your child is either passing famously well or flunking famously well, but an opportunity for parents and teachers to talk about the, di the direction or the path that their student might be going in. I thought that was very, very interesting and probably um, is more in line with that uh, individualized plan of study that we talk about so often, how we want to get parents involved in that. I'm not sure how we would alter or change that process or look at the fact that maybe we need to redefine conferences to be something totally different because as the average parent, um, if I already have that information, then I'm not gonna make the effort to go out a second time to receive the same information. Um, so that might be, that might account to why we have a lot of AWOL parents. So with that being said, I don't know how we would present this, but I sure would like an opportunity to hear about that. 
I perceive that Randy has a So maybe a start, uh, because we obviously could invite Britton Hart, who was the principal at Emporia High when they made that shift. But um, <clears throat> it was several years ago when they made that change. But Janet and uh, Michelle have, have talked from time to time about volunteers. So we are queued up next month to have Jane Groff come talk about volunteers, talk about parental engagement, and, and, and the work because we pay through our TASN network to have a parental information network. I think that would be a good opportunity, Betty, to start that conversation. Okay. Uh, along with any other volunteer parental uh, engagement type of things that you have. And then from there, I think we could go into very specific things. Okay. And I heard about Emporia because they made a presentation at our annual conference a few years back. And what they did was they really beefed up and um, they changed the whole way that they do individual plan of study. And they assigned uh, groups of like 12 to 14 kids to one teacher and they would be with them all throughout high school. And so that teacher, like one day a week, maybe they would have a career topic and, and they would work on their individual plans of study and then they would use it for homeroom and stuff too. But they made the kids responsible for keeping track of their individual plan of study and making sure that they were signing up for the classes they needed to get to the goal. And they changed those parent-teacher conferences to student-led. So the student had to explain to the parent what their individual plan was and whether or not they were on track. And they said their parent-teacher conferences went from 30% participation to over 80, just you know, for that. So maybe one way to get the word out is to talk more about them at our annual conference and share those what's working kind of ideas about how to get parents engaged. I think that's, that's great hearing that. I thank you for that. And it really would be exciting to get started on something like this. And, and to follow up on what Ann said, uh, I've had several anecdotes about the same thing, that, uh, that when students are leading the conferences, uh, they're much better pretending. And my, my own grandchildren uh, have to lead their own conferences. And, uh, Michelle. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Uh, for future agenda, just to um, reiterate as far as the parent signing the contract with the school, um, especially the primary ages, signing the contract, putting their name on there, what you know, what they, what they're, if they're male, female, whatever, um, and and we have maybe five teachers that are doing exactly what the parent wants, and then we might have one rogue teacher that says, "I'm going to do what the child wants. I'm going to go along with whatever the child believes or whatever the child thinks." I just want to. There's still some teachers out there that are just unclear as do I listen to the parent and keep communicating with the parent that they, I would, I would want that information if my child was deciding that they were something other than. So I just want to know if that's something that we could talk about in discussion as far as making it clear uh, as to how, how we address that when those teachers are still coming up to me and saying that we're still having these. Mark, that may be also appropriate to review the litigation that was brought against Gary County and what that finding was. This kind of goes with that. Okay. Ben, are we? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have two. One, a presentation from National Champions Hutchinson Magnet School at Allen for the Kid Win Challenge. Um, it's a really awesome experience that they got to do um, uh, from USD 308. So it was a pretty exciting time. I think it was about a month ago um, that that had happened, or right before the previous board meeting. Um, so a presentation on that. And another one on behalf of uh, a couple of constituents. Uh, in the media cycle that is existing right now, there has been a lot of targeted push against students that identify as LGBT, um, that they are not feeling as safe in schools. And this, I was, based on that presentation we just have with Native Americans, there's another population that are leaving schools to go homeschool because they don't feel safe or they're going to alternative schools uh, because they don't feel safe in their uh, public school. So uh, that is a request from several constituents. Thank you. Jean. Thank you. Um, when Mark uh, brought up fentanyl, uh, I, it, it brings to mind that that's a, uh, an issue, especially out in western Kansas, and, and it's been found in Garden City and, and a, in many communities out there. I'm sure it's in all our communities 
whether we realize it or not. Um, we've discussed this quite a bit, um, and a child who is poisoned by fentanyl will be dead before an ambulance can reach the school. And I think uh, your uh, discussion about having Narcan in a school could, could really save a life. And that's not just at the high school level. Um, I know you've all seen those commercials on TV where this uh, drug um, looks like Skittles or, or some mm -hmm. sort of candy, including in the, in the packaging. So what I would propose is that we ask the department um, and the commissioner to maybe work with KDHE and to give us some guidance on whether it would be helpful for us to uh, perhaps have this available in schools um, at all levels. Uh, or and maybe give us a, a, some guidance on what we could do as a board to encourage that. We could really be saving lives here of students. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Dina. Just for your information, um, the Prescription Drug and Opioid Committee has advisory committee advises the uh, KDHE and the pharmacists and pharmacy organization as well um, on things like that. So I'll be glad to take your suggestion to them, but it may need to be kind of a, a joint push as well and that push will come from individuals who are in the field and see the issues and I know Manhattan has had some issues with fentanyl in the school so um, we'll check in tomorrow. We'll it's check in. pretty close to a lot of us Anything else? Any future agenda items? Tomorrow we meet here at 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll add the ESSER, right? At, 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 and then at when we take our recess at noon, we go to room 256, where we'll have a working lunch and a workshop. Uh, anyway, that room is uh, available for uh, live streaming, and we need to make sure that, that that's live streamed, but it's more conducive to having discussions than this long table. Can you give your money to Barbara. You give your money to Barbara. Yeah, for breakfast tomorrow. Uh, I mean, for lunch tomorrow. Okay, Randy. So before you leave, um, we've given you, in some cases, Melanie, lots of paper. You asked for all. <laughs> Digital. Oh, um, now on. Digital. <laughs> I just told. I, yeah. Uh, you, you should have the post-secondary effective rates for your area. You should have the awards. I, I will tell you, uh, we, we've got some notification. We may have one error. I hope that that's all we have. Uh, and so we're investigating that. So uh, we'll get that cleaned up for you, of course, the annual report. The, da the data I shared with you on graduation was my attempt, as Dina and Jean and I traveled, and then listening, talking to Melanie, and listening to uh, students and parents saying, and all the groups, right, KBOR group, and where's there maybe a conference, but it came from me. So I just want you to know as you look at that, that was just for your discussion. That's where it came from. It wasn't anything else other than I was trying to piece together all the different components of what I was hearing and maybe bring you something for a conversation. So just wanted to clarify that once again for you. <coughs> And I will look forward to seeing you at 9 o'clock in the morning. We are in recess until that time. Where are we going?